the introductory section of the chartreuse of parma this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org the chartreuse of parma by stendhal translated by lady mary lloyd this translation is preceded by a short life of the author which i shall read and then i will read the author's introduction to the novel the life of stendhal marie henri bale who called himself stendhal was born at grenoble on the twenty third of january seventeen eighty three his father joseph cherubin bale was a lawyer and a member of the parliament of dauphine his childhood and boyhood excited by echoes of the revolution but repressed in the bosom of a royalist and conservative family, were turbulent and distressing. In later years, Grenoble was to him, as he said, like the recollection of an abominable indigestion. He escaped from it in 1799 and spent a short time in the war office in Paris. In 1800, he went off to the wars, saw Italy for the first time, was present at the Battle of Marengo, and fought his first duel at Milan. From 1801 to 1806, Bale was in Paris and Grenoble, much occupied with affairs of the heart. In the latter year, he entered Napoleon's army, and remained in it until after the retreat from Moscow in 1814. He was made intendant militaire, and his zeal commended him to the emperor. On one occasion, called upon to raise five million francs from a German state, Bale produced seven million. He seems to have been one of the few officers who kept their heads in the flood of disaster. During the retreat from Russia, he was always clean-shaved and perfectly dressed. But the fatigues of 1814 shattered his health, and the ruin of Napoleon his hopes. He was obliged to withdraw to Como to recover his composure. He refused an administrative post in Paris under the new government, and settled definitely at Milan. His career of violent action had exhausted his spirits. He now adopted the mode of life of a dilettante. He gave himself up to music, books, and love. His first work, The Letters Written from Vienna, appeared in 1814. This essay, a musical criticism, was followed in 1817 by The History of Italian Painting and Rome, Naples, and Florence. He became poor and in 1821, being suspected of Italianism, was expelled from Milan by the Austrian police. He took refuge in Paris. Stendhal's essay on love, the earliest of his really remarkable books, was published in 1822, but attracted no attention whatever. In eleven years, only seventeen copies of it were sold. His first novel, Armance, belongs to 1827. In 1830, he was appointed consul at Trieste, and while he was there, the great novel, Le Rouge et le Noir, appeared in Paris without attracting any attention. Stendhal was so miserable at Trieste that he contrived to exchange his consulate for that of Civita Vecchia, which he held until he died. In spite of the complete and astonishing failures of each of his successive books, he continued to add to their number. He had but one hundred readers in all europe but these he continued to address in eighteen thirty eight he published a mystification the supposed memoirs in france of a commercial traveller stendhal did not taste literary success in any degree whatever until in eighteen thirty nine and at the age of fifty six he produced la chartreuse de parme this novel gave him fame but he did not long enjoy it on the 23rd of March, 1842, having reached his 60th year, he died in Paris after a stroke of paralysis. He lies buried at Montmartre, under the epitaph in Italian, which he had written for the purpose. Here lies Arrigo Bale, the Milanese, lived, wrote, died. The life of Stendhal was obscure and isolated throughout, but since his death he has excited boundless curiosity and his influence has been steadily advancing he said of himself that he could afford to wait that he would certainly be appreciated in eighteen eighty he proved himself a true prophet 
for it was just forty years after his death that his reputation reached its highest pinnacle and that with the discovery of his correspondence stendhal entered into his glory now begins the author's introduction by stendhal this novel was written in the year eighteen thirty in a place some three hundred leagues from paris many years before that when our armies were pouring across europe i chanced to be billeted in the house of a canon it was at padua a fortunate city where as in venice men's pleasure is their chief business and leaves them little time for anger with their neighbors my stay was of some duration and a friendship sprang up between the canon and myself passing through padua again in eighteen thirty i hurried to the good canon's house he was dead i knew but i had set my heart on looking once more upon the room in which we had spent many a pleasant evening sadly remembered in later days i found the canon's nephew and his wife who both received me like an old friend a few acquaintances dropped in and the party did not break up till a late hour the nephew had an excellent sambaglioni fetched from the cafe pedrocchi but what especially caused us to linger was the story of the duchess san severina to which some chance allusion was made and the whole of which the nephew was good enough to relate for my benefit in the country whither i am bound said i to my friends i am very unlikely to find a house like this one to while away the long evenings i will write a novel on the life of your charming duchess san severina i will follow in the steps of that old story-teller of yours bandello bishop of agen who would have thought it a crime to overlook the true incidents of his tale or add others to it in that case quoth the nephew i will lend you my uncle's diaries under the head of parma he mentions some of the court intrigues of that place at the period when the influence of the duchess was supreme but beware it is anything but a moral tale and now that you french people pique yourselves on your gospel purity it may earn you a highly criminal reputation i send forth my novel without having made any change in the manuscript written in eighteen thirty this course may present two drawbacks the first affects the reader the characters being italian may not interest him for the hearts and souls of that nation are very different from the hearts and souls of frenchmen the italians are a sincere and worthy folk who except when they are offended say what they think vanity only attacks them in fits then it becomes a passion and is known as puntiglio and further among this nation poverty is not considered a cause of ridicule the second drawback is connected with the author i will avow that i have been bold enough to leave my personages in possession of the natural roughnesses of their various characters but to atone for this and i proclaim it loudly i cast blame of the most highly moral nature upon many of their actions where would be the use of my endowing them with the high morality and pleasing charm of the french who love money above every other thing and are seldom led into sin either by love or hate the italians of my novel are of a very different stamp and indeed it appears to me that every stage of six hundred miles northward from the regions of the south brings us to a different landscape and to a different kind of novel the old canon's charming niece had known the duchess and had even been very much attached to her she has begged me not to alter anything concerning these adventures of her friend which are certainly open to censure january twenty third eighteen thirty nine the end of the introductory section of the chartreuse of parma by stendhal chapter one of the chartreuse of parma this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chartreuse of Parma by Stendhal. Translated by Lady Mary Lloyd. Chapter 1. Milan in 1796. On the 15th of May, 1796, General Bonaparte marched into the city of Milan at the head of the youthful army which had just crossed the bridge of Lodi, and taught the world that, after the lapse of centuries, Caesar and Alexander had found a successor at last. 
the prodigies of genius and daring witnessed by italy in the course of a few months roused her people from their slumbers but one week before the arrival of the french the milanese still took them for a horde of brigands whose habit it was to fly before the troops of his royal and imperial majesty such at all events was the information repeated three times a week in their little newspaper no bigger than a man's hand and printed on dirty-looking paper in the middle ages the milanese had been as brave as the french of the revolution and their courage earned the complete destruction of their city by the german emperor but their chief occupation since they had become his faithful subjects was to print sonnets on pink silk handkerchiefs whenever any rich or well-born young lady was given in marriage two or three years after that great epoch in her life the said young lady chose herself a cavaliere servente the name of this chichis beo selected by the husband's family occasionally held an honoured place in the marriage contract between such effeminate habits and the deep emotions stirred by the unexpected arrival of the french army a great gulf lay before long a new and passionate order of things had supervened on may the fifteenth seventeen ninety six a whole people became aware that all it had hitherto respected was supremely ridiculous and occasionally hateful to boot the departure of the last austrian regiment marked the downfall of the old ideas to expose one's life became the fashionable thing people perceived after these centuries of hypocrisy and insipidities that the only chance of happiness lay in loving with real passion and knowing how to risk one's life upon occasion the continuance of the watchful despotism of charles v and philip the second had plunged the lombards into impenetrable darkness they overthrew these rulers statutes and forthwith found themselves bathed in light for fifty years while voltaire's encyclopedie was appearing in france the monks had been assuring the good folk of milan that to learn to read or to learn anything on earth was idle vexation of the spirit and that if they would only pay their priests dues honestly and tell him all their small sins faithfully they were almost certain to secure a comfortable place in paradise to complete the emasculation of this whilom doughty people the austrians had sold them on moderate terms the privilege of not furnishing recruits to the imperial army in seventeen ninety six the milanese army consisted of eighty facchini in red coats who kept guard over the town assisted by four splendid hungarian regiments morals were exceedingly loose but real passion excessively rare apart from the inconvenience of being obliged to tell everything to his priest the milanese of the period of seventeen ninety really did not know the meaning of any vehement desire the worthy citizens were still travelled by certain monarchical bonds which had their vexatious side for instance the archduke who resided in the city and governed it in the emperor's name had pitched on the very lucrative notion of dealing in cornstuffs consequently no peasant could sell his crops until his imperial highness had filled up his granaries in may seventeen ninety six three days after the entry of the french a young miniature painter of the name of gros rather a mad fellow he has since become famous who had arrived with the troops heard somebody at the cafe des servi then a fashionable resort relate the doings of the archduke who was a very fat man seizing the list of ices printed on a slip of common yellowish paper he sketched on its blank side the portly archduke with immoderate quantities of corn instead of blood pouring out of the hole in his stomach made by a french soldier's bayonet in this land of crafty despotism that which we call jest or caricature was unknown the drawing left by gros on the cafe table acted like a miracle from heaven during the night the sketch was engraved on the morrow twenty thousand copies of it were sold that same day the walls were posted with the proclamation of a war tax of six millions of francs levied for the support of the french army which though it had just won six battles and conquered twenty provinces was short of shoes pantaloons coats and hats so great was the volume of happiness and pleasure which poured into lombardy with these frenchmen poor as they were that nobody save the priests and a few nobles perceived the weight of the tax which was soon followed by many others 
the french soldiers laughed and sang from morning till night they were all of them under five and twenty and their general-in-chief who numbered twenty-seven years was said to be the oldest man in his command all this youth and mirth and gay carelessness made cheery answer to the furious sermons of the monks who for six months past had been asserting from the pulpit every sacred edifice that these frenchmen were all monsters forced on pain of death to burn down everything and cut off every head and that for this last purpose a guillotine was born at the head of every regiment in country places the french soldier was to be seen sitting at cottage doors rocking the owner's baby and almost every evening some drummer would tune up his violin and dancing would begin the french square dances were far too difficult and complicated to be taught to the peasant women by the soldiers who indeed knew but little about them so it was the women who taught the frenchmen the monferino the saltarello and other italian dances the officers had been billeted as far as possible upon rich families they were in sore need of an opportunity to retrieve past losses a lieutenant named robert for instance was billeted in the palace of the marchesa del dongo when this officer a tolerably handy young recruit entered into occupation of his apartment his sole worldly wealth consisted of a six-franc piece which had been paid him at piacenza after the passage of the bridge of lodi he had stripped a handsome austrian officer killed by a round shot of a splendid new pair of nankeen pantaloons never did garment appear at a more appropriate moment his officer's epaulets were woollen and the cloth of his coat was sewed to the sleeve linings to keep the bits together a yet more melancholy circumstance was that the soles of his shoes were composed of portions of hats picked up on the battlefield beyond the bridge of lodi these improvised soles were bound to his shoes by strings which were aggressively visible so much so in fact that when the major-domo of the household made his appearance in robert's room to invite him to dine with the marchesa the lieutenant was cast into a state of mortal confusion he and his orderly spent the two hours intervening before the dreaded repast in trying to stitch the coat together and dye the unlucky shoe-strings with ink at last the awful moment struck never in all my life did i feel so uncomfortable said lieutenant robert to me the ladies thought i was going to frighten them but i trembled much more than they i kept my eyes on my shoes and could not contrive to move with ease or grace the marchesa del dongo he added was then in the heyday of her beauty you know what she was with her lovely eyes angelic in their gentleness and the pretty fair hair which made so perfect a frame for the oval of her charming face in my room there was an erodia by leonardo da vinci which might have been her portrait god willed that her supernatural beauty should so overwhelm my senses as to make me quite forget my own appearance for two years i had been in the genoese mountains looking at nothing but ugliness and misery i ventured to say a few words about my delight but i had too much good sense to dally long with compliments while i was making mine i perceived in a palatial marble dining hall some dozen lackeys and men servants dressed in what then appeared to me like the height of magnificence think of it the rascals not only wore good shoes but silver buckles into the bargain out of the corner of my eye i could see their stupid gaze riveted on my coat and perhaps too and this wrung my heart upon my shoes with one word i could have terrified the whole set but how was i to put them in their place without running the risk of alarming the ladies for to give herself a little courage the marchesa she has told me so a hundred times ever since had sent to the convent where she was then at school for her husband's sister gina del dongo who afterward became that charming contessa pietranera no woman was ever more gay and lovable in prosperity and none ever surpassed her in courage and serenity under fortune's frowns gina who may then have been thirteen but looked eighteen frank and lively as you know was so afraid of bursting out laughing at my dress that she dared not even eat the marchesa on the contrary overwhelmed me with stiff civilities she read my impatience and discomfort in my eyes in a word i cut a sorry figure i was chewing the cud of scorn which no frenchman is supposed to be capable of doing at last heaven sent me a brilliant notion 
i began to tell the ladies about my poverty and the misery we had suffered during those two years in the genoese mountains where the folly of our old generals had kept us there said i they gave us assignat which the people would not take in payment and three ounces of bread a day before i had been talking for two minutes the kind marchesa's eyes were full of tears and gina had grown quite serious what lieutenant she cried three ounces of bread yes mademoiselle but on the other hand the supply failed three times in the week and as the peasants with whom we lived were even poorer than ourselves we used to give them a little of our bread when we rose from the table i offered the marchesa my arm escorted her as far as the drawing-room door then hastily retracing my steps presented the servant who had waited upon me at dinner with the solitary coin on the spending of which i had built such castles in the air a week later robert went on when it had become quite clear that the french did not guillotine anybody the marchese del dongo returned from grianta his country house on lake como where he had valiantly taken refuge when the army drew near leaving his young and lovely wife and his sister to the chances of war the marchese's hatred of us was only equalled by his dread both were immeasurable it used to amuse me to see his large pale hypocritical face when he was trying to be polite to me the day after his return to milan i received three ells of cloth and two hundred francs out of the six millions i put on fresh plumage and became the lady's cavalier for ball giving began lieutenant robert's story was very much that of all the french soldiers instead of laughing at the brave fellow's poverty people pitied them and learned to love them this period of unforeseen happiness and rapture lasted only two short years so excessive and so general was the frolic that i cannot possibly convey an idea of it unless it be by means of the following profound historic reflection this nation had been bored for a century the sensuality natural to southern countries had formerly reigned at the courts of those famous milanese dukes the sforza and the visconti but since the year sixteen twenty four when the spaniards had seized the province and held it under the proud taciturn distrustful sway of masters who suspected revolt in every corner merriment had fled away and the populace aping its ruler's habits was much more prone to avenge the slightest insult with a dagger thrust than to enjoy the moment as it passed but between may fifteenth seventeen ninety six when the french entered milan and april seventeen ninety nine when they were driven out of the city by the battle of cassano wild merriment gaiety voluptuous pleasure and oblivion of every sad or even rational sentiment reached such a pitch that old millionaire merchants usurers and notaries were actually quoted by name as having forgotten their morose and money-getting habits during that period one might have found a few families of the highest rank that had retired to their country places to sulk at the general cheerfulness and universal joy and it is a fact further that these families had been honoured with a disagreeable amount of attention by the authorities in charge of the war tax levied for the benefit of the french troops the marchese del dongo disgusted at the sight of so much gaiety had been one of the first to return to his magnificent country seat at grianta beyond como whither the ladies of his family conducted lieutenant robert this castle standing in what is probably a unique position on a plateau some one hundred and fifty feet above the splendid lake and commanding a great portion of it had once been a fortress it had been built as the numerous marble slabs bearing the frame family arms attested during the fifteenth century the drawbridges were still to be seen and the deep moats now dry to be sure still with its walls eighty feet high and six feet thick the castle was safe from a coup de main and this fact endeared it to the suspicious marchese living there surrounded by five-and-twenty or thirty servants whom he believed to be devoted to him apparently because he never spoke to them without abusing them he was less harried by fear than at milan this alarm was not entirely unwarranted the marchese was in active correspondence with an austrian spy stationed on the swiss frontier three leagues from grianta to assist the escape of prisoners taken in battle and the french generals might have taken this exchange of notes very seriously the marchese had left his young wife at milan to manage the family affairs 
she it was who had to find means of supplying the contributions levied on the casa del dongo as it was locally called and to endeavour to get them reduced which involved the necessity of her seeing the noblemen who had accepted public positions and even some very influential persons who were not noble at all a great event occurred in the family the marchese had arranged a marriage for his young sister gina with a gentleman of great wealth and the very highest descent but he powdered his head wherefore gina received him with shrieks of laughter and shortly committed the folly of marrying count pietronera he too was a high-born gentleman and very good-looking as well but he was ruined as his father had been before him and crowning disgrace he was an eager partisan of the modern ideas the marchese's despair was completed by the fact that pietronera was a lieutenant in the italian legion after two years of extravagance and bliss the paris directorate which took on all the airs of a well-established sovereignty began to manifest a mortal hatred of everything that rose above mediocrity the incapable generals sent to the army of italy lost a series of battles on those very plains of verona which but two years previously had witnessed the feats of arcola and lonato the austrians approached milan lieutenant robert now a major was wounded at the battle of cassano and came back for the last time to the house of his friend the marchesa del dongo it was a sad farewell robert departed with count pietronera who was following the french retreat on novi the young countess whose brother had refused to give up her fortune followed the retreating army in a cart then began that period of reaction and return to the old ideas which the milanese call i tredici mesi the thirteen months because their lucky star did not permit this relapse into imbecility to last beyond the battle of marengo everything that was old bigoted morose and gloomy came back to the head of affairs and of society before long those who had remained faithful to the old order were telling the villagers that napoleon had met the fate he so richly deserved and had been hanged by the mamluks of egypt among the men who had retired to sulk in their country houses and who now came back thirsting for vengeance the marchese del dongo distinguished himself by his eagerness his zeal naturally bore him to the head of the party the gentlemen composing it very amiable fellows when they were not in a fright but who were still in a state of trepidation contrived to circumvent the austrian general who though rather of a kindly disposition allowed himself to be persuaded that severity was a mark of statesmanship and ordered the arrest of a hundred and fifty patriots they were the best men italy then possessed soon they were all deported to the bocche de cattaro and cast into subterranean dungeons where damp and especially starvation wrecked prompt and thorough justice on the villains the marchese del dongo was appointed to an important post and as the meanest avarice accompanied his numerous other noble qualities he publicly boasted that he had not sent a single crown to his sister the countess pietranera this lady still fathoms deep in love would not forsake her husband and was starving with him in france the kind-hearted marchesa was in despair at last she contrived to abstract a few small diamonds from her jewel case which her husband took from her every night and locked up in an iron box under his bed she had brought him a dowry of eight hundred thousand francs and he allowed her eighty francs a month for her personal expenses during the thirteen months of the absence of the french from milan this woman timid as she was found pretexts of one sort or another which enabled her always to dress in black it must be confessed here that after the example of many serious authors we have begun the story of our hero a year before his birth this important personage is no other in fact than fabrizio valserra marchesino del dongo as he would be called at milan footnote the habit of the country borrowed from that of germany is that all the sons of a marchese should be called marchesino the son of a count is known as contino each of his daughters is a contessina End of the footnote. he had just condescended to come into the world when the french were driven out the chances of his birth making him the second son of that most noble marchese del dongo with whose large pallid countenance deceitful smile and boundless hatred of the new order of ideas my readers are already acquainted 
the whole of the family fortune was entailed on the eldest boy ascanio del dongo the perfect image of his father he was eight years old and fabrizio too when like a flash that general bonaparte whom all well-born folk believed to have been hanged long since descended from mount st bernard he made his entry into milan the event is still unique in history conceive a whole population over head and ears in love a few days later napoleon won the battle of marengo i need not tell the rest the rapture of the milanese overflowed the cup but this time it was mingled with thoughts of vengeance the good-natured folk had been taught to hate soon the remnant of the patriots exiled to cataro reappeared and their return was celebrated by national festivities their pale faces great startled eyes and emaciated limbs contrasted strangely with the joy that reigned on every side their arrival was the signal for the departure of the families most concerned in their banishment the marchese del dongo was one of the first to flee to his house at grianta the heads of the great families were filled with rage and terror but their wives and daughters remembering the delights of the first french occupation sighed regretfully for milan and the gay balls which once marengo was over were given at the casa tanzi a few days after the victory the french general charged with the duty of maintaining quiet in lombardy became aware that all the tenants of the noble families and all the old women in the country far from dwelling on the wonderful victory which had changed the fate of italy and reconquered thirteen fortresses in one day were thinking of nothing but the prophecy of san jovita the chief patron saint of brescia according to which sacred pronouncement the prosperity of napoleon and of the french nation was to end just thirteen weeks after marengo some slight excuse for the marchese del dongo and all the sulky country nobility is to be found in the fact that they really and truly did believe in this prophecy none of these people had read four books in his life they openly prepared to return to milan at the end of the thirteenth week but as the time went on it was marked by fresh successes on the french side napoleon who had returned to paris saved the revolution from within by his wise decrees even as he had saved it from foreign attack at marengo then the lombard nobles in their country refuges discovered that they had misunderstood the prediction of the patron saint of brescia he must have meant thirteen months instead of thirteen weeks but the thirteen months slipped by and the prosperity of france seemed to rise higher day by day we pass over the ten years of happiness and progress between eighteen hundred and eighteen ten fabrizio spent the earliest of them at grianta where he dealt out many hard knocks among the little peasant boys and received them back with interest but learned nothing not even to read later he was sent to the jesuit school at milan the marchese his father insisted that he should learn latin not out of those ancient authors who are always holding forth about republics but out of a splendid tome enriched with more than a hundred and fifty engravings a masterpiece of seventeenth-century art the latin genealogy of the valserra marchese del dongo published by fabrizio del dongo archbishop of parma in the year sixteen fifty the valserra were essentially a fighting race and these engravings represented numerous battles in which some hero of the name was always depicted as laying about mightily with his sword this book was a great delight to young fabrizio his mother who adored him was allowed now and then to go to milan to see him but her husband never offered to pay the cost of these journeys the money was always lent her by her sister-in-law the charming countess pietranera who after the return of the french had become one of the most brilliant of the ladies at the court of the viceroy of italy prince eugene after fabrizio had made his first communion the countess persuaded the marchese who still lived in voluntary exile to allow the boy to pay her occasional visits he struck her as being out of the common clever very serious but handsome and no discredit to a fashionable lady's drawing-room though he was utterly ignorant and hardly knew how to write the countess who carried her characteristic enthusiasm into everything she did promised her protection to the head of the jesuit house if only her nephew fabrizio made astonishing progress in his studies and won several prizes at the close of the year to put him in the way of earning such rewards she sent for him every saturday night 
and frequently did not restore him to his teachers till the wednesday or thursday following though the jesuits were tenderly cherished by the viceroy their presence in italy was forbidden by the laws of the kingdom and the superior of the college a clever man realized all the benefits that might accrue from his relations with a lady who was all-powerful at court he was too wise to complain of fabrizio's absences and at the end of the year five first prizes were conferred on the youth who was more ignorant than ever in the circumstances the brilliant countess pietranera attended by her husband then general in command of one of the divisions of the Duvard, and five or six of the most important personages about the viceroy's court attended the distribution of prizes in the jesuit school the superior received the congratulations of the heads of his order the countess was in the habit of taking her nephew to all the gay fates which enlivened the kindly viceroy's too short reign she had made him an officer of his hours on her own authority and the twelve-year-old boy wore his uniform one day the countess delighted with his handsome looks asked the prince to make him a page which would have been tantamount of course to an acknowledgment of adherence to the new order of things of the del dongo family the next morning she was fain to use all her influence to induce the viceroy kindly to forget her request which lacked nothing but the consent of the father of the future page a consent which would have been loudly refused as a result of this piece of folly which made him shiver the sulky marchese coined some pretext for recalling young fabrizio to grianta the countess nursed a sovereign contempt for her brother whom she regarded as a dreary fool who would be spiteful if he ever had the power but she doted on fabrizio and after ten years of silence she wrote to the marchese to beg that she might have her nephew with her her letter remained unanswered when fabrizio returned to the formidable pile built by the most warlike of his ancestors he knew nothing about anything in the world except drill and riding on horseback count pietranera who had been as fond of the child as his wife had taught him to ride and taken him with him on parade when the boy reached grianta with eyes still reddened by the tears he had shed on leaving his aunt's splendid apartments his only greeting was that of his mother who covered him with passionate caresses and of his sisters the marchese was shut up in his study with his eldest son the marchesino ascanio they were busy writing letters in cipher which were to have the honour of being sent to vienna and they were only visible at meal-times the marchese ostentatiously declared that he was teaching his natural successor to keep the accounts of the revenues of each of his estates by double entry but in reality he was far too jealous by nature to mention such matters to the son on whom these properties were absolutely entailed he really employed him to translate into cipher the dispatches of fifteen or twenty pages which he sent two or three times a week across the swiss frontier whence they were conveyed to vienna the marchese claimed that he thus kept his legitimate sovereign informed as to the internal conditions of the kingdom of italy a subject about which he himself knew nothing at all his letters however won him great credit and for the following reason he was in the habit of employing some trusty agent to count up the numbers of any french or italian regiment that marched along the high road when changing its place of garrison and in making his report to vienna he always carefully diminished the number of men reported present by a full fourth these letters then ridiculous as they otherwise were had the merit of contradicting others of a more truthful nature and thus gave pleasure in high quarters consequently not long before fabrizio's return to grianta the marchese had received the star of a famous order the fifth that adorned his chamberlain's coat it is true indeed that he had to endure the grief of never wearing the said coat outside the walls of his own study but on the other hand he never ventured to dictate any dispatch without first enduing his person with the richly embroidered garment hung with all his orders any other course would have seemed to him a failure in respect the marchesa was delighted with her boy's charms but she had kept up the habit of writing twice or thrice in the year to general comte de, de a the name then borne by lieutenant robert she had a horror of lying to those she loved she questioned her son and was startled by his ignorance if she argued he appears ill instructed to me who know nothing robert who knows so much would think his education an utter failure 
and nowadays some merit is indispensable to success another peculiarity which almost equally astounded her was that fabrizio had taken all the religious teaching given him by the jesuits quite seriously though herself a very pious woman her child's fanaticism made her shiver if the marchese has the sense to suspect this means of influencing my son he will rob me of his love she wept many tears and her passionate love for fabrizio deepened life in the great country house with its thirty or forty servants was very dull and fabrizio spent all his days hunting or skimming over the waters of the lake in a boat he was soon the sworn ally of all the coachmen and stable assistants every one of them a vehement partisan of the french who made open sport of the highly religious valets attached to the persons of the marchese and his elder son the great joke against these individuals was that like their masters they wore powder in their hair End of chapter 1 of the Chartreuse of Parma Chapter 2 of the Chartreuse of Parma by Stendhal Translated by Lady Mary Lloyd This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Alors que Vesper vient embrunir nos yeux tout épris de l'avenir, je contemple les cieux, en qui Dieu nous écrit, par notes non obscures, les sorts et les destins de toute créature, car lui, du fond des cieux regardant un humain, parfois mu de pitié, lui montre le chemin. Par les astres du ciel, qui sont ses caractères, les choses nous prédit, et bonnes, et contraires. Mais les hommes, chargés de terre et de trépas, méprisent tel écrit et ne le lisent pas. Ronsard The Marchese professed a hearty hatred of knowledge. Ideas, he said, have been the ruin of Italy. He was somewhat puzzled to reconcile this holy horror of information with his desire that Fabrizio should perfect the education so brilliantly begun under the auspices of the Jesuits. To minimize the risk as far as possible, he commissioned the worthy priest of Grianta, Father Blanes, to carry on the boy's Latin studies. To this end, the priest should himself have been acquainted with the language, but he thoroughly despised it. His knowledge of it was restricted to the prayers in his missal, which he knew by rote, and the sense of which, or something near it, he was capable of imparting to his flock. Nonetheless was the father respected and even feared all over the canton. He had always averred that the famous prophecy of San Jobita, patron saint of Brescia, would not be accomplished either in thirteen weeks or thirteen months. He would confide to his trusted friends that if he dared speak openly, he could give the proper interpretation of the number thirteen, and that it would cause general astonishment. Parentheses, the fact is that Father Blanes, a man of primitive virtue and honesty, and a clever one into the bargain, spent most of his nights on top of the church tower. He had a mania for astrology, and after calculating the positions and conjunctions of the stars all day, would pass the greater part of his nights in tracing them in the sky. So poor was he that his only instrument was a telescope with a long cardboard tube. My reader will conceive the scorn for linguistic study nursed by a man who spent his life in discovering the precise moment at which empires were to fall, and revolutions, destined to change the face of the whole world, were to begin. What more do I know about a horse, he would say to Fabrizio, because somebody tells me its Latin name is Equus. The peasants dreaded the priest as a mighty magician, and he, through the fear inspired by his tarryings on the top of his tower, prevented them from thieving. His brother priests of the neighboring parishes envied him his influence and hated him accordingly. The Marchese frankly despised him because he reasoned too much for a person in so humble a position. Fabrizio worshipped him. To please him, he would sometimes spend whole evenings over huge sums in addition or multiplication, and then he would climb up into the tower. This was a great favor, one the priest had never bestowed on any other person but he loved the boy for the sake of his simplicity. 
" If you don't become a hypocrite," he would say, " you may turn into a man." Twice or thrice in every year, Fabrizio, who was bold and passionate in the pursuit of his pleasures, ran serious risks of drowning in the lake. He was the head and front of all the great expeditions of the peasant boys of Grianta and Cadenabbia. These urchins had provided themselves with a collection of small keys, and when the very dark nights came, they did their best to open the padlocks on the chains by which the fishermen moored their boats to some big stone or tree close to the shore. It must be explained that on the Lake of Como the fisherman puts down his lines at a considerable distance from the edge of the lake. The upper end of each line is fastened to a lath lined with cork, to which is fixed a very flexible hazel rod bearing a little bell, which tinkles as soon as the fish takes the bait and shakes the float. The great object of the nocturnal raids in which Fabrizio acted as commander-in-chief was to get to these lines before the fishermen heard the tinkling of their little bells. The boys chose stormy seasons and embarked on their risky enterprises early in the morning, an hour before dawn. They felt convinced when they got into their boats that they were rushing into terrible danger. This constituted the splendid aspect of their undertaking. And, like their fathers, they always devoutly recited an Ave Maria. Now it frequently would happen that at that very moment of the start, and the instant after the recital of the Ave Maria, Fabrizio would be struck by an omen. This was the fruit, as affecting him, of his friend the priest's astrology, in the actual predictions of which he had no belief at all. To his juvenile imagination, these omens were a certain indication of success or failure, and as he was more resolute than any of his comrades, the whole band gradually grew so accustomed to accept such signs that if, just as the boat was shoving off, a priest was seen on the coastline, or a raven flew away on the left, the padlock was hastily put back upon the chain, and every boy went home to bed. Thus, though Father Blanes had not imparted his somewhat recondite science to Fabrizio, he had imbued him, all unconsciously, with an unlimited confidence in those signs and portents which may unveil the future. The Marchese was conscious that an accident to his secret correspondence might place him at his sister's mercy. Every year, therefore, when the St. Angela, the Countess Pietranera's feast day, came around, Fabrizio was allowed to spend a week at Milan. All through the year he lived on the hope or the regretful memory of those seven days. On so great an occasion, and to defray the expenses of this politic journey, the Marchese would give his son four crowns. To his wife, who went with the boy, he gave, as usual, nothing at all. But a cook and six lackeys and a coachman and pair of horses started for Como the night before the travellers, and while the Marchesa was at Milan, her carriage was at her disposal, and dinner for twelve persons was served every day. The sullen retirement in which the Marchese del Dongo elected to live was certainly not an amusing form of existence, but it had one advantage, that of permanently enriching the coffers of the families who chose to adopt it, the Marchese owned a revenue of more than 200,000 francs. He did not spend a quarter of it. He lived on hope. During the years between 1800 and 1813, he remained in the firm and unceasing expectation that Napoleon would be overthrown before the next six months were out. His joy, when he received the news of the catastrophe of the Beresina in the spring of 1813, may consequently be imagined. The capture of Paris and the fall of Napoleon almost drove him wild with joy, and he ventured on behavior of the most insulting nature both to his wife and his sister. At last, after fourteen years of waiting, he tasted the inexpressible delight of seeing the Austrian troops re-enter Milan. The general in command, obeying orders sent from Vienna, received the Marchese del Dongo with a courtesy which almost amounted to respect. One of the highest offices connected with the government was at once offered him, and he accepted it as the discharge of a just debt. His eldest son was made a lieutenant in one of the finest of the imperial regiments, but Fabrizio would never have anything to do with the cadet's commission which was offered for his acceptance. The Marchese's triumph, which he enjoyed with peculiar insolence, lasted but a few months, and was followed by a most humiliating reverse. 
he had never possessed any business aptitude, and his fourteen years of country life, surrounded by his servants, his notary, and his doctor, coupled with the ill humor which had crept upon him with advancing years, had developed his incapacity to the extremest point. In Austria, no important post can be held for long by any person lacking that particular talent demanded by the slow and complicated, but essentially logical, system of administration peculiar to that ancient monarchy. The Marchese's blunders scandalized the clerks of his department, and even hampered the progress of business, while his ultra-monarchical vaporings irritated a populace which it was important to lull back into its former state of slumberous indifference. So, one fine day, he was informed that His Majesty was graciously pleased to accept his resignation of his office, and simultaneously appointed him second grand major-domo of the Lombardo-Venetian kingdom. The Marchese was furious at the abominable injustice of which he was the victim. In spite of his horror of the free press, he printed a letter to a friend. Then he wrote to the Emperor, assuring His Majesty that his ministers were playing him false, and were no better than Jacobins. This done, he betook himself sadly back to his home at Grianta. One consolation he possessed. After the downfall of Napoleon, certain powerful individuals at Milan had organized a brutal attack on Count Prina, a man of first-class worth, who had acted as minister in the service of the Kingdom of Italy. Pietranera risked his own life to save that of the unhappy man, who was thrashed to death with umbrellas, and lingered in agony for five hours. If a certain priest, the Marchese del Dongo's own confessor, had chosen to open the iron gate of the church of San Giovanni, in front of which Prina had been dragged, and indeed he had at one moment been left lying in the gutter running along the middle of the street. The victim might have been saved. But the cleric scornfully refused to unlock the gate, and within six months his patron enjoyed the happiness of securing him a handsome piece of preferment. The Marchese detested his brother-in-law, Count Petronera, who, though his yearly income did not amount to fifty louis, dared to be fairly merry ventured to cling faithfully to that which he had loved all his life, and was so insolvent as to proclaim that spirit of impersonal justice which Del Dongo was pleased to define as vile Jacobinism. The Count had refused to enter the Austrian service. The attention of the authorities was drawn to this refusal on his part, and a few months after the death of Prina, the same men who had paid for his assassination procured an order for the imprisonment of General Pietro Nero. Upon this, his wife sent for a passport and ordered post-horses to take her to Vienna, so that she might tell the emperor the truth. Prina's assassins took fright, and at midnight, just one hour before the countess was to have started for Vienna, one of them, a cousin of her own, brought her the order for her husband's release. The following morning, the Austrian general sent for Count Pietranera, received him with every possible respect, and assured him that his retiring pension would shortly be paid on the most satisfactory scale. The worthy General Bubna, who was both a clever and a kind-hearted man, looked thoroughly ashamed of Prina's murder and the Count's imprisonment. After this angry squall had blown over, calmed by Countess Pietranera's firmness, the couple lived in tolerable comfort on the retiring pension, which, thanks to General Bubna's influence, was shortly granted them. It was a fortunate circumstance that for five or six years previously the countess had lived on terms of great friendship with an exceedingly wealthy young man, who was also her husband's intimate friend, and who placed the finest pair of English horses then to be seen at Milan, his box at the Scala Theatre, and his country house entirely at their service. But the count was conscious of his own valour. He had a generous soul, he was easily moved to anger, and on such occasions indulged in somewhat unusual behavior. He was out hunting one day with some young men, when one of them, who had served under a different flag, ventured on some joke concerning the courage of the soldiers of the Cisalpine Republic. The Count boxed his ears, there was a fracas then and there, and Pietranera, whose opinion found no support among the company present, was killed. This duel, if so it could be called, made a great stir, the persons concerned in it found it more prudent to journey into Switzerland. That ridiculous kind of courage which men entitle resignation, the courage of the fool who allows himself to be hanged without opening his lips, 
was not a quality possessed by the countess. In her rage at her husband's death, she would have had Le Mercati, the wealthy young man who was her faithful adorer, instantly take his way to Switzerland, and there punish Pietranera's murderer either with a rifle bullet or with a hearty cuffing. But Le Mercati regarded the plan as simply ridiculous, and forthwith the countess realized that in her case love had been killed by scorn. She grew kinder than ever to Le Mercati. Her aim was to rekindle his love, and, that done, to forsake him and leave him in despair. To explain this plan of vengeance to the French mind, I should say that in Milan, a country far distant from our own, love does still drive men to despair. The countess, whose beauty, heightened by her mourning robes, eclipsed that of all her rivals, set herself to coquette with the best-born young men of the city, and one of them, Count N., who had always said that Le Mercati's quality struck him as being too heavy and stiff to attract so brilliant a woman, fell desperately in love with her. Then she wrote to Le Mercati. Would you like to behave for once like a clever man? Imagine that you have never known me. I am, with a touch of scorn, perhaps, your very humble servant, Gina Pietranera. When Le Mercati received this note, he departed to one of his country houses, his passion blazed, he lost his head, and talked of shooting himself, an unusual course in countries which acknowledge the existence of a hell. The very morning after his arrival in the country, he wrote to the countess to offer her his hand and his two hundred thousand francs a year. She sent him back his letter, with the seal unbroken, by Count N.'s groom, whereupon Le Mercati spent three years on his estates, coming back to Milan every two months, but never finding courage to stay there, and boring all his friends with the story of his passionate adoration of the lady and the circumstantial recital of the favor she had formerly shown him. In the earlier months of this period, he added that Count N. would ruin her, and that she dishonored herself by contracting such an intimacy. As a matter of fact, the countess had no love of any kind for N., and of this fact she apprised him as soon as she was quite certain of Le Mercati's despair. The Count, who knew the world, only begged her not to divulge the sad truth she had confided to him. If, he added, you will have the extreme kindness to continue receiving me with all the external distinctions generally granted to the reigning lover, I may, perhaps, attain a suitable position. After this heroic declaration, the Countess would make no further use of Count N.'s horses and opera box. But for fifteen years she had been accustomed to a life of the greatest ease. She was now driven to solve the difficult, or rather impossible, problem of living at Milan on a yearly pension of fifteen hundred francs. She quitted her palace, hired two fifth-floor rooms, and dismissed all her servants, even to her maid, whom she replaced by a poor old charwoman. The sacrifice was really less heroic and less painful than it appears. No ridicule attaches to poverty in Milan, and therefore people do not shrink from it in terror as the worst of all possible evils. After some months spent in this proud penury, bombarded by perpetual letters from Le Mercati, and even from Count N., who also desired to marry her, it came to pass that the Marchese del Dongo, whose stinginess was usually abominable, was struck by the notion that his own enemies might perhaps be rejoicing over his sister's suffering. What? Was a del Dongo to be reduced to existing on the pension granted by the Viennese court, against which he had so great a grievance, to its general's widows? He wrote that an apartment and an income worthy of his sister awaited her at Grianta. The versatile-minded countess welcomed the idea of this new life with enthusiasm. It was twenty years since she had lived in the venerable pile which rose so proudly among the old chestnut trees planted in the days of the Sforzas. There, she reflected, I shall find peace, and at my age is that not happiness? As she had arrived at the age of one and thirty, she believed that the hour of her retirement had struck. I shall find a happy and peaceful life at last on the shores of the noble lake beside which I was born. Whether she was mistaken, I know not. But it is certain that this eager-hearted creature, who had just so unhesitatingly refused two huge fortunes, carried happiness with her into the castle of Grianta. Her two nieces were beside themselves with delight. You have brought the beautiful days of my youth back to me, said the Marchesa, as she kissed her. 
The night before you arrived I felt a hundred years old. In Fabrizio's company the countess went about revisiting all those enchanting spots near Grianta which travellers have made so famous. The Villa Melzi, on the other side of the lake, opposite the castle, and one of the chief objects in the view therefrom. The sacred wood of the Sfondrata, and the bold promontory which divides the branches of the lake, that of Como, so rich in its beauty, and that which runs towards Lecco, of aspect far more severe, a sublime and graceful prospect, equalled, perhaps, but not surpassed, by the most famous view in all the world, that of the Bay of Naples. The Countess found the most exquisite delight in calling up memories of her early days, and comparing them with her present sensations. The Lake of Como, she said to herself, is not hemmed in like the Lake of Geneva by great tracts of land, carefully hedged and cultivated on the best system, reminding one of money and speculation. Here on every side I see hills of unequal height, covered with clumps of trees, growing as chance has scattered them, and which have not yet been ruined and forced to bring in an income by the hand of man. Amid these hills, with their beautiful shapes and their curious slopes that drop toward the lake, I can carry on all the illusions of the descriptions of Tasso and Ariosto. It is all noble and tender. It all speaks of love. Nothing recalls the hideousness of civilization. The villages set halfway up the hills are sheltered by great trees, and above the tree tops rise the charming outlines of their pretty church spires where some little field fifty paces wide shows itself here and there among the chestnuts and wild cherry trees my pleased eye notes plants of more vigorous and willing growth than can be seen elsewhere beyond the hills on whose deserted crests a happy hermit existence might be spent the wandering eye rests on the alpine peaks covered with eternal snows and their stern severity reminds one sufficiently of life's misfortunes to increase one's sense of present delight. The imagination is stirred by the distant sound of the church bells of some little village hidden among the trees. Their tone softens as it floats over the water with a touch of gentle melancholy and resignation, which seems to say, Life slips by. Do not, then, look so coldly on the happiness that comes to you. Make haste to enjoy. The influence of these enchanting spots, unequaled on earth for loveliness, made the countess feel a girl once more she could not conceive how she had been able to spend so many years without returning to the lake can it be she wondered that true happiness belongs to the beginning of old age she purchased a boat and adorned it with her own hands assisted by fabrizio and the marchesa for no money was to be had though the household was kept up with the utmost splendour since his fall the marchese del dongo had doubled his magnificence for instance to gain ten paces of ground on the shore of the lake close to the famous avenue of plane trees leading toward cadenabbia he was building an embankment which was to cost eighty thousand francs at the end of this embankment was rising a chapel constructed entirely of enormous blocks of granite after drawings by the celebrated cagnola and within the chapel Marchese, the fashionable Milanese sculptor, was erecting a tomb on which the noble deeds of the Marchese's ancestors were to be represented in numerous bas-reliefs. Fabrizio's elder brother, the Marchesino Ascanio, tried to join the ladies in their expeditions, but his aunt splashed water over his powdered head, and was forever playing some fresh prank on his solemnity. At last he relieved the merry party of the sight of his heavy sallow countenance. They dared not laugh when he was present, feeling that he was the spy of the Marchese, his father, and that it was wise to keep on terms with the stern despot, who had never recovered his temper since his forced resignation. Ascanio swore to be avenged on Fabrizio. One day there was a storm, and the boat was in some danger. Though money was scarce enough, the two boatmen were liberally bribed to prevent their saying anything to the Marchese, who was very angry already because his daughters had been taken out. Then came a second hurricane. On this beautiful lake storms are both terrible and unexpected. Violent squalls sweep suddenly down the mountain gorges on opposite sides of the shore and battle over the water. This time, in the midst of the whirlwind and the thunderclaps, the countess insisted on landing, 
she declared that if she could stand on a lonely rock as large as a small room which lay in the middle of the lake she would enjoy a strange spectacle and see her stronghold lashed on every side by the furious waves but as she sprang from the boat she fell into the water fabrizio plunged in after her and they were both carried a considerable distance drowning is certainly not an attractive death but boredom at all events fled astonished from the feudal castle the countess had fallen in love with father blanese's primitive qualities and astrological studies the little money remaining to her after the purchase of her boat had been spent on a small second-hand telescope and almost every night she mounted with fabrizio and her nieces to the top of one of the gothic towers of the castle fabrizio was the learned member of the party which would then spend several very cheerful hours far from prying eyes it must be acknowledged that there were days during which the countess never spoke to anybody and might be seen walking up and down under the great chestnut trees plunged in gloomy reverie she was too clever a woman and not to suffer now and then from the weariness of never being able to exchange an idea but the next day she would be laughing again as she had laughed the day before it was the lamentations of her sister-in-law which occasionally cast a gloom over her naturally elastic nature are we doomed to spend all the youth left to us in this dreary house the marchesa would cry before the arrival of the countess she had not even had courage to feel such repinings thus the winter of eighteen fourteen to eighteen fifteen wore on twice in spite of her poverty did the countess spend a few days in milan she went to see a magnificent ballet by vigano produced at the scala and the marchese did not forbid his wife to accompany her sister-in-law the quarterly payments of the little pension were drawn and it was the poor widow of the cisalpine general who lent a few sequins to the wealthy marchesa del longo these expeditions were delightful the ladies invited their old friends to dinner and consoled themselves by laughing at everything like real children their light-hearted italian gaiety helped them to forget the melancholy gloom which the marchese and his elder son shed over everything at grianta fabrizio then hardly sixteen years old represented the head of the family in a very satisfactory manner on the seventeenth of march eighteen fifteen the ladies very lately returned from a delightful little trip to milan were walking up and down under the fine avenue of plane trees which had lately been extended down to the very edge of the lake a boat appeared coming from the direction of como and made some peculiar signals one of the marchese's agents sprang ashore napoleon had just landed in the gulf of juan europe in general was simple enough to be surprised at this event which did not astonish the marchese del dongo he wrote his sovereign a letter full of heartfelt expressions of devotion placed his talents and several millions of money at his service and reaffirmed that his ministers were all jacobins and in league with the parisian leaders on the eighth of march at six o'clock in the morning the marchese adorned with all his insignia was writing the rough draft of a third political dispatch from his son's dictation solemnly he transcribed it in his large careful handwriting on paper the watermark of which bore his sovereign's effigy at that very moment fabrizio was entering the presence of his aunt the countess pietranera i am off he cried i am going to join the emperor he is king of italy as well how he loved your husband i shall go through switzerland last night my friend vasi the barometer dealer at minaggio gave me his passport now do you give me a few napoleons for i have only two of my own but if it comes to that i'll walk the countess was weeping with terror and delight good god she cried as she seized fabrizio's hands how did such an idea come into your head she rose from her seat and from the linen chest where it had been carefully concealed took a little bead embroidered purse containing all her earthly wealth take it she said to her nephew but in god's name do not get yourself killed what would be left to your unhappy mother and to me if you were taken from us as for napoleon's success that my poor child is impossible did not you hear the story a week ago when we were at milan of the three-and-twenty well-laid plots for his assassination which he only escaped by a miracle and in those days he was all-powerful 
and you have seen it is not the will to destroy him which our enemies lack. France has been nothing since he left her. The voice of the countess trembled with the liveliest emotion as she spoke to Fabrizio of Napoleon's future fate. When I consent to your going to join them, she said, I sacrifice for his sake what I hold dearest in this world. Fabrizio's eyes grew moist, and his tears fell as he embraced his aunt. But not for an instant did he waver in his determination to depart. He eagerly explained to this beloved friend the reasons which had decided him, reasons which we take the liberty of thinking somewhat comical. Yesterday evening, at seven minutes to six o'clock, we were walking, as you know, on the shores of the lake, under the plane trees, below the Casa Somariva, and our faces were turned southward. Then, for the first time, I noticed in the far distance the boat from Como which was bearing the great news to us. As I watched it, without a thought of the Emperor, and simply envying the fate of those who had an opportunity of travelling, I was suddenly overwhelmed by a feeling of deep emotion. The boat had touched the shore, and the agent, after whispering something to my father, who had changed colour, had taken us aside to inform us of the terrible news. I turned toward the lake with the simple object of hiding the tears of joy with which my eyes were swimming. Suddenly, on my right, and at an immense height, I perceived an eagle, Napoleon's own bird. It was winging its majestic way toward Switzerland, and consequently toward Paris. And I, too, said I to myself instantly, will cross Switzerland, swiftly as an eagle, and will offer that great man a very little thing indeed. But still, all that I have to offer, the help of my feeble arm. He would fain have given us a fatherland, and he loved my uncle. That instant, while I yet watched the eagle by some strange charm, my tears were dried, and the proof that my idea came from above is that at that very moment, and without hesitation, my resolve was taken, and the method of carrying out the journey became clear to me. In a flash, all the melancholy, which, as you know, poisons my life, especially on Sundays, was swept away as by some divine breath. I saw the great figure of Italy rising out of the mire into which the Germans have cast her, and stretching out her wounded arms on which the chains still hang towards her king and liberator. And I, too, I murmured, the son as yet unknown of that unhappy mother, I will depart, and I will die or win victory beside the man of fate who would have cleansed us from the scorn cast on us by the vilest and most enslaved of the inhabitants of Europe. You know, he added in a lower voice, drawing closer to the countess, and as he spoke he fixed great flashing eyes upon her, you know the young chestnut tree which my mother planted with her own hands the winter I was born, beside the deep pool in our forest two leagues off. Before I would do anything, I went to see it. The spring is not far advanced, said I to myself, well, if there are leaves on my tree, that will be a sign for me, and I too must cast off the torpor in which I languish in this cold and dreary house. Are not those old blackened walls the symbols now and once the strongholds of despotism, the true picture of winter and its dreariness? To me they are what winter is to my tree. Would you believe it, Gina, at half-past seven yesterday evening I had reached my chestnut tree. There were leaves upon it, pretty little leaves of a fair size already. I kissed them without hurting them, carefully turned the soil round the beloved tree, and then, in a fresh transport, crossed the mountain and reached Minaggio. A passport was indispensable if I was to get into Switzerland. The hours had flown, and it was one o'clock in the morning when I reached Vasi's door. I expected to have to knock for long before I could rouse him, but he was sitting up with three of his friends, at my very first word. You are going to Napoleon, he cried, and fell upon my neck. The others, too, embraced me joyfully. Why am I married? cried one. The countess had grown pensive. She thought it her duty to put forward some objection. If he had possessed the smallest experience, Fabrizio would have perceived that she herself had no faith in the excellent reasons she hastened to lay before him. But though experience was lacking, he had plenty of resolution, and would not even condescend to listen to her expostulations. Before long, the countess confined herself to obtaining a promise that at all events his mother should be informed of his plan. She will tell my sisters, and those women will betray me unconsciously, cried Fabrizio, with a sort of heroic arrogance. 
speak more respectfully said the countess smiling through her tears of the sex which will make your fortune for men will never like you you are too impulsive to please prosaic beings when the marchesa was made acquainted with her son's strange project she burst into tears his heroism did not appeal to her and she did everything in her power to dissuade him but she was soon convinced that nothing but prison walls would prevent him from starting and gave him what little money she had of her own then she recollected that she had in her possession eight or ten small diamonds worth about ten thousand francs given her the night before by the marchese so that she might have them reset the next time she went to milan fabrizio returned the poor ladies the contents of their slender purses and his sisters entered their mother's room while the countess was sewing the diamonds into our hero's travelling coat they were so enthusiastic over his plan and embraced him with such noisy delight that he snatched up a few diamonds which had not yet been hidden in his clothes and insisted on starting off at once you will betray me without knowing it he said to his sisters and as i have all this money i need not take clothes i shall find them wherever i go he kissed his loved ones and departed that instant without even going back to his room so rapidly did he walk in his terror of being pursued by mounted men that he reached lugano that very evening he was safe by god's mercy in a swiss town and no longer feared that gendarmes in his father's pay might lay violent hands on him in the lonely road from lugano he wrote a fine letter to the marchese a childish performance which increased that gentleman's fury then he took horse crossed the st gothard travelling rapidly and entered france by pontarlier the emperor was in paris and in paris fabrizio's misfortunes began he had started with the firm intention of getting speech with the emperor the idea that this might be difficult never entering his head at milan he had seen prince eugene a dozen times a day and could have spoken to him each time if he would in paris he went every day of his life to watch the emperor review his troops in the court of the tuileries but never could get near him our hero believed every frenchman must be as deeply moved as he was himself by the extreme danger in which the country stood at the table of the hotel in which he lived he made no secret of his plans or his devotion he found himself surrounded by young men of agreeable manners and still more enthusiastic than himself who succeeded before many days were passed in relieving him of every penny he possessed fortunately and out of sheer modesty he had not mentioned the diamonds given him by his mother one morning when after a night's orgy it became quite clear to him that he had been robbed he bought himself two fine horses engaged an old soldier one of the horse dealer's grooms as his servants and overflowing with scorn for the young parisians who talked so fine started to join the army he had no information save that it was concentrating near maubeuge hardly had he reached the frontier when it struck him as absurd that he should stay indoors and warm himself at a good fire while soldiers were bivouacking in the open air in spite of the remonstrances of his servant who was a sensible fellow he insisted in the most imprudent manner on joining the military bivouac on the farthest edge of the frontier toward belgium he had hardly reached the first battalion lying beside the road when the soldiers began to stare at the young civilian whose dress had not a touch of uniform about it night was falling and the wind was very cold fabrizio drew near to a fire and offered to pay for leave to sit by it the soldiers looked at each other in astonishment especially at this offer of pay but made room for him good-naturedly and his servant extemporized a shelter for him but an hour later when the adjutant of the regiment passed within hail of the bivouac the soldiers reported the arrival of the stranger who talked bad french the adjutant questioned fabrizio who told him of his worship for the emperor in an accent of the most doubtful description whereupon the officer requested that he would accompany him to the colonel who was quartered in a neighboring farm fabrizio's servant at once brought up the two horses the sight of them seemed to produce such an effect upon the non-commissioned officer that he immediately changed his mind and began to question the servant as well the man an old soldier suspected his interlocutor's plan of campaign and spoke of his master's influence in high quarters adding that his fine horses could not easily be taken from him instantly at a sign from the adjutant one soldier seized him by the collar another took charge of the horses 
and fabrizio was sternly ordered to follow his captor and hold his tongue after making him march a good league through darkness that seemed all the blacker by contrast with the bivouac fires which lighted up the horizon on every side the adjutant handed fabrizio over to an officer of gendarmerie who gravely demanded his papers fabrizio produced his passport which described him as a dealer in barometers travelling with his merchandise what fools they are cried the officer this really is too much he questioned our hero who talked about the emperor and liberty in terms of the most ardent and enthusiastic description whereupon the officer fell into fits of laughter upon my soul he cried they are anything but clever to send us greenhorns such as you is a little too much really and in spite of everything fabrizio could say and his desperate assurances that he really was not a dealer in barometers he was ordered to the prison of b a small town in the neighbourhood where he arrived at three o'clock in the morning bursting with anger and half dead with fatigue here he remained astonished first of all and then furious and utterly unable to understand what had happened for thirty-three long days he wrote letter after letter to the commander of the fortress the jailer's wife a handsome flemish woman of six-and-thirty undertaking to deliver them but as she had no desire whatever to see so good-looking a young fellow shot and as moreover he paid her well she invariably put his letters in the fire very late at night she would condescend to come to listen to his complaints she had informed her husband that the simpleton had money whereupon that prudent functionary had given her carte blanche she availed herself of his permission and gleaned several gold pieces for the adjutant had only taken the horses and the police officer had confiscated nothing at all one fine afternoon fabrizio caught the sound of a heavy though distant cannonade fighting had begun at last his heart thumped with impatience he heard a great deal of noise too in the streets an important military movement was in fact in course of execution three divisions were marching through the town when the jailer's wife came to share his sorrows at about eleven o'clock that night fabrizio made himself even more agreeable than usual then taking her hands in his he said help me to get out i swear on my honour i'll come back to prison as soon as the fighting is over that's all gammon she replied have you any quibus cash he looked anxious not understanding what the word quibus meant the woman seeing his expression concluded his funds were running low and instead of talking about gold napoleons as she had intended only mentioned francs listen she said if you can raise a hundred francs i will blind both eyes of the corporal who will relieve the guard to-night with a double napoleon then he will not see you get out of prison and if his regiment is to be off during the day he will make no difficulties the bargain was soon struck the woman even agreed to hide fabrizio in her own room out of which it would be easier for him to slip in the early morning the next day before dawn she said to our hero and there was real feeling in her tone my dear boy you are very young to ply this horrible trade of yours believe me don't begin it again what repeated fabrizio is it wicked then to want to fight for one's own country enough but always remember i have saved your life your case was a clear one you would certainly have been shot but never tell anybody for we should lose our place my husband and i and above all never repeat your silly tale about being a milanese gentleman disguised as a dealer in barometers it is too foolish now listen carefully i am going to give you the clothes of a hussar who died in the prison the day before yesterday never open your lips unless you are obliged to if a sergeant or an officer questions you so that you have to reply say you have been lying ill in the house of a peasant who found you shaking with fever in a ditch and sheltered you out of charity if this answer does not satisfy them say you are working your way back to your regiment you may be arrested because of your accent then say you were born in piedmont that you are a conscript and were left behind in france last year and so on so on for the first time after his three-and-thirty days of rage and fury fabrizio understood the meaning of what had befallen him he had been taken for a spy he reasoned with the jailer's wife who felt very tenderly towards him that morning and at last while she armed with a needle was taking in the hussar's garments for him frankly told her his story 
For a moment she believed it. He looked so simple and so handsome in his hussar uniform. As you had set your heart on fighting, she said, half convinced at last, you should have enlisted in some regiment as soon as you got to Paris. That job would have been done at once if you had taken any sergeant to a tavern and paid his score there. She added a great deal of good advice for his future, and at last, just as day was breaking, let him out of the house, after making him swear again and again a hundred times over that whatever happened to him, her name should never pass his lips. As soon as Fabrizio had got clear of the little town and began stepping out boldly along the high road with his sabre tucked under his arm, a shadow fell upon his soul. Here I am, he reflected, with the clothes and the root papers of a hussar who died in prison, where he was put, I understand, for stealing a cow and some silver spoons and forks. I have inherited, so to speak, his existence, and that without any wish or intention of my own. Look out for prisons. The omen is clear. I shall suffer many things from prisons. Hardly an hour after he had bidden farewell to his benefactress, the rain began to fall with such violence that the newly fledged hussar, hampered by the heavy boots which had never been made for his feet, could hardly contrive to walk. He came across a peasant riding a sorry nag and bought the horse, bargaining by signs, for the jailer's wife had advised him to speak as little as possible on account of his foreign accent. That day the army, which had just won the Battle of Ligny, was in full march on Brussels. It was the eve of the Battle of Waterloo. Toward noon, while the rain still poured down, Fabrizio heard artillery firing. In his happiness he forgot all the terrible moments of despair he had endured in his undeserved prison. He travelled on, far into the night, and as he was beginning to learn a little sense, he sought shelter in a peasant's hut quite off the main road. The peasant was crying and saying that he had been stripped of everything he had. Fabrizio gave him a crown and discovered some oats. My horse is no beauty, the young man reflected, but still some adjutant fellow might take a fancy to him and he lay down in the stable beside his mount. An hour before daylight, next morning, he was on the road again. By dint of much coaxing, he wheedled his horse into a trot. Toward five o'clock he heard heavy firing. It was the beginning of Waterloo. End of chapter two Chapter Three of the Chartreuse of Parma by Stendhal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To volunteer or for further information, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Three. Fabrizio soon came upon some cantiniers, and the deep gratitude he felt toward the jailer's wife incited him to address them. He inquired of one of them as to where the fourth regiment of hussars to which he belonged might be you would do much better not to be in such a hurry my young fellow replied the woman touched by fabrizio's pallor and the beauty of his eyes your hand is not steady enough yet for the sword play that this day must see now if you had only a gun i don't say but that you might fire it off as well as any other man the advice was not pleasing to fabrizio but, however much he pressed his horse, he could not get it to travel any faster than the sutler's cart. Every now and then the artillery fire seemed to grow closer, and prevented each from hearing what the other said, for so wild was the boy with enthusiasm and delight that he had begun to talk again. Every word the woman dropped increased his joy by making him realize it more fully. He ended by telling the woman, who seemed thoroughly kind-hearted, the whole of his adventures, with the exception of his real name and his flight from prison. She was much astonished, and could make neither head nor tail of the handsome young soldier's story. "'I have it!' she cried at last, with a look of triumph. "'You are a young civilian, in love with the wife of some captain in the Fourth Hussars. Your lady-love has given you the uniform you wear, and you are tearing about after her. As sure as God reigns above us, you are no soldier, you have never been a soldier. But, like the brave fellow you are, you are determined to be with your regiment while it is under fire, rather than be taken for a coward. Fabrizio agreed to everything. That was the only method by which he could secure good advice. 
i know nothing of these french people's ways he said to himself and if somebody doesn't guide me i shall get myself into prison again or some fellow will steal my horse from me in the first place my boy said the cantiniere who was growing more and more friendly you must admit you are under twenty i don't believe you're an hour over seventeen that was true and fabrizio willingly admitted it then you're not even a conscript it's simply and solely for the lady's sake that you are risking your bones bless me she's not over squeamish if you still have any of the yellow boys she has given you in your pocket the first thing you must do is buy yourself another horse look how that brute of yours pricks up her ears whenever the guns growl a little close to her that's a peasant's horse it'll kill you the moment you get to the front see that white smoke yonder over the hedge that means musket volleys therefore my fine fellow make ready to be in a horrible fright when you hear the bullets whistling over your head you had far better eat a bit now while you have the time fabrizio acted on her advice and pulling a napoleon out of his pocket requested the cantiniere to pay herself out of it it's a downright pity cried the good woman the poor child doesn't even know how to spend his money twould serve you right if i pocketed your napoleon and made my cocotte start off at full trot devil take me if your beast could follow her what could you do you simpleton if you saw me make off let me tell you that when the big guns begin to grumble nobody shows his gold pieces here she went on i give you back eighteen francs and fifty centimes your breakfast costs you thirty sous soon we shall have horses to sell then you'll give ten francs for a small one and never more than twenty not even for the best the meal was over, and the cantiniere, who was still holding forth, was interrupted by a woman who had been coming across the fields, and now passed along the road. "'Hello! Hi!' she shouted. "'Hello! Margot! Your sixth light regiment is on the right!' "'I must be off, my boy,' said the cantiniere. "'But really and truly I am sorry for you. Upon my soul I feel friendly to you. You know nothing about anything. You'll be wiped out as sure as God is God.' come along with me to the sixth i understand very well that i know nothing at all said fabrizio but i mean to fight and i'm going over there to that white smoke just look how your mare's ears are wagging the moment you get her down there she'll take the bit in her teeth weak as she is and gallop off and god knows where she'll take you to take my advice as soon as you get down to the soldiers pick up a musket and an ammunition pouch lie down beside them and do exactly as they do but lord i'll wager you don't even know how to bite open a cartridge fabrizio though sorely galled truthfully answered that his new friend had guessed right poor little chap he'll be killed at once god's truth it won't take long you must and shall come with me she added with an air of authority but i want to fight so you shall fight the sixth is a first-rate regiment and there'll be fighting for everyone to-day but shall we soon get to your regiment in a quarter of an hour at the outside if this good woman vouches for me reasoned fabrizio i shall not be taken for a spy on account of my universal ignorance and i shall get a chance of fighting at that moment the firing grew heavier the reports following closely one upon another like the beads in a rosary said fabrizio to himself i begin to hear the volleys said the cantiniere whipping up her pony which seemed quite excited by the noise she turned to the right along a cross-road leading through the meadow the mud was a foot deep and the little cart almost stuck in it fabrizio pushed at the wheels twice over his horse fell down soon the road grew drier and dwindled into a mere footpath across the sward fabrizio had not ridden on five hundred paces when his horse stopped short a corpse lying across the path had startled both beast and rider fabrizio whose face was naturally pale turned visibly green the cantiniere looking at the dead man said as though talking to herself nobody of our division and then raising her eyes to our hero's face burst out laughing ha ha my child she cried here's a lollipop for you fabrizio sat on horror-struck what most impressed him was the mud on the feet of the corpse which had been stripped of its shoes and of everything else indeed except a wretched pair of blood-stained trousers come said the cantiniere tumble off your horse you must get used to it 
Ha! Ah, she went on. He got it through the head. The corpse was hideously disfigured. A bullet had entered near the nose and passed out at the opposite temple. One eye was open and staring. Now then, get off your horse, boy, cried the cantinier. Shake him by the hand and see if he'll shake yours back. At once, though sick almost to death with horror, Fabrizio threw himself from his horse, seized the dead hand, and shook it well. Then he stood in a sort of dream. He felt he had not strength to get back upon his horse. The dead man's open eye especially filled him with horror. This woman will take me for a coward, thought he to himself bitterly. Yet he felt that he could not stir. He would certainly have fallen. It was a terrible moment. Fabrizio was just going to faint dead away. The cantinier saw it, jumped smartly out of her little cart, and without a word proffered him a glass of brandy, which he swallowed at a gulp. After that he was able to remount, and rode along without opening his lips. Every now and then the woman looked at him out of the corner of her eye. "'You shall fight to-morrow, my boy,' she said at last. "'Today you shall stay with me. You see now that you must learn your soldier's trade.' not at all i want to fight now at once cried our hero and his look was so fierce that the cantinier augured well from it the artillery fire grew heavier and seemed to draw nearer the reports began to form a sort of continuous bass there was no interval between them and above this deep note which was like the noise of a distant torrent the musketry volleys rang out distinctly just at this moment the road turned into a grove of trees the cantinier noticed two or three french soldiers running toward her as hard as their legs would carry them she sprang nimbly from her cart and ran to hide herself some fifteen or twenty paces from the road there she concealed herself in the hole left by the uprooting of a great tree now said fabrizio to himself i shall find out whether i am a coward he halted beside the forsaken cart and drew his sword the soldiers paid no attention to him but ran along the wood on the left side of the road those are some of our men said the cantinier coolly as she came back panting to her little cart if your mare had a canter in her i would tell you to ride to the end of the wood and see if there is anyone on the plain beyond fabrizio needed no second bidding he tore a branch from a poplar tree stripped off the leaves and belaboured his mount soundly for a moment the brute broke into a canter but it soon went back to its usual jog trot the cantinier had forced her pony into a gallop stop stop i say she shouted to fabrizio soon they both emerged from the wood when they reached the edge of the plain they heard a most tremendous noise heavy guns and musketry volleys thundered on every hand right left and behind them and as the grove from which they had just emerged crowned a hillock some eight or ten feet higher than the plain they had a fair view of a corner of the battlefield but the meadow just beyond the wood was empty it was bounded about a thousand paces from where they stood by a long row of very bushy willow trees beyond these hung a cloud of white smoke which now and then eddied up toward the sky if only i knew where the regiment was said the woman looking puzzled we can't go straight across that big meadow by the way young fellow she said to fabrizio if you see one of the enemy stick him with the point of your sword don't amuse yourself by trying to cut him down just at that moment she caught sight of the four soldiers of whom we have already spoken they were coming out of the wood on to the plain to the left of the road one of them was on horseback here's what you want said she to fabrizio then shouting to the mounted man hello you why don't you come and drink a glass of brandy the soldiers drew nearer where's the sixth light regiment she called out over there five minutes off in front of the canal that runs along those willows and colonel macon has just been killed will you take five francs for that horse of yours five francs that's a pretty fair joke my good woman five francs for an officer's charger that i shall sell for five napoleons before the hour's out give me one of your napoleons whispered the cantinier to fabrizio then going close up to the man on horseback get off and look sharp about it she said here's your napoleon the soldier slipped off and fabrizio sprang gaily into his saddle while the cantinier unfastened the little valise he had carried on the other here why don't you help me you fellows said she to the soldier what do you mean by letting a lady work 
that the captured charger no sooner felt the valise than he began to plunge and fabrizio who was a first-rate horseman had to use all his skill to retain his seat that's a good sign said the cantinier the gentleman's not accustomed to the tickling of valises it's a general's horse cried the soldier who had sold it that horse is worth ten napoleons if it's worth a farthing here are twenty francs for you said fabrizio who was beside himself with joy at feeling a spirited animal between his legs just at this moment a round shot came whizzing slantwise through the row of willows and fabrizio enjoyed the curious sight of all the little branches flying left and right as if they had been mowed off with a scythe hum said the soldier as he pocketed his twenty francs the worry's beginning it was about two o'clock in the day fabrizio was still lost in admiration of this curious spectacle when a group of generals escorted by a score of hussars galloped across one of the corners of the wide meadow on the edge of which he was standing his horse neighed plunged two or three times and pulled violently at the curb so be it then said fabrizio to himself he gave the animal the rein and it dashed full gallop up to the escort which rode behind the generals fabrizio counted four plumed hats a quarter of an hour later he gathered from some words spoken by the hussar next to him that one of these generals was the famous marshal ney that crowned his happiness yet he could not guess which of the four was the marshal he would have given all the world to know but he remembered he must not open his lips the escort halted to cross a large ditch which the rain of the preceding night had filled with water it was skirted by large trees and ran along the left side of the meadow at the entrance of which fabrizio had bought his horse almost all the hussars had dismounted the sides of the ditch were steep and exceedingly slippery and the water lay quite three or four feet below the level of the meadow fabrizio wrapped up in his delight was thinking more about marshal ney and glory than about his horse which being very spirited jumped into the water course splashing the water up to a considerable height one of the generals was well wetted and shouted with an oath devil take the damn brute this insult wounded fabrizio deeply can i demand an explanation he wondered meanwhile to prove that he was not so stupid as he looked he tried to force his horse up the opposite side of the ditch but it was five or six feet high and most precipitous he was obliged to give it up then he followed up the current the water rising to his horse's head and came at last to a sort of watering place up the gentle slope of which he easily passed into the field on the other side of the cutting he was the first man of the escort to get across and trotted proudly along the bank at the bottom of the ditch the hussars were floundering about very much puzzled what to do with themselves for in many places the water was five feet deep two or three of the horses took fright and tried to swim which created a terrible splashing then a sergeant noticed the tactics followed by the greenhorn who looked so very unlike a soldier turn up the stream he shouted there's a watering place on the left and by degrees they all got over when fabrizio reached the farther bank he found the generals there all alone the roar of the artillery seemed to him louder than ever he could hardly hear the general he had so thoroughly drenched who shouted into his ear where did you get that horse fabrizio was so taken aback that he answered in italian lo comprato poco fa i have just bought it what do you say shouted the general again but the noise suddenly grew so tremendous that fabrizio could not reply at this moment it must be acknowledged our hero felt anything but heroic still fear was only a secondary sensation on his part it was the noise that hurt his ears and disconcerted him so dreadfully the escort broke into a gallop they were crossing a wide stretch of ploughed land which lay beyond the canal the field was dotted with corpses the redcoats the redcoats shouted the hussars joyfully fabrizio did not understand them at first then he perceived that almost all the corpses were dressed in red and also which gave him a thrill of horror that a great many of these unhappy redcoats were still alive they were crying out evidently asking for help but nobody stopped to give it to them our hero in his humanity did all he could to prevent his horse from treading on any red uniform the escort halted fabrizio instead of attending to his duty as a soldier galloped on with his eye on a poor wounded fellow 
will you pull up you idiot shouted the troop sergeant major then fabrizio became aware that he was twenty paces in advance of the general's right and just in the line of their field glasses as he rode back to the rear of the escort he saw the most portly of the officers speaking to his next neighbour also a general with an air of authority and almost of reprimand he swore fabrizio could not restrain his curiosity and in spite of the advice of his friend the jailer's wife never to speak if he could help it made up a neat and correct little french sentence who's that general blowing up the one next him he asked why that's the marshal to be sure what marshal marshal nay you fool where in thunder have you been serving up to now touchy though he was by nature fabrizio never dreamed of resenting the insult lost in boyish admiration he feasted his eyes on the bravest of the brave the famous prince of the moskova suddenly every one broke into a gallop in a few minutes fabrizio saw another ploughed field about twenty paces in front of him the surface of which was heaving in a very curious manner the furrows were full of water and the damp earth of the ridges was flying about three or four feet high in little black lumps fabrizio just noticed this odd appearance as he galloped along then his thoughts flew back to the marshal and his glory a sharp cry rang out close to him two hussars fell struck by bullets and when he looked at them they were already twenty paces behind the escort a sight which seemed horrible to him was that of a horse bathed in blood struggling on the ploughed earth with its feet caught in its own entrails it was trying to follow the others the blood was pouring over the mud well i am under fire at last he thought i have seen it he reiterated with a glow of satisfaction now i am a real soldier the escort was now galloping at full speed and our hero realized that it was shot which was tossing up the soil in vain he gazed in the direction whence the fusillade came the white smoke of the battery seemed to him an immense way off and amid the steady and continuous grumble of the artillery fire he thought he could distinguish other reports much nearer he could make nothing of it at all at that moment the generals and their escort entered a narrow lane sunk about five feet below the level of the ground it was full of water the marshal halted and put up his glass again this time fabrizio had a good view of him he saw a very fair man with a large red head we have no faces like that in italy he mused with my pale face and chestnut hair i shall never be like him he added sadly to him those words meant i shall never be a hero he looked at the hussars all of them except one had fair moustaches if fabrizio stared at them they stared at him as well he coloured under their scrutiny and to ease his shyness turned his head toward the enemy he saw very long lines of red figures but what astonished him was that they all looked so small those long files which were really regiments and divisions seemed to him no higher than hedges a line of red-coated horsemen was trotting toward the sunken road along which the marshal and his escort had begun to move slowly splashing through the mud the smoke made it impossible to see anything ahead only from time to time hurrying horsemen emerged from the white smoke suddenly fabrizio saw four men come galloping as hard as they could tear from the direction in which the enemy lay ah said he to himself we are going to be attacked then he saw two of these men address the marshal and one of the generals in attendance upon him galloped off toward the enemy followed by two hussars of the escort and the two men who had just ridden up on the other side of a small watercourse which everybody now crossed fabrizio found himself riding alongside a good-natured looking sergeant i really must speak to this man he said to himself perhaps if i do that they'll stop staring at me after considerable meditation he said to the sergeant this is the first time i have ever seen a battle but is it really a battle i should think so but who on earth are you i am brother to a captain's wife and what's the captain's name our hero was in a hideous difficulty he had never expected that question luckily for him the sergeant and the escort began to gallop again what french name shall i say he wondered at last he bethought himself of the name of the man who had owned the hotel in which he had lodged in paris he brought his horse up close beside the sergeant's charger and shouted at the top of his voice captain meunier the other half deafened by the noise of the artillery answered 
what captain tullier well he's been killed bravo said fabrizio to himself captain tullier i must look distressed oh my god he cried and put on a pitiful face they had left the sunken road and were crossing a small meadow every one tore at full gallop for the bullets were pelting down again the marshal rode toward a cavalry division the escort was surrounded now by dead and wounded men but our hero was already less affected by the sight he had something else to think about while the escort was halting he noticed a cantiniere with her little cart his affection for that excellent class of women overrode every other feeling and he galloped off toward the vehicle stop here you shouted the sergeant what harm can he do me thought fabrizio and he galloped on toward the cart he had felt some hope as he spurred his horse onward that its owner might be the good woman he had met in the morning the horse and cart looked very much like hers but the owner of these was quite a different person and very forbidding looking into the bargain as he drew close to her he heard her say well he was a very handsome chap a hideous sight awaited the newly made soldier a cuirassier a splendid fellow nearly six feet high was having his leg cut off fabrizio shut his eyes and drank off four glasses of brandy one after the other you don't stint yourself my little fellow quoth the cantiniere the brandy gave him an idea i must buy my comrade's good will give me the rest of the bottle he said to the woman but do you know that on such a day as this the rest of the bottle will cost you six francs as he galloped back to the escort aha you were fetching us a dram twas for that you deserted exclaimed the sergeant hand over the bottle went round the last man throwing it into the air after he had drained it thank ye comrade he shouted to fabrizio every eye looked kindly on him and these glances lifted a hundred weight off his heart one of those over delicate organs which pines for the friendship of those about it at last then his comrades thought no ill of him there was a bond between them he drew a deep breath and then turning to the sergeant calmly inquired and if captain tullier has been killed where am i to find my sister he thought himself a young machiavelli when he said tullier instead of meunier you'll find that out to-night replied the sergeant once more the escort moved forward in the direction of some infantry divisions fabrizio felt quite drunk he had swallowed too much brandy and swayed a little in his saddle then he recollected very much in season a remark he had frequently heard made by his mother's coachman when you've lifted your little finger you must always look between your horse's ears and do what your next neighbor does the marshal halted for some time close to several bodies of cavalry which he ordered to charge but for the next hour or two our hero was hardly conscious of what was going on about him he was overcome with weariness and when his horse galloped he bumped in his saddle like a lump of lead suddenly the sergeant shouted to his men don't you see the emperor you and instantly the escort shouted vive l'empereur at the top of their voices my readers may well imagine that our hero stared with all his eyes but all he saw was a bevy of generals galloping by followed by another escort the long hanging plumes on the helmets of the dragoons in attendance prevented him from making out any faces so thanks to that cursed brandy i have missed seeing the emperor on the battlefield the thought woke him up completely they rode into another lane swimming with water and the horses paused to drink so that was the emperor who passed by he said to the next man why certainly the one in the plain coat how did you miss seeing him answered his comrade good-naturedly fabrizio was sorely tempted to gallop after the emperor's escort and join it what a joy it would have been to serve in a real war in attendance on that hero was it not for that very purpose that he had come to france i am perfectly free to do it he reflected for indeed the only reason for my doing my present duty is that my horse chose to gallop after these generals but what decided him on remaining was that his comrades the hussars treated him in a friendly fashion he began to believe himself the close friend of every one of the soldiers with whom he had been galloping the last few hours he conceived himself bound to them by the noble ties that united the heroes of tasso and ariosto if he joined the emperor's escort he would have to make fresh acquaintances and perhaps he might get the cold shoulder for the horsemen of the other escort were dragoons and he like all those in attendance on the marshal wore hussar uniform 
the manner in which the troopers now looked at him filled our hero with happiness he would have done anything on earth for his comrades his whole soul and spirit were in the clouds everything seemed different to him now that he was among friends and he was dying to ask questions but i am not quite sober yet he thought i must remember the jailer's wife as they emerged from the sunken road he noticed that they were no longer escorting marshal ney the general they were now attending was tall and thin with a severe face and a merciless eye he was no other than the count de a the lieutenant robert of may fifteenth seventeen ninety six what would have been his delight at seeing fabrizio del dongo for some time fabrizio had ceased to notice the soil flying hither and thither under the action of the bullets the party rode up behind a regiment of cuirassiers he distinctly heard the missiles pattering on the cuirasses and saw several men fall the sun was already low and it was just about to set when the escort leaving the lane climbed the little slope which led into a ploughed field fabrizio heard a curious little noise close to him and turned his head four men had fallen with their horses the general himself had been thrown but was just getting up all covered with blood fabrizio looked at the hussars on the ground three of them were still moving convulsively the fourth was shouting pull me out the sergeant and two or three troopers had dismounted to help the general who leaning on his aide-de-camp was trying to walk a few steps away from his horse which was struggling on the ground and kicking furiously the sergeant came up to fabrizio just at that moment behind him and close to his ear he heard somebody say it's the only one that can still gallop he felt his feet seized and himself lifted up by them while somebody supported his body under the arms thus he was drawn over his horse's hindquarters and allowed to slip on to the ground where he fell in a sitting posture the aide-de-camp caught hold of the horse's bridle and the general assisted by the sergeant mounted and galloped off swiftly followed by the six remaining men in a fury fabrizio jumped up and ran after them shouting ladri ladri thieves thieves there was something comical about this running after thieves over a battlefield the escort and general count de a soon vanished behind a row of willow trees before very long fabrizio still beside himself with rage reached a similar row and just beyond it he came to a very deep watercourse which he crossed when he reached the other side he began to swear at the sight but a very distant sight of the general and his escort disappearing among the trees thieves thieves he shouted again this time in french broken-hearted much less by the loss of his horse than by the treachery with which he had been treated weary and starving he cast himself down beside the ditch if it had been the enemy which had carried off his fine charger he would not have given it a thought but to see himself robbed and betrayed by the sergeant he had liked so much and the hussars whom he had looked on as his brothers filled his soul with bitterness the thought of the infamy of it was more than he could bear and leaning his back against a willow he wept hot angry tears one by one his bright dreams of noble and chivalrous friendship like the friendships of the heroes of jerusalem delivered had faded before his eyes the approach of death would have been as nothing in his sight if he had felt himself surrounded by heroic and tender hearts by noble-souled friends whose hands should have pressed his while he breathed out his last sigh but how was he to keep up his enthusiasm which he was when he was surrounded by such vile rascals fabrizio like every angry man had fallen into exaggeration after a quarter of an hour spent in such melancholy thoughts he became aware that the bullets were beginning to fall among the row of trees which sheltered his meditation he rose to his feet and made an effort to discover his whereabouts he looked at the meadow bounded by a broad canal and a line of bushy willows and thought he recognized the spot then he noticed a body of infantry which was crossing the ditch and debouching into the meadows some quarter of a league ahead of him i was nearly caught napping thought he i must take care not to be taken prisoner and he began to walk forward very rapidly as he advanced his mind was relieved he recognized the uniform the regiments which he feared might have cut off his retreat belonged to the french army he bore to the right so it was to reach them beside the moral suffering of having been so vilely deceived and robbed fabrizio felt another the pangs of which were momentarily increasing he was literally starving 
it was with the keenest joy therefore that after walking or rather running for ten minutes he perceived that the body of infantry which had also been moving very rapidly had halted as though to take up a position a few minutes more and he was among the nearest soldiers comrades could you sell me a piece of bread hello here's a fellow who takes us for bakers the rude speech and the general titter that greeted it overwhelmed fabrizio could it be that war was not after all that noble and general impulse of souls thirsting for glory which napoleon's proclamations had led him to conceive it he sat down or rather let himself drop upon the sward he turned deadly pale the soldier who had spoken and who had stopped ten paces off to clean the lock of his gun with his handkerchief moved a little nearer and threw him a bit of bread then seeing he did not pick it up the man put a bit of bread into his mouth fabrizio opened his eyes and ate the bread without having strength to say a word when at last he looked about for the soldier intending to pay him he saw he was alone the nearest soldiers to him were some hundred paces off marching away mechanically he rose and followed them he entered a wood he was ready to drop with weariness and was already looking about for a place where he might lay him down when to his joy he recognized first the horse then the cart and finally the cantiniere he had met in the morning she ran to him quite startled by his looks march on my boy she said are you wounded and where's your fine horse as she spoke she led him toward her cart into which she pushed him lifting him under the arms so weary was our hero that before he had well got into the cart he had fallen fast asleep end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Chartres of Parma by Stendhal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four. Nothing woke him. Neither the shots that rang out close to the little cart, nor the jolting of the horse, which the good woman whipped up with all her might the regiment after having believed all day long that victory was on its side had been unexpectedly attacked by clouds of prussian cavalry and was retreating or rather flying toward the french border the colonel a handsome well set up young man who had succeeded to macon's command was cut down the major who took his place an old fellow with white hair halted the regiment come he shouted to his men in the days of the republic none of us ran away till the enemy forced us to it you must dispute every inch of the ground and let yourselves be killed he added with an oath it's our own country that these prussians are trying to invade now the little cart stopped short and fabrizio woke with a jump the sun had disappeared long ago and he noticed to his surprise that it was almost dark the soldiers were running hither and thither in a state of confusion which greatly astonished our hero it struck him that they were all looked very crestfallen what's the matter said he to the cantiniere nothing at all the matter is that we're done for my boy that the prussian cavalry is cutting us down that's all the fool of a general took it for our own at first now then look sharp help me to mend the trace cocotte has broken it several musket shots rang out about ten paces off our hero now thoroughly rested said to himself but really all this whole day through i have never fought at all all i have done was to ride escort to a general i must go and fight said he to the woman make your mind easy you'll fight more than you want we're all done for aubry my boy she shouted to a corporal who was passing by give an eye to the little cart now and then are you going to fight said fabrizio to aubry no i'm going to put on my pumps and go to the ball i'm after you look after the little hussar shouted the cantiniere he's a plucky young chap corporal aubry marched on without saying a word eight or ten soldiers ran up and joined him he led them up behind a big oak with brambles growing all round it once there he stationed them still without opening his lips in a very open line along the edge of the wood each man at least ten paces from his neighbour now then you fellows he said and it was the first time his voice had been heard don't you fire until you hear the word of command remember you've only three cartridges apiece but what is happening wondered fabrizio to himself at last when he was alone with the corporal he said i have no musket 
hold your tongue to begin with go forward fifty paces beyond the wood you'll find some of our poor fellows who have just been cut down take a musket and ammunition pouch off one of them but mind you don't take them from a wounded man take the gun and pouch from some man who is quite dead and look sharp for fear you should get shot at by our own people fabrizio started off at a run and soon came back with a musket and ammunition pouch load your musket and get behind this tree and above all don't fire till i give the word great god said the corporal breaking off he doesn't even know how to load his weapon he came to fabrizio's rescue and went on talking as he did it if any of the enemy's cavalry ride at you to cut you down slip round your tree and don't fire your shot till your man's quite close not more than three paces off your bayonet must almost touch his uniform but will you chuck that great sword of yours away exclaimed the corporal do you want it to throw you down it's death what soldiers they send to us nowadays and as he spoke he snatched at the sword himself and threw it angrily away here wipe the flint of your gun with your handkerchief but have you ever fired a gun off i am a sportsman god be praised said the corporal with a sigh of relief well mind you don't fire till i give the word and he departed fabrizio was filled with joy at last said he to himself i am really going to fight and kill an enemy this morning they were shooting at us and all i did was to expose myself a fool's errand he looked about in every direction with the most eager curiosity after a moment seven or eight musket shots rang out close to him but as he received no order himself he stood quietly behind his tree it had grown almost quite dark he could have fancied he was hunting bears in the tramezzina above grianta he bethought him of a hunter's trick took a cartridge from his pouch and extracted the ball if i get a sight of him he said he i mustn't miss him and he slipped the extra ball down the barrel of his gun he heard two shots fired close to his tree and at the same moment he beheld a trooper dressed in blue galloping in front of him from right to left he's more than three paces off said he but at this distance i can't well miss him he covered the horseman with his musket and pulled the trigger the horse fell and his rider with him our hero fancied he was hunting and ran joyfully up to the quarry he had just bagged he had got quite close to the man who seemed to him to be dying when two prussian troopers rode down upon him at the most astounding rate with their swords lifted to cut him down fabrizio took to his heels and ran for the wood throwing away his gun so that he might run the quicker the prussian troopers were not more than three paces behind him when he reached a plantation of young oaks very straight growing and about as thick as a man's arm which skirted the wood the little oaks checked the horsemen for a moment but they soon got through them and pursued fabrizio across a clearing they were quite close on him again when he managed to slip between seven or eight big trees just at that moment his face was almost scorched by the fire from five or six muskets just in front of him he lowered his head and when he raised it again he found himself face to face with the corporal have you killed yours said the corporal yes but i've lost my musket muskets are not the thing we are short of you're a good chap though you do look like a muff you've done well to-day and these fellows have just missed the two who were after you and were riding straight upon them i didn't see them now we must make off the regiment must be half a mile away and besides there's a little bit of meadow to cross where we may be taken in flank as he talked the corporal marched swiftly along at the head of his ten men some two hundred paces farther on as he entered the little meadow of which he had spoken they came upon a wounded general supported by his aide-de-camp and a servant you must give me four men said he to the corporal and his voice was faint i must be carried to the ambulance my leg is shattered you may go to the devil replied the corporal you and all the rest of the generals you've all of you betrayed the emperor this day what cried the general in a fury you won't obey my orders do you know that i am the general count b commanding your division and so forth with a string of invectives the aide-de-camp rushed at the soldier the corporal thrust at him with his bayonet and then made off at the double followed by his men may they all be like you he repeated with an oath with their legs shattered and their arms too a pack of rascals sold to the bourbons and traitors to the emperor every one of them fabrizio heard the hideous accusation with astonishment toward ten o'clock in the evening the little party came upon the regiment at the entrance to a big village consisting of several narrow streets but fabrizio noticed that corporal aubry avoided speaking to any of the officers it's impossible to get on cried the corporal every street was crowded with infantry cavalry and especially with eight artillery caissons and baggage wagons 
the corporal tried to get up three of these streets but after about twenty paces he was forced to stop everybody was swearing and everybody was in a rage some other traitor must be in command cried the corporal if the enemy has the sense to move round the village we shall all be taken like dogs follow me men fabrizio looked there were only six soldiers left of the corporal's party through a big open doorway they passed into a great poultry yard and thence into a stable from which a little door admitted them into a garden here they lost their way for a moment and wandered hither and thither but at last climbing over a hedge they found themselves in a huge field of buckwheat and within less than half an hour following the noise of shouting and other confused sounds they had got back into the high road on the other side of the village the ditches on either side of the road were full of muskets which had been thrown away and fabrizio took one for himself but the road broad as it was was so crowded with carts and fugitives that in half an hour the corporal and fabrizio had hardly got five hundred paces forward they were told that the road would lead them to charleroi as the village clock struck eleven let us strike across country again cried the corporal the little band now consisted only of three privates the corporal and fabrizio when they had got about a quarter of a league from the high road i'm done up said one of the soldiers and so am i said another that's fine news we're all in the same boat said the corporal but do as i tell you and you'll be the better for it he caught sight of five or six trees growing beside a little ditch in the middle of an immense field of corn make for the trees said he to his men lie down here he added when they had reached them and above all make no noise but before we go to sleep which of you has any bread i have said one of the soldiers hand it over commanded the corporal with a masterful air he divided the bread into five pieces and took the smallest for himself a quarter of an hour before daybreak he said as he munched you'll have the enemy's cavalry upon you the great point is not to get yourself run through on these great plains one man alone with cavalry at his heels is done for but five men together may save themselves all of you stick faithfully to me don't fire except at close quarters and i'll undertake to get you into charleroi to-morrow night an hour before daybreak the corporal roused them he made them reload their weapons the noise on the highway still continued it had been going all night like the noise of a distant torrent it's like the noise sheep make when they are running away said fabrizio to the corporal with an artless air will you hold your tongue you greenhorn said the corporal angrily and the three privates who with fabrizio composed the whole of his army looked at our hero with an expression of indignation as if he had said something blasphemous he had insulted the nation this is rather strong thought our hero to himself i noticed the same sort of thing at milan under the viceroy they are not running away oh dear no with these frenchmen you must never tell the truth if it hurts their vanity but as for their angry looks i don't care a farthing for them and i must make them understand it they were still marching along some five hundred paces from the stream of fugitives which blocked the high road a league farther on the corporal and his party crossed a lane running into the high road in which many soldiers were lying here fabrizio bought a tolerable horse for forty francs and from among the numerous swords that were lying about he carefully chose a long straight weapon as i am told that i must thrust he thought this will be best thus equipped he put his horse into a canter and soon came up with the corporal who had gone forward he settled himself in his stirrups seized the sheath of his sword with his left hand and addressed the four frenchmen these fellows who are fleeing along the highway look like a flock of sheep they move like frightened sheep in vain did he dwell upon the word sheep his comrades had quite forgotten that only an hour previously it had kindled their ire here we perceive one of the contrasts between the french and the italian character the frenchman is doubtless the happier of the two events glide over him he bears no spite i will not conceal the fact that fabrizio was very much pleased with himself after he had talked about those sheep they marched along keeping up a casual conversation two leagues farther on the corporal who was very much astonished at seeing nothing of the enemy's cavalry said to fabrizio you are our cavalry so gallop toward that farm on the hillock yonder and ask the peasant if he'll sell us some breakfast be sure you tell him there are only five of us if he demurs give him five francs of your money on account but make your mind easy we'll take the silver piece back after we've had our breakfast 
fabrizio looked at the corporal his gravity was imperturbable and he really wore an appearance of moral superiority he obeyed and everything fell out just as the commander-in-chief had foretold only fabrizio insisted the peasant should not be forced to return the five franc piece he had paid him the money is my own said he to his comrades i'm not paying for you i'm paying for the corn he has given my horse fabrizio's french was so bad that his comrades thought they detected a tone of superiority about his remark they were very much offended and from that instant they began to hatch a quarrel with him they saw he was very different from themselves and that fact displeased them fabrizio on the contrary began to feel exceedingly friendly toward them they had been marching along silently for about two hours when the corporal looking toward the high road shouted in a transport of delight there's the regiment they were soon on the high road themselves but alas there were not two hundred men round the eagle fabrizio soon caught sight of the cantiniere she was walking along with red eyes and every now and then her tears overflowed in vain did fabrizio peer about looking for cocotte and the little cart pillaged lost stolen cried the poor woman in an answer to our hero's inquiring glance without a word he threw himself from his horse took him by the bridle and said to her get on his back she didn't wait for a second invitation shorten the stirrups for me she said once she was comfortably settled on horseback she began to tell fabrizio all the disasters of the preceding night after an endless story eagerly listened to however by our hero who could make nothing of it we must admit but who had a deep feeling of regard for the good-natured cantiniere she added and to think that it should be frenchmen who have robbed and beaten and ruined me what it wasn't the enemy cried fabrizio with an artlessness which made his handsome face so grave and pale look more charming than ever what a silly you are my poor child returned the woman smiling through her tears and silly as you are you are a very good fellow and however silly he may be he pulled his prussian down well yesterday added corporal aubry who had happened to find his way through the crowd to the other side of the horse on which the good woman was riding but he's proud said the corporal fabrizio started a little and what's your name continued he for after all if any report is sent in i should like to give it my name is vasi answered fabrizio with rather an odd look i mean correcting himself hastily boulot boulot had been the name of the owner of the root papers the jailer's wife had given him two nights before as he marched along he had studied them carefully for he was beginning to reflect a little and was not so astonished by everything that happened to him as he had been at first in addition to poor boulot's paper he had also carefully kept the italian passport according to which he claimed the noble name of vasi dealer in barometers when the corporal had taxed him with being proud it had been on the tip of his tongue to reply proud i fabrizio valserra marquisino del dongo who is willing to bear the name of a dealer in barometers called vasi while he was considering all this and saying to himself i really must remember that my name is boulot or i shall find myself in the prison with which fate threatens me the corporal and the cantiniere had been exchanging ideas about him don't take what i say from your curiosity said the cantiniere and she dropped the second person singular which in her homely fashion she had hitherto been using i'm going to ask you these questions for your own good who are you really and truly fabrizio was silent for a moment he was considering that he might never come across better friends from whom to ask advice and advice he sorely needed we are going into a fortified town the governor will want to know who i am and if my answers show that i know nothing about the hussar regiment the uniform of which i wear i shall be thrown into prison at once being an austrian subject fabrizio realized all the importance of his passport the members of his own family highly born and religious as they were had suffered frequent annoyance in this particular the good woman's questions were not therefore the least displeasing to him but when he paused before replying to choose out his clearest french expressions the cantiniere pricked with eager curiosity added by way of encouragement we'll give you good advice about your behaviour corporal aubry and i i'm sure of that answered fabrizio my name is vasi and i belong to genoa my sister who was a famous beauty married a captain as i am only seventeen she sent for me that i might see france and improve myself i did not find her in paris and knowing that she was with this army i followed it and have hunted in every direction without being able to find her the soldiers struck by my foreign accent had me arrested 
i had money at that time i gave some to the gendarme in charge of me he gave me papers and a uniform and said be off with you and swear you'll never mention my name to a living soul what was his name said the cantinier i gave my word said fabrizio he's right said the corporal the gendarme was a blackguard but our comrade mustn't tell his name and what was the name of the captain who married your sister if we knew his name we might find him tullier of the fourth hussars answered our hero then said the corporal rather sharply your foreign accent made the soldiers take you for a spy that's the vile word cried fabrizio and his eyes flamed i who worship the emperor and the french that insult hurts me more than anything there's no insult there's where you're mistaken replied the corporal gravely the soldier's mistake was very natural then he explained with more than a little pedantry that in the army every man must belong to a regiment and wear a uniform and failing that would certainly be taken for a spy the enemy he said has sent us heaps of them in this war traitors abound the scales fell from fabrizio's eyes and for the first time he understood that in everything that had happened to him during the past two months he himself had been at fault but the boy must tell us the whole story said the cantinier whose curiosity was momentarily growing keener fabrizio obeyed and when he had finished the fact is said she seriously and addressing the corporal the child knows nothing about soldiering this war will be a wretched war now that we are beaten and betrayed why should he get his bones broken gratis pro deo and with that said the corporal he doesn't even know how to load his gun either in slow time or in quick it was i who put in the bullet that killed his prussian for him and besides added the cantinier he lets everybody see his money and he'll be stripped of everything as soon as he leaves us and the first cavalry sergeant he comes across the corporal went on will take possession of him and make him pay for his drinks and he may even be recruited for the enemy for there's treachery everywhere the first man he meets will tell him to follow him and follow him he will he would do much better to enlist in our regiment no no i thank you corporal cried fabrizio eagerly i'm much more comfortable on horseback and besides i don't know how to load a musket and you've seen that i can manage a horse fabrizio was very proud of this little speech of his i will not reproduce the long discussion as to his future which ensued between the corporal and the cantinier fabrizio remarked that in the course of it they repeated all the incidents of his story three or four times over the soldier's suspicions the gendarme who sold him the uniform of the papers the manner in which he had fallen in with the marshal's escort on the previous day the story of the horse etc the cantinier with feminine curiosity constantly harked back to the manner in which he had been robbed of the good horse she had made him buy you felt somebody seize your feet and you were drawn gently over your horse's tail and were left sitting on the ground why is it wondered fabrizio that they keep going over things which we all know perfectly well he had not yet learned that this is the method whereby the humbler folk in france think a matter out how much money have you inquired the cantinier of him fabrizio answered unhesitatingly he was sure of this woman's noble-heartedness that is the finest side of the french character i may have about thirty napoleons in gold and eight or ten five-franc pieces altogether in that case your course is clear cried the cantinier get yourself out of this routed army turn off to one side take the first tolerable road you can find on the right ride steadily forward away from the army always buy yourself civilian clothes at the first opportunity when you are eight or ten leagues off and you see no more soldiers about you take post horses get to some good town and rest there for a week and eat good beefsteaks never tell anyone that you have been with the army the gendarmes would take you up at once as a deserter and a nice fellow as you are my boy you are not sharp enough yet to take in the gendarmes once you have civilian clothes upon your back tear your root papers into little bits and take back your real name say your vasi and where should he say he comes from she added appealing to the corporal from cambrai on the scheldt it's a good old town very small do you hear with the cathedral and fenelon that's it said the cantinier and never let out that you've been in the battle never breathe a word about b nor the gendarme who sold you the papers when you want to get back to paris go first of all to versailles and get into the city from that side just dawdling along on your feet as if you were out for a walk sew your money into your trousers and when you have to pay for anything mind you only just show the money you need for that 
what worries me is that you'll be made a fool of and you'll be stripped of everything you have and what is to become of you without money seeing you don't even know how to behave the good woman talked on and on the corporal backing her opinions by nodding his head for she gave him no chance of getting in a word suddenly the crowd upon the high road quickened its pace and then like a flash it crossed the little ditch on the left-hand side and fled at full speed the cossacks the cossacks rang out on every side take back your horse cried the cantinier god forbid said fabrizio gallop be off i give him to you do you want money to buy another little cart half of what i have is yours take back your horse i say said the good woman in a rage and she tried to get off fabrizio drew his sword hold on tight he cried and he struck the horse two or three times with the flat of the blade it broke into a gallop and followed the fugitives our hero looked at the high road only a few minutes before it had been crowded with some two or three thousand people packed like peasants in a religious procession since that cry of cossacks there was not a soul upon it the fugitives had thrown away their shakos their muskets and their swords fabrizio thoroughly astonished climbed about twenty or thirty feet into a field on the right of the road thence he looked up and down the high road and across the plain there was not a sign of any cossack queer people these frenchmen said he to himself then he went on as i am to go to the right i may as well start at once these people may have had some reason for bolting which i don't know he picked up a musket made sure it was loaded shook the powder in the priming cleaned the flint then chose himself a well-filled cartridge pouch and looked all round him again he stood literally alone in the middle of the plain which had lately been so packed with people in the far distance he saw the fugitives still running along and beginning to disappear behind the trees this really is very odd he said and remembering the corporal's manoeuvre on the preceding night he went and sat down in the middle of a cornfield he would not go far away because he hoped to rejoin his friends the corporal and the cantiniere sitting in the corn he discovered he had only eighteen napoleons left instead of thirty but he had a few little diamonds which he had hidden in the lining of his hussar boots on the morning of his parting with the jailer's wife he concealed his gold pieces as best he could and pondered deeply the while over this sudden disappearance of his fellow travellers is it a bad omen for me he wondered his chief vexation was that he had not asked corporal aubry the following question have i really been in a battle he thought he had and he would have been perfectly happy if he could have been quite certain of it in any case he said i was present at it under a prisoner's name and i had the prisoner's root papers in my pocket and even his coat upon my back all that is fatal for my future what would father blanes have said of it and that unlucky boulot died in prison too it all looks very ominous my destiny will lead me to a prison fabrizio would have given anything in the world to know whether boulot had really been guilty he had a recollection that the jailer's wife had told him the hussar had been locked up not only for stealing spoons and forks but for having robbed a peasant of his cow and further beaten the said peasant unmercifully he had no doubt that he himself would some day find himself in prison for misdoings of the same nature as those of the hussar he thought of his friend the priest what would he not have given to be able to consult him then he recollected that he had not written to his aunt since he left paris poor gina he said and the tears rose to his eyes all at once he heard a slight noise close to him it was a soldier feeding three horses whose bridles he had removed and who seemed half dead with hunger on the growing corn he was holding them by the snaffle fabrizio flew up like a partridge and the soldier was startled our hero perceiving it could not resist the pleasure of playing the hussar for a moment fellow he shouted one of those horses is mine that i will give you five francs for the trouble you've taken to bring it to me i wish you may get it said the soldier fabrizio who was within six paces levelled his musket at him give up the horse or i'll blow your brains out the soldier had his musket slung behind him he twisted his shoulder back to get it if you stir a step you're a dead man shouted fabrizio rushing at him well well hand over the five francs and take one of the horses said the soldier rather crestfallen 
after glancing regretfully up and down the road on which not a soul was to be seen fabrizio with his gun still raised in his left hand threw him three five-franc pieces with the right get down or you're a dead man put the bit on the black horse and move off with the others i'll blow your brains out if you shuffle with an evil glance the man obeyed fabrizio came close to the horse and slipped the bridle over his left arm without taking his eyes off the soldier who was slinking slowly away when he saw he was about fifty paces off our hero sprang upon the horse's back he had hardly got into the saddle and his foot was still searching for the right stirrup when a bullet whistled close beside his head it was the soldier who had fired his musket at him fabrizio in a fury galloped toward him he took to his heels and was soon galloping away on one of his horses well he's out of range now said fabrizio to himself the horse he had just bought was a splendid animal but it seemed to be almost starving fabrizio went back to the high road which was still quite deserted he crossed it and trotted on toward a little undulation in the ground on the left where he hoped he might find the cantiniere but when he reached the top of the tiny eminence he could only see a few scattered soldiers more than a league away he sighed it is written he said that i am never to see that good kind woman again he went to a farm which he had noticed in the distance on the right of the road without dismounting he fed his poor horse with oats which he had paid for beforehand it was so starving that it actually bit at the manger an hour later he was trotting along the high road still in the vague hope that he might find the cantiniere or at all events come across corporal aubry as he pushed steadily forward looking about on every side he came to a marshy stream spanned by a narrow wooden bridge near the entrance to the bridge and on the right side of the road stood a lonely house which displayed the sign of the white horse i'll have my dinner there said fabrizio to himself beside the bridge was a cavalry officer with his arm in a sling he was sitting on his horse and looked very sad ten paces from him three dismounted troopers were busy with their pipes those fellows said fabrizio to himself look very much as if they might be inclined to buy my horse even cheaper than the price i have paid for him the wounded officer and the three men on foot were watching him and seemed to be waiting for him i really ought to avoid that bridge and follow the river bank on the right that's what the cantiniere would advise me to do to get out of the difficulty yes said our hero to himself but if i take to flight i shall be ashamed of it to-morrow besides my horse has good legs and the officer's horse is probably tired out if he tries to dismount me i'll take to my heels reasoning thus fabrizio shook his horse together and rode on as slowly as possible come on hussar shouted the officer with a voice of authority fabrizio came on a few steps and then halted do you want to take my horse from me he called out not a bit of it come on fabrizio looked at the officer his moustache was white he had the most honest face imaginable the handkerchief which supported his left arm was covered with blood and his right hand was also wrapped in a bloody bandage it's those men on foot who will snatch at the horse's bridle thought fabrizio but when he looked closer he saw that the men on foot were wounded as well in the name of all that's honourable said the officer who wore a colonel's epaulets keep watch here and tell every dragoon light cavalryman and hussar you may see that colonel le baron is in the inn here and that he orders them to report themselves to him the old colonel looked broken-hearted his very first words had won our hero's heart and he replied very sensibly i'm very young sir perhaps nobody would listen to me i ought to have a written order from you he's right said the colonel looking hard at him write the order la rose you can use your right hand without a word la rose drew a little parchment covered book from his pocket wrote a few words tore out the leaf and gave it to fabrizio the colonel repeated his orders adding that fabrizio would be relieved after two hours as was only fair by one of the wounded soldiers who were with him this done he went into the tavern with his men fabrizio so greatly had he been struck by the silent and dreary sorrow of the three men sat motionless at the end of the bridge watching them disappear they were like enchanted genii said he to himself 
at last he opened the folded paper and read the following order colonel le baron sixth dragoons commanding the second brigade of the first cavalry division of the fourteenth corps orders all cavalry dragoons light cavalrymen and hussars not to cross the bridge and to report themselves to him at his headquarters the white horse tavern close to the bridge dated headquarters close to the bridge over the saint june nineteenth eighteen fifteen signed for colonel le baron wounded in the right arm by and by his orders sergeant la rose fabrizio had hardly kept guard on the bridge for half an hour when six light cavalrymen mounted and three on foot approached him he gave them the colonel's order we are coming back said four of the mounted men and they crossed the bridge at full trot by that time fabrizio was engaged with the two others while the altercation grew warmer the three men on foot slipped over the bridge one of the two remaining mounted men ended by asking to see the order and carried it off saying i'll take it to my comrades who are sure to come back you wait patiently for them and he galloped off with his companion after him the whole thing was done in an instant fabrizio in a fury beckoned to one of the wounded soldiers who had appeared at one of the tavern windows the man whom fabrizio observed to be wearing a sergeant's stripes came downstairs and shouted as he drew near him draw your sword sir don't you know you're on duty fabrizio obeyed and then said they've carried off the order they're still savage over yesterday's business answered the other drearily i'll give you one of my pistols if they break through again fire it in the air and i'll come down or the colonel will make his appearance fabrizio had noticed the gesture of surprise with which the sergeant had received the intelligence that the order had been carried off he had realized that the incident was a personal insult to himself and was resolved that nothing of the sort should happen in future he had gone back proudly to his post armed with the sergeant's pistol when he saw seven hussars come riding up he had placed himself across the entrance to the bridge he gave them the colonel's order which vexed them very much the boldest tried to get across fabrizio obeying the wise advice of his friend the cantiniere who had told him the previous morning that he must cut and not thrust lowered the point of his big straight sword and made as though he would have run through anybody who disobeyed the order ha the greenhorn wants to kill us as if we had not been killed enough yesterday they all drew their swords and fell upon fabrizio he gave himself up for dead but he remembered the look of surprise on the sergeant's face and resolved he would not be despised a second time he backed slowly over his bridge trying to thrust with his point as he went he looked so queer with his great straight cavalry sword much too heavy for him and which he did not know how to handle that the hussars soon saw who they had to deal with then they tried not to wound him but to cut his coat off his back he thus received three or four small sword cuts on the arm meanwhile faithful to the cantiniere's advice he kept on thrusting with all his might unluckily one of his lunges wounded a hussar in the hand the man furious at being touched by such a soldier replied with a violent thrust which wounded fabrizio in the thigh the wound was all the deeper because our hero's charger instead of escaping from the melee seemed to delight in it and to throw himself deliberately on the assailants the hussars seeing fabrizio's blood running down his right arm were afraid they had gone too far and forcing him over to the left parapet of the bridge they galloped off the instant fabrizio was free for a moment he fired his pistol in the air to warn the colonel four mounted hussars and two on foot belonging to the same regiment as the last had been coming toward the bridge and were still two hundred paces off when the pistol shot rang out they were carefully watching what happened on the bridge and thinking fabrizio had fired upon their comrades the four mounted men galloped down upon him brandishing their swords it was a regular charge colonel le baron summoned by the pistol shot opened the tavern door rushed onto the bridge just as the hussars galloped up to it and himself ordered them to halt there is no colonel here cried one of the men and he spurred his horse the colonel in his anger broke off his remonstrance and seized the rein of the horse on the off side with his wounded hand halt sir he cried to the hussar i know you you belong to captain henriet's company 
very well then let the captain give me his orders captain henriet was killed yesterday he added with a sneer and you may go and be damned as he spoke he tried to force his way through and knocked over the old colonel who fell in a sitting posture on the floor of the bridge fabrizio who was two paces farther on the bridge but facing the tavern urged his horse furiously forward and while the hussar's horse overthrew the colonel who still clung to the off rein he thrust vehemently and angrily at its rider luckily the man's horse which was dragged downward by the bridle onto which the colonel was still hanging started to one side so that the long blade of fabrizio's heavy cavalry sword slipped along the hussar's waistcoat and came right out under his nose the hussar in his fury turned round and hacked at fabrizio with all his strength cutting through his sleeve and making a deep wound in his arm our hero tumbled off his horse one of the dismounted hussars seeing the two defenders of the bridge lying on the ground seized his opportunity sprang onto fabrizio's horse and would have galloped it off the bridge and away but the sergeant who had hurried up from the tavern had seen his colonel fall and believed him to be seriously wounded he ran after fabrizio's horse and plunged the point of his sword into the thief's back so that he too fell then the hussars seeing nobody but the sergeant standing on the bridge galloped across it and rode rapidly away the sergeant went to look after the wounded fabrizio had already picked himself up he was not in much pain but he was losing a great deal of blood the colonel rose to his feet more slowly he was quite giddy from his fall but he was not wounded at all the only thing that hurts me he said to his sergeant is the old wound in my hand the hussar whom the sergeant had wounded was dying the devil may take him cried the colonel but said he to the sergeant and the two other troopers who now hurried up look after this boy whose life i did wrong to endanger i will stay at the bridge myself and try to stop these madmen take the young fellow to the inn and dress his arm use one of my shirts for bandages end of chapter four chapter five of the chartres of parma by stendhal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 The whole affair had not lasted more than a minute. Fabrizio's wounds were of the most trifling description. His arm was bound up in strips torn off one of the colonel's shirts. He was offered a bed in the upper story of the inn. But while I am lying comfortably here, said Fabrizio to the sergeant, my horse will feel lonely in the stable, and he may take himself off with another master not bad for a recruit said the sergeant and he settled fabrizio on some clean straw in the very manger to which his horse was tied then as fabrizio felt very faint he brought him a bowl of hot wine and talked to him for a while certain compliments included in this conversation made our hero feel as happy as a king it was near daybreak on the following morning when fabrizio awoke the horses were neighing long and loud and making a terrible racket the stable was full of smoke at first fabrizio could make nothing of the noise and did not even realize where he was at last when the smoke had half stifled him it struck him that the house was on fire in the twinkling of an eye he was out of the stable and on his horse's back he looked up and saw the smoke pouring out of the two windows above the stable and the roof of the house hidden in a black whirling cloud a good hundred fugitives had reached the tavern during the night and all of them were shouting and swearing at once the five or six who were close to fabrizio seemed to him to be completely drunk one of them tried to stop him shouting where are you taking my horse when fabrizio had gone about a quarter of a league he looked back nobody was following him the house was blazing he recognized the bridge thought of his wound and touched his arm which felt hot and tight in the bandages and what had become of the old colonel he gave his shirt to bind up my arm that morning our hero was the coolest and most collected man in the world the quantities of blood he had lost had washed all the romantic qualities out of his character to the right said he and let us be off 
he quietly followed the course of the river which after passing under the bridge flowed toward the right side of the road he remembered the good cantiniere's advice what true friendship said he to himself what an honest soul after an hour he began to feel very weak now then he thought am i going to faint if i faint somebody will steal my horse and perhaps my clothes and with my clothes my valuables he had not strength to guide his horse and was doing his best to keep steady in the saddle when a peasant digging in a field hard by the high road noticed his pallor and offered him a glass of beer and a bit of bread seeing you so pale said the man i thought you might have been wounded in the great battle never did help come more in the nick of time when fabrizio began to chew that morsel of black bread his eyes had begun to sting when he looked in front of him when he had pulled himself together a little he thanked his benefactor and where am i he inquired the peasant informed him that three-quarters of a league farther on he would find the little town of zonders where he would be well cared for fabrizio reached the town without well knowing what he was doing his only care being how not to fall off at every step his horse took he saw a big gate standing open and rode through it it led to a tavern the curry comb the good-natured mistress of the house an exceedingly fat woman ran forward calling for help in a voice that shook with pity two young girls assisted fabrizio to dismount before he was well out of his saddle he fainted dead away a surgeon was summoned and he was bled on that day and those following it he hardly knew what was being done to him he slept almost incessantly the puncture in his leg threatened to turn into a serious abscess Whenever he was in his senses, he begged that care might be taken of his horse, and frequently reiterated that he would pay well, which mightily offended the good hostess and her daughters. He had been admirably tended for a fortnight, and was beginning to collect his thoughts a little, when he noticed one evening that his nurses seemed very much disturbed. Presently a German officer entered his room. The language in which his questions were answered was one which Fabrizio did not understand but he clearly perceived that he himself was the subject of the conversation. He pretended to be asleep. Some time afterward, when he thought the officer must have departed, he called his hostess. Did not that officer come to write my name down on a list and take me prisoner? With tears in her eyes, his hostess admitted the fact. Well then, he cried, raising himself up in his bed, there's money in my pocket. Buy me civilian clothes, and this very night I'll ride away. You've saved my life once already by taking me in when I should have fallen and died in the street. Save it again by helping me to get back to my mother. At this point the landlady's daughters both burst into tears. They trembled for Fabrizio's safety, and as they could hardly understand any French, they came close to his bed to question him. They held a discussion with their mother in Flemish, but every moment their wet eyes turned pityingly upon our hero. He thought, he gathered, that his flight might compromise them seriously, but that they were ready to take the risk. He clasped his hands together and thanked them earnestly. A local Jew undertook to provide him with a suit of clothes, but when he brought it about ten o'clock that night, the young ladies discovered, by comparing the coat with Fabrizio's hussar jacket, that it was a great deal too large for him. They set to work on it at once. There was no time to be lost. Fabrizio showed them several Napoleons hidden in his garments, and begged them to sew them into those which had just been bought. With the suit the Jew had brought a fine pair of new boots. Fabrizio did not hesitate to ask the kind-hearted girls to cut open his hussar boots at the place he showed them, and his little diamonds were soon hidden in the lining of his new footgear. A singular result of his loss of blood and his consequent weakness was that Fabrizio had almost entirely forgotten his French. He talked to his hostesses in Italian, and as they spoke nothing but their Flemish patois, intercourse was really carried on solely by signs. When the young girls, perfectly disinterested as they were, beheld the diamonds, their admiration for our hero knew no bounds. They were convinced he was a prince in disguise. Anakin, the younger and more artless of the two, kissed him without further ceremony. Fabrizio, for his part, thought them charming, and toward midnight, when, in consideration of the journey he was about to take, the surgeon had allowed him to drink a little wine, he was half inclined not to depart at all. "'Where could I be better off than I am here?' he said. Nevertheless, about two o'clock in the morning, he got up and dressed. 
just as he was leaving his room the kindly hostess informed him that his horse had been carried off by the officer who had searched the house a few hours previously ah the blackguard cried fabrizio to play such a trick on a wounded man and he began to swear our young italian was not enough of a philosopher to recollect the price he himself had paid for the horse anakin told him through her tears that a horse had been hired for him if she could have had her will he would not have started at all the parting was a tender one two tall young fellows the good landlady's kinsmen lifted fabrizio into his saddle and walked along holding him up while a third preceded the little party by a few hundred paces on the lookout for any suspicious patrol upon the road after two hours journey a halt was made at the house of a cousin of the hostess of the curricombe in spite of all fabrizio could say he could not induce the young men to leave him nobody they declared knew the paths through the forest as well as they but tomorrow morning when my escape becomes known and you are not seen in the neighbourhood your absence will get you into trouble urged fabrizio a fresh start was made and by good luck when daylight came a heavy fog shrouded the plain toward eight o'clock in the morning they were near a small town one of the young men went on to see whether the post horses had all been stolen the postmaster had been able to hide them and to fill up his stable with vile screws instead two horses were fetched out of the swamps where they had been concealed and three hours later fabrizio clambered into a little cabriolet shabby enough but drawn by two excellent posters he felt stronger already his parting with the hostess's young kinsman was pathetic in the extreme never not under one of the friendly pretexts fabrizio could invent could he induce them to accept a halfpenny in your condition sir you need it much more than we do was the honest young fellow's invariable reply they departed at last bearing letters in which fabrizio somewhat steadied by the excitement of his journey had endeavoured to express all he felt for his benefactresses the tears were in his eyes as he wrote and in his letter to little anakin some love passages certainly occurred nothing extraordinary happened during the rest of his journey when he reached amiens the sword thrust in his thigh was causing him great suffering the country surgeon had not thought of keeping the wound open and in spite of the bleeding an abscess had formed during the fortnight fabrizio spent in the inn at amiens kept by an obsequious and covetous family the allies were overrunning france and so deeply did our hero reflect upon his late experiences that he became another man there was only one point on which he still remained a child had the fighting he had seen really been a battle and second was it the battle of waterloo for the first time in his life he found pleasure in reading he was always hoping to discover in the newspapers or the descriptions of the battle something which would enable him to recognize the ground he had ridden over with marshal ney's and the other general's escort during his stay at amiens he wrote almost every day to his good friends of the curry comb inn as soon as he was cured he went to paris at his former hotel he found twenty letters from his mother and his aunt all beseeching him to return as quickly as possible the last one from the countess pietranera was couched in a sort of enigmatic tone which alarmed him very much this letter dispelled all his tender dreams to a man of his nature a word sufficed to stir up apprehensions of the gravest kind and his imagination immediately depicted misfortunes aggravated by the most gruesome details be careful not to sign your letters when you write us news of yourself said the countess when you return you must not come straight to the lake of como stop in swiss territory at lugano he was to arrive at that little town under the name of cavi there at the principal inn he was to find his aunt's manservant who would tell him what he was to do next the countess closed her letter with the following words use every means to conceal the folly you have committed and above all keep no paper whether written or printed about you in switzerland you will be surrounded by the friends of st marguerite footnote this name thanks to signor peldico is known all over europe it is that of the street in milan in which the ministry of police and the prisons are situated End of footnote. if i have money enough i will send somebody to the hotel de balance at geneva to give you details which i cannot write 
and which nevertheless you must have before you arrive but for god's sake not another day in paris our spies there will recognize you fabrizio's imagination began to picture the most extraordinary things and the only pleasure of which he was capable was that of trying to guess what the amazing fact might be with which his aunt desired to acquaint him twice during his journey across france he was arrested but each time he contrived to obtain his release these annoyances he owed to his italian passport and that strange title of dealer in barometers which tallied so ill with his useful countenance and his arm in a sling at geneva at last he met one of his aunt's serving men who told him from her that he fabrizio had been denounced to the milanese police as having gone over to napoleon with proposals formulated by a huge conspiracy organized in his late kingdom of italy if this was not the object of his journey said his accuser why should he have taken a false name his mother would endeavour to prove the truth firstly that he had never gone beyond switzerland and secondly that he had left the castle hastily in consequence of a quarrel with his elder brother when fabrizio heard the story his first feeling was one of pride i have been taken for a sort of ambassador of napoleon i am supposed to have had the honour of speaking to that great man would to god it had been so he recollected that his ancestor seven generations back grandson of that valserra who had come to milan with sforza underwent the honour of having his head cut off by the duke's enemies who laid hands upon him as he was going into switzerland to carry proposals to the cantons and to collect recruits he could see in his mind's eye the engraving recording this fact in the family genealogy when fabrizio cross-questioned the man-servant he found him in a fury about a matter which he let slip at last in spite of the fact that the countess had told him several times over to hold his tongue about it it was fabrizio's elder brother ascanio who had denounced him to the milanese police this cruel fact threw our hero into a state bordering on madness to get into italy from geneva it was necessary to pass through lausanne he insisted on starting instantly on foot and walking ten or twelve leagues although the diligence from geneva to lausanne was to depart within two hours before he left geneva he had a quarrel in one of the dreary cafes of the place with a young man who so he declared had looked at him strangely it was perfectly true the phlegmatic sensible young citizen who never thought of anything but making money believed him to be mad when fabrizio entered the cafe he had cast wild glances about him on every side and then spilled the cup of coffee he had ordered over his trousers in this quarrel fabrizio's first instinctive movement was quite in the style of the sixteenth century instead of suggesting a duel to the young genevan he drew his dagger and threw himself upon him to strike him in that moment of fury fabrizio forgot everything he had learned concerning the code of honour and fell back on the instinct or should i rather say on the memories of his early boyhood the confidential servant whom he met at lugano increased his rage by relating fresh details fabrizio was very much loved at grianta and nobody would ever have mentioned his name but for his brother's spiteful proceeding every one would have pretended to believe that he was at milan and the attention of the police would never have been drawn to his absence you may be quite certain that the customs officers hold a description of your appearance said his aunt's messenger and if we travel by the high road you will be stopped on the frontier fabrizio and his attendants knew every mountain path between lugano and the lake of como they disguised themselves as hunters in other words as smugglers and as they were three together and resolute looking fellows into the bargain the customs officers they met did no more than greet them civilly fabrizio arranged matters so as to arrive at the castle about midnight at that hour his father and all the servants with powdered heads were sure to be safe in their beds without any difficulty he dropped into the deep ditch and entered the castle by a small window opening out of a cellar here his mother and his aunt were awaiting him very soon his sisters joined them for a long time they were all in such a transport of tenderness and tears that they had hardly begun to talk sensibly before the first rays of dawn warned these beings who believed themselves unhappy the time was slipping by i hope your brother will not have suspected your return said the countess pietranera i have hardly spoken to him since this fine prank of his and his vanity did me the honour of being very much hurt 
Tonight, at supper, I condescended to address him. I had to find some pretext for hiding my wild delight, which might have roused his suspicions. Then, when I perceived how proud he was of this sham reconciliation, I took advantage of his satisfaction to make him drink a great deal more than was good for him, and he will certainly not have thought of lying in ambush to carry on his spying operations. "'It's in your room that we must hide our hussar,' said the Marchesa. "'He cannot start at once. We have not collected our thoughts sufficiently as yet, and we must choose the best way of throwing that terrible Milanese police off the scent.' This idea was promptly put into practice. But on the following day, the Marchese and his eldest son remarked that the Marchesa spent all her time in her sister's apartment. We will not depict the passion of joy and tenderness that filled these happy beings' hearts during the whole of that day. The Italian nature is much more easily wrung than ours by the suspicions and wild fancies born of a feverish imagination but its joys on the other hand are far deeper than ours and last much longer during the whole of that day the countess and the marchesa were absolutely beside themselves they made fabrizio begin all his stories over and over again at last so difficult did any further concealment of their feelings from the sharp eyes of the marchese and his son ascanio appear that they decided to betake themselves to milan and there conceal their mutual ecstasy the ladies took the usual boat belonging to the castle as far as Como. Any other course would have aroused innumerable suspicions. But when they reached the port of Como, the Marchesa recollected that she had left papers of the most important description at Grianta. She sent the boatmen back at once, and they were thus deprived of all opportunity of noticing the manner in which the two ladies employed their time at Como. The moment the latter arrived, they hired one of the carriages that always stand near the high tower, built in the Middle Ages, which rises above the Milan gate, and started off at once, without giving the coachman time to speak to a soul. About a quarter of a league beyond the town, they fell in with the young sportsman of their acquaintance, who, as they had no gentleman with them, was good-natured enough to attend them to the gates of Milan, whither he himself was bound, shooting on the way everything promised well and the ladies were talking most merrily to the young traveller when just where the road bends round the base of the pretty hill and wood of san giovanni three gendarmes in disguise sprang to the horses heads ah cried the marchesa my husband has betrayed us and she fainted away a sergeant of gendarmes who had been standing somewhat in the background approached the carriage he stumbled as he walked and spoke in a voice that was redolent of the tavern I am sorry to have to perform this duty, but I arrest you, General Fabio Conti. Fabrizio thought the sergeant was poking fun at him by calling him general. I'll pay you out for this, thought he to himself. He had his eye on the gendarmes, and was watching his opportunity to leap from the carriage and take to his heels across the fields. The countess smiled at a venture, as I think, and then said to the sergeant, but my good sergeant do you take this child of sixteen years old to be general conti are you not the general's daughter said the sergeant behold my father said the countess pointing to fabrizio the gendarmes broke into a roar of laughter show your passports and don't bandy words said the sergeant nettled by the general mirth these ladies never take any passport to go to milan said the coachman with a cool and philosophic air they are coming from their house at grianta this one is the Countess Pietranera, and that one is the Marchesa del Dongo. The sergeant, quite put out of countenance, went to the horses' heads, and there held counsel with his men. The conference had lasted quite five minutes when the Countess begged the carriage might be moved a few paces farther into the shade. The heat was overwhelming, though it was only eleven o'clock in the day. Fabrizio, who had been looking about carefully in all directions with a view to making his escape, noticed emerging from a field path which led on to the dusty road a young girl of fourteen or fifteen with her handkerchief to her face shedding frightened tears she walked between two gendarmes in uniform and three paces behind her also flanked by gendarmes came a tall bony man who gave himself dignified airs like a prefect walking in a procession but where did you find them said the sergeant who now appeared quite drunk running away across the fields and not a passport between them 
the sergeant seemed to have quite lost his bearings he had five prisoners now instead of the two he had been sent out to take he retired a little distance leaving only one man to look after the prisoner with the majestic demeanour and another to keep the horses from moving on stay here whispered the countess to fabrizio who had already jumped out of the carriage it will all come right they heard a gendarme exclaim what does it matter if they have no passports we have a right to take them up the sergeant did not seem quite so sure the name of pietranera had alarmed him he had known the general and he was not aware of his death the general he reflected is not the man to forego his vengeance if i arrest his wife without authority during this deliberation which was somewhat lengthy the countess had entered into conversation with the young girl who was still standing in the dust on the road beside the carriage she had been struck by her beauty the sun will do you harm signorina that honest soldier she added addressing the gendarme standing at the horses heads will let you get into the carriage i am sure fabrizio who was prowling round the carriage came forward to help the young lady into it she had her foot on the step and fabrizio's hand was under her arm when the imposing individual who was standing six paces behind the carriage called out in a voice that his desire to look dignified made yet more rasping stop on the road do not get into a carriage which does not belong to you fabrizio had not heard this order the young girl instead of trying to get up tried to get down and as fabrizio still held her she fell into his arms he smiled and she blushed deeply for a moment after the girl had freed herself from his clasp they stood looking into each other's eyes what a charming prison companion said fabrizio to himself what deep thoughts lie behind that brow that woman would know how to love the sergeant approached with an air of importance which of these ladies is called clelia conti i said the young girl and i exclaimed the elderly man i am general fabio conti chamberlain to his serene highness the prince of parma and i think it most improper that a man of my position should be hunted like a thief the day before yesterday when you embarked at the port of como did you not send the police inspector who asked you for your passport about his business well to-day the inspector prevents you from going about your business my boat had already pushed off from the shore i was in a hurry a storm was coming on a man without a uniform shouted to me from the pier to come back into the port i told him my name and i went on my way and this morning you sneaked out of como a man in my position does not take out a passport to go from the land to see the lake this morning at como i was told i should be arrested at the gate i left the town on foot with my daughter i hoped i might meet with some carriage on the road which would take me to milan where my first visit will certainly be to the general commanding the province to lay my complaint before him the sergeant seemed relieved of a great weight very good general you are under arrest and i shall take you to milan and who are you he said turning to fabrizio my son put in the countess ascanio son of general pietranera without a passport madam said the sergeant very much more politely he is so young he has never had one he never travels alone he is always with me while this colloquy was proceeding general conti had been growing more and more dignified and more and more angry with the gendarmes not so many words said one of them at last you're arrested and there's an end of it you'll be very lucky said the sergeant if we give you leave to hire a horse from some peasant otherwise in spite of the dust and heat and your chamberlainship you'll just march along among our horses the general began to swear will you hold your tongue said the gendarme where's your uniform any man who chooses can say he's a general the general grew more and more furious in the carriage meanwhile matters were going far better the countess was making all the gendarmes run about as if they had been her servants she had just given one of them a crown to go and fetch her some wine and above all some cool water from a villa which stood about two hundred paces off she had found time to pacify fabrizio who was most anxious to bolt into the wood that clothed the hill i have two good pistols he kept saying she persuaded the angry general to let his daughter get into her carriage on this occasion the general who was fond of talking of himself and his family informed the ladies that his daughter was only twelve years old having been born on october twenty seventh eighteen three 
but that she was so sensible that everyone took her for fourteen or fifteen quite a common person was the verdict which the countess's eyes telegraphed to the marquesas in an hour's time thanks to the former lady everything was settled one of the gendarmes who had business in the adjoining village hired his horse to general conti after the countess had told him he would have ten francs for it the sergeant departed alone with the general and his comrades remained under a tree with four huge bottles of wine which the gendarme with the assistance of a peasant had brought back from the villa the worthy chamberlain authorized clelia conti to accept a seat in the lady's carriage back to milan and the idea of arresting the gallant general pietranera's son never entered into anybody's head after the first moments devoted to general civilities and remarks on the little incident just brought to a close clelia conti noticed the touch of enthusiasm evident in the beautiful countess's manner when she spoke to fabrizio Clelia was sure she was not his mother. More especially was her attention attracted by the constant allusions to something bold, heroic, dangerous in the highest degree which he had lately done. But what that might be, the young girl, clever as she was, could not divine. She gazed in wonder on the young hero, whose eyes still seemed to sparkle with the fire of action. He, on his side, was somewhat taken aback by the singular beauty of the twelve-year-old girl, and his glances brought the colour to her cheeks about a league from milan fabrizio took leave of the lady saying he must go and see his uncle if ever i get out of my difficulties said he addressing clelia i shall go and see the great pictures at parma will you deign then to remember this name fabrizio del dongo very good said the countess so that's how you keep your incognito signorina be good enough to remember that this scamp is my son and that his name is pietranera and not del dongo that evening very late fabrizio entered milan by the renza gate which leads to a fashionable promenade the very modest hordes amassed by the marchesa and her sister had been exhausted by the expense of sending servants into switzerland luckily fabrizio still had a few napoleons and one of the diamonds which they decided to sell two ladies were much beloved and knew everybody in the city the leading members of the austrian and religious party spoke to baron binder the chief of the police in fabrizio's favour these gentlemen could not understand they declared how the prank of a boy of sixteen who had quarrelled with his elder brother and left his father's house could be taken seriously my business is to take everything seriously gently replied the baron a wise and melancholy man he was then engaged in organizing the far-famed milan police and had undertaken to prevent a revolution like that of seventeen forty six which drove the austrians out of genoa this milanese police which afterward became celebrated by its connection with the adventures of pellico and andriana was not exactly cruel but it carried laws of great severity into logical and pitiless execution the emperor francis the second was determined to strike terror into these bold italian imaginations give me said baron binder to fabrizio's friends the proved facts as to what the young marquisino del dongo has been doing every day from the moment he left grianta on the eighth of march until his arrival last night in this city where he is hidden in a room in his mother's apartment and i am ready to look upon him as the most charming and frolicsome young fellow in the town but if you cannot give me information as to the young man's goings and comings for every day since his departure from grianta is it not my duty to have him arrested however high may be his birth and however deep my respect for the friends of his family and am i not bound to keep him in prison until he has proved to me that he did not convey a message to napoleon from the few malcontents who may exist among his majesty the emperor king's lombard subjects and further gentlemen note well that even if young del dongo contrives to justify himself on this score he will still remain guilty of having gone abroad without a regular passport and also of passing under a false name and knowingly using a passport issued to a mere artisan that is to say to an individual of a class infinitely inferior to his own this declaration merciless in its logic was accompanied by all that show of deference and respect due from the head of the police to the exalted position of the marchesa del dongo 
and of the important personages who had come forward on her behalf when the marchesa heard the baron's reply she was in despair fabrizio will be arrested she exclaimed bursting into tears and once he is in prison god only knows when he will come out his father will cast him off the two ladies took counsel with two or three of their closest friends and in spite of everything they said the marchesa wished to insist on sending her son away the following night but said the countess you must surely see that baron binder knows quite well that your son is here he is not a spiteful man no but he desires to please the emperor francis but if he thought he could serve his own ends by putting fabrizio into prison he would have done it already and if you insist on the boy's taking to flight you insult him by your want of confidence but the very fact that he admits he knows fabrizio's whereabouts is as good as telling us to send him away no i shall never breathe freely as long as i can say to myself in a quarter of an hour my boy may be shut up between four walls whatever baron binder's ambition may be added the marchesa he thinks his personal position in this country will be strengthened by an affected consideration for a man of my husband's rank and the strange frankness with which he avows that he knows where to lay hands on my son proves this to me and besides the baron calmly sets forth the two offences of which fabrizio stands accused according to his brother's vile denunciation and explains that either of these entails imprisonment is not that as good as telling us that if we prefer exile to prison we have only to choose it if you choose exile repeated the countess we shall never see the boy again fabrizio who had been present at the whole discussion with one of the marchesa's oldest friends now one of the councillors of the austrian tribunal was strongly in favour of making himself scarce and that very evening in fact he left the palace concealed in the carriage which was to convey his mother and aunt to the scala the coachman whom they did not trust betook himself as usual to a neighbouring tavern and while the footman a faithful servant held the horses fabrizio disguised as a peasant slipped out of the carriage and out of the town by the next morning he had crossed the frontier with equal success and a few hours later he was safe in a country house belonging to his mother in piedmont near novara at a place called romagnano where bayard met his death the amount of attention bestowed by the two ladies on the theatrical performance after they reached their box may be easily conceived they had only gone to the theatre to secure an opportunity of consulting several of their friends of the liberal party whose appearance at the palazzo del dongo would have stirred suspicion on the part of the police the council in the box decided on making a fresh appeal to baron binder there could be no question of offering money to the magistrate who was a perfectly upright man and besides the ladies were very poor they had obliged fabrizio to take all the money remaining over from the sale of the diamond with him nevertheless it was very important to know the baron's final word the countess's friends reminded her of a certain canon borda a very agreeable young man who had formerly tried to pay her court and had behaved in a somewhat shabby fashion to her when he found his advances were rejected he had gone to general pietranera had told him of his wife's friendship with di mercati and was forthwith turned out of the house for his pains now the canon played cards every evening with baroness binder and was naturally her husband's close friend the countess made up her mind to the horribly disagreeable step of paying a visit to the canon and the next morning early before he had gone out she appeared in his rooms when the canon's only servant pronounced the name of the countess pietranera his master was so agitated that his voice almost failed him and he made no attempt to rearrange a morning costume of the most extreme simplicity show the lady in and then go he said huskily the countess entered the room and borda cast himself on his knees before her it is in this position only that an unhappy madman like myself can dare to receive your orders said he to the countess who looked irresistibly charming in her mourning dress which was half a disguise her deep grief at the idea of fabrizio's exile and the violence she did her own feelings in appearing under the roof of a man who had once behaved like a traitor to her combined to make her eyes shine with an extraordinary light it is in this position cried the canon again that i must receive your orders for some service you must desire of me otherwise the poor dwelling of this unhappy madman would never have been honoured by your presence 
once upon a time wild with love and jealousy and seeing he had no chance of finding favour in your eyes he played a coward's part towards you the words were sincerely spoken and were all the nobler because at that moment the canon was in a position of great power the countess was touched to tears her heart had been frozen with humiliation and dread but these feelings were replaced in an instant by a tender emotion and a ray of hope from a condition of great misery she passed in the twinkling of an eye to one that was almost happiness kiss my hand she said and she held it to the canon's lips and stand up i have come to ask you to obtain mercy for my nephew fabrizio here is the truth without the smallest disguise just as it should be told to an old friend the boy who is only sixteen years and a half old has committed an unspeakable folly we were living at the castle of grianta on the lake of como one night at seven o'clock a boat from como brought us the news that the emperor had landed in the gulf of juan the next morning fabrizio started for france after having induced one of his humble friends a dealer in barometers of the name of vasi to give him his passport as he by no means looks like a dealer in barometers he had hardly travelled ten leagues through france when he was arrested his outbursts of enthusiasm expressed in very bad french were thought suspicious after some time he escaped and contrived to get to geneva we sent to meet him at lugano at geneva you mean said the canon smiling the countess finished her story everything that is humanly possible i will do for you replied the canon earnestly i place myself entirely at your orders i will even risk imprudences he added tell me what am i to do at this moment when my poor room is to be bereft of the celestial vision which marks an epoch in the history of my life you must go to baron binder you must tell him you have loved fabrizio from his babyhood that you saw the child at the time of his birth when you used to come to our house and that you beseech binder in the name of his friendship for you to set all his spies to discover whether before fabrizio departed into switzerland he ever had the shortest interview with any of the suspected liberals if the baron is at all decently served he will be convinced that this whole business has been nothing but a childish freak you know that when i lived in the palazzo dugnani i had quantities of engravings of napoleon's battles my nephew learned to read from the inscriptions on those pictures when he was only five years old my poor husband would describe the battles to him we used to put the general's helmet on the child's head and he would drag his great sword about the room well one fine day the boy hears that the man my husband worshipped the emperor is back in france like the young madcap he is he started off to join him but he did not succeed ask your baron what punishment he can possibly inflict for that one moment of folly i was forgetting something cried the canon you shall see that i am not quite unworthy of your gracious pardon here he said hunting about among the papers on his table here is the denunciation of that vile col torto hypocrite look it is signed ascanio valserra del dongo which is at the bottom of the whole business i got it yesterday in the police office and i went to the scala hoping to meet somebody who was in the habit of going to your box by whom i might send it to you the copy of this paper reached vienna long ago this is the enemy we have to fight the canon and the countess read the document together and agreed that in the course of the day he was to send her a copy by a safe hand then the countess went back rejoicing to the palazzo del dongo no one could have behaved more perfectly than this man who once behaved so ill said she to the marchesa to-night at the scala when the theatre clock strikes a quarter to eleven we will turn everybody out of our box we will shut our door and at eleven o'clock the canon will come himself and tell us what he has been able to do this plan seemed to us the one least likely to compromise him the canon was no fool he took good care not to break his appointment and having kept it he gave proofs of a thorough kind-heartedness and absolute straightforwardness rarely seen save in countries where vanity does not override every other feeling his accusation of the countess pietranera to her own husband had caused him constant remorse and he hailed the opportunity for atonement that morning when the countess left him he had said to himself bitterly now there she is in love with her nephew and his old wound was not healed otherwise proud as she is she would never have come to me 
when poor pietranera died she refused all my offers of service with horror though they were couched in the most polite terms and tr transmitted to her by colonel scotti who had been her lover to think of the beautiful pietranera living on fifteen hundred francs he added as he walked rapidly up and down his room and then settling herself at grianta with an odious secatore like the marchese del dongo but that is all explained now that young fabrizio is certainly very attractive tall well built with a face that is always gay and what's better with a sort of tender voluptuous look about him a correggio face added the canon bitterly the difference of age not too great after all fabrizio was born after the french came here about ninety-eight i think the countess may be seven or eight and twenty no woman could be prettier more delightful even in this country where there are so many lovely women she beats them all the marini the gerardi the ruga the arese the pietra grua she is better looking than any of them they were living happily together on the banks of that lovely lake of como when the young man insisted on following napoleon ah there are hearts in italy still in spite of what every one may do beloved country no he mused and his breast swelled with jealousy there is no other possible means of explaining her willingness to vegetate in the country and endure the disgusting sight every day and at every meal of the marchese del dongo's hideous countenance and the vile sallow face of the marchesino ascanio who will be much worse than his father on top of it ah well i will serve her faithfully at all events i shall have the satisfaction of seeing her nearer than through my opera glasses canon borda explained the matter very clearly to the ladies in his heart binder was disposed to do all he could for them he was heartily glad that fabrizio had taken himself off before definite orders had arrived from vienna for baron binder could decide nothing himself on this matter as on every other he was obliged to wait for orders every day he sent an exact copy of all his information to vienna and awaited the imperial reply during his exile at romagnano fabrizio was to be sure in the first place to go to mass every day to choose some intelligent man devoted to the cause of monarchy as his confessor and in confession to be careful to confide none but the most irreproachable sentiments to his ear secondly he was not to consort with any man who had the reputation of being clever and when occasion offered he was to speak of rebellion with horror as a thing that should never be permitted thirdly he was never to be seen in a cafe he was never to read any newspaper except the turin and milan official gazettes he was to express dislike of reading in general and he was never to peruse any work printed later than seventeen twenty the only possible exception being sir walter scott's novels and lastly said the canon with just a touch of spite he must not fail to pay open court to some pretty woman in the district one of noble birth of course that will prove he has none of the gloomy and discontented spirit of the juvenile conspirator before going to bed that night the countess and the marchesa wrote fabrizio two voluminous letters which explained with an anxiety that was most endearing all the advice imparted by the canon fabrizio had not the slightest wish to conspire he loved napoleon believed himself destined as a nobleman to be more fortunate than most men and despised the whole middle class since he had left college he had never opened a book and while there he had only read books arranged by the jesuits he took up his residence at some distance from romagnano in a magnificent palace which had been one of the masterpieces of the famous architect san michele but it had been left untenanted for thirty years so that the rain came through all the ceilings and there was not a window that would shut he took possession of the agent's horses and rode them all day long just as it suited him he never opened his lips and thought a great deal the suggestion that he should take a mistress in some ultra family tickled his fancy and he obeyed it to the letter he chose for his confessor a young and intriguing priest who aimed at becoming a bishop like the confessor of the spielberg footnote in andriana's curious memoirs which are as amusing as a fairy tale and should be as immortal as the works of tacitus end of the footnote but he travelled three leagues on foot and wrapped himself in what he believed to be impenetrable mystery so as to read the constitutionnel which he thought sublime 
as fine as alfieri and dante he would often exclaim fabrizio resembled young frenchmen in this particular that he thought much more about his horse and his newspaper than about his high-born mistress but there was no room as yet for any imitation of others in that simple and steadfast soul and he made no friends in the society to be found in the town of romagnano his simplicity was taken for pride nobody could understand his nature a younger son who is discontented because he is not the eldest said the parish priest end of chapter five chapter six of the chartreuse of parma by stendhal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot o r g chapter six we will honestly admit that the canon's jealousy was not utterly unfounded when fabrizio returned from france he appeared in countess pietronera's eyes as a handsome stranger with whom she had once been intimately acquainted if he had made love to her she would have fallen in love with him and the admiration she already nursed for both his person and his acts was passionate and i might almost say unbounded but fabrizio kissed her with so much innocent gratitude and simple affection that she herself would have been horrified at the idea of seeking any other feeling in a regard that was almost filial after all said the countess to herself some few old friends who knew me six years ago at the viceroy's court may still consider me pretty and even young but to this boy i am a respectable woman and frankly without any regard for my vanity a middle-aged woman too the countess laboured under a certain illusion regard to her time of life but it was not the illusion of the ordinary woman besides she added at fabrizio's age a man is inclined to exaggerate the effect produced by the ravages of time now an older man than he the countess who had been walking up and down her drawing-room paused before a mirror and smiled my readers must be informed that for several months past serious siege had been laid to gina pietronera's heart and that by a man quite out of the ordinary category a short time after fabrizio's departure for france the countess who though she did not quite acknowledge it to herself was already very much interested in him had fallen into a condition of the deepest melancholy all her former occupations seemed to have lost their attraction and if i may so describe it their flavour she told herself that napoleon in his desire to win the affections of the italian people would certainly take fabrizio for his aide-de-camp he's lost to me she exclaimed weeping i shall never see him again he will write to me but what can i be to him ten years hence while she was in this frame of mind she made a trip to milan in the hope of obtaining more direct news of napoleon and possibly further news of fabrizio though she did not admit it her eager soul was growing very weary of the monotony of her country life i do not live there she said to herself i only keep myself from dying she shuddered at the thought of the powdered heads she must behold every day her brother her nephew ascanio and their serving men what would her trips on the lake be without fabrizio the affection that bound her to the marchesa was her only consolation but for some time past her intimacy with fabrizio's mother who was older than herself and had no future outlook had brought her less satisfaction such was the countess pietronera's peculiar position now that fabrizio was gone she expected but little future happiness and she hungered for consolation and for novelty when she reached milan she developed a passionate fondness for the opera then in fashion she shut herself up alone for long hours at a stretch in her old friend's general scotti's box at the scala the men whose acquaintance she sought in the hope of obtaining news of napoleon and his army struck her as coarse and vulgar when she came home at night she would extemporize on her piano till three o'clock in the morning one evening she went to the scala and was sitting in a box belonging to one of her lady friends whither she had gone to try and gather news from france 
the minister of parma count mosca was presented to her he was an agreeable man who spoke of france and of napoleon in a manner which made her heart thrill afresh with hope and fear the following day she returned to the same box the clever statesman returned also and during the whole of the performance she talked to him and found pleasure in the conversation never since fabrizio's departure had she thought an evening so enjoyable the man who thus diverted her thoughts count mosca della rovere sorizana was then minister of war of police and of finance to ernest the fourth that famous prince of parma so celebrated for his severity which milanese liberals termed cruelty mosca might have been forty or forty-five years of age he was a large-featured man without a vestige of self-importance and a simple cheery manner which prepossessed people in his favour he would have been very good-looking if his master's whim had not obliged him to powder his hair as an earnest of the propriety of his political views in italy where the fear of wounding the vanity of others is little felt people soon fall into intimacy and proceed to make personal remarks the corrective for this habit consists in not meeting again if feelings happen to be hurt tell me count said countess pietranera on the third occasion of their meeting why do you wear powder powder on a man like you delightful still young and who fought with us in spain because i brought no booty away with me from spain after all a man must live i was mad for glory one word of praise from gouvion saint cyr the french general who commanded us was all i cared for in those days when napoleon fell i discovered that while i had been spending all my fortune in his service my father who had a lively imagination and dreamed of seeing me a general had been building me a palace at parma and in eighteen thirteen i discovered that the whole of my worldly wealth consisted of a big unfinished palace and a pension a pension three thousand five hundred francs i suppose like my poor husband's count pietranera was a full general my poor major's pension was never more than eight hundred francs and until i became minister of finance i was never paid even that as the only other occupant of the box was its owner a lady of exceedingly liberal opinions the conversation was continued in the same strain of intimacy in answer to the countess's questions count mosca spoke of his life at parma in spain under general saint cyr i braved volleys of musketry fire for the sake of the cross of honour and afterward to win a little glory now i dress myself up like a character in a comedy to secure a great establishment and a certain number of thousand francs when i played my first moves in this game of chess the insolence of my superiors nettled me and i resolved to reach one of the highest places i have gained my object but my happiest days are always those i am able to spend now and then at milan here as it seems to me the heart of the old army of italy still throbs the frankness and disinvoltura with which the minister referred to so greatly dreaded a prince piqued the countess's curiosity she had expected to meet a self-important pedant instead of that she found a man who seemed rather ashamed of his solemn position mosca had promised to keep her informed of all the news from france he could collect this was a great indiscretion for anyone living at milan the month before waterloo at that moment the fate of italy hung in the balance and every one in milan was in a fever of hope or fear in the midst of the universal agitation the countess made inquiries concerning the man who spoke thus lightly of a position so universally envied and one which was his own sole subsistence she learned things that were curious whimsical and interesting count mosca della rovere sorizana she was told is on the point of becoming the prime minister and acknowledged favourite of ernest the fourth absolute ruler of the state of parma and one of the richest princes in europe into the bargain the count could already have attained this supreme position if he would only have assumed a more serious demeanour the prince it is said has frequently remonstrated with him on this point how can my ways matter to your highness he answers boldly so long as i transact your business the favourite's good fortune continued her informant is not without its thorns he has to please a sovereign who though certainly a man of sense and cleverness appears to have lost his head since the day he ascended to an absolute throne and who for instance nurses suspicions really unworthy even of a woman 
Ernest the Fourth's bravery is limited to that he has displayed in war. Twenty times over, and in the most gallant fashion, he has led a column to the attack. But since his father, Ernest the Third, has died, and he himself has taken up his residence within his dominions, where, unluckily for himself, he enjoys unlimited power, he has begun to hold forth in the wildest way against liberals and liberty. He soon took it into his head that his subjects hated him, and at last, in a fit of temper, and egged on by a wretch by the name of Rassi, a sort of minister of justice, he caused two liberals, whose guilt was probably of the slightest, to be hanged. Since that fatal moment the sovereign's whole life seems changed, and he is harried by the most extraordinary suspicions. He is not yet fifty, but terror has so degraded him, if one may so describe it, that when he begins to talk about the Jacobins and the plans of their central committee in Paris, his face grows like that of a man of ninety, and he falls back into all the fanciful terrors of babyhood. His favorite, Rassi, the head of his judicial department, or chief justice, has no influence except through his master's terrors. As soon as he begins to tremble for his own credit, he instantly discovers some fresh conspiracy of the blackest and most fanciful description. If thirty imprudent souls meet to read a number of the Constitutionnel, Rassi declares they are conspiring and sends them as prisoners to that famous citadel of Parma, which is the terror of the whole of Lombardy. As this citadel is very high, 180 feet, they say, it is seen from an immense distance all over the huge plain, and the outline of the prison, about which horrible stories are told, frowns like a merciless sovereign over the whole tract of country from Milan to Bologna. Would you believe it, said another traveller to the countess, at night Ernest the Fourth sits shivering with terror in his room on the third story of his palace, where he is guarded by eighty sentries who shout a whole sentence instead of a password every quarter of an hour with ten bolts shot on each of his doors and the rooms above and below his apartments filled with soldiers he is still terrified of the jacobins if a board in the floor creaks he snatches at his pistols and is convinced a liberal must be hidden underneath his bed instantly every bell in the castle begins to ring and an aide-de-camp hurries off to wake count mosca when the minister of police reaches the castle he knows better than to deny the existence of the conspiracy Armed to the teeth, he and the prince go alone round every corner of the apartments, look under all the beds, and, in a word, perform a number of ridiculous antics worthy of an old woman. In those happy days, when the prince was a soldier and had never killed a man except in war, all these precautions would have struck him as exceedingly degrading. Being an exceedingly intelligent and clever man, he is really ashamed of them. Even at the moment of taking them, they appear ridiculous to him and the secret of Count Mosca's immense credit is that he applies all his skill to prevent the prince from ever feeling ashamed in his presence. It is he, Mosca, who, as minister of police, insists on search being made under every bit of furniture, and, as people at Parma declare, even in musical instrument cases. It is the prince who objects and jokes his minister on his extreme punctiliousness. This is a matter of honour to me, Mosca replies. Think of the satirical sonnets the Jacobins would rain down upon us if we let them kill you. We have to defend not only your life, but our own reputation. Still, the prince appears to be only half taken in by it all, for if anyone in the town ventures to say there has been a sleepless night in the castle, Rassi forthwith sends the unseasonable joker to the citadel, and once the prisoner is shut up in that high and airy dwelling, it is only by a miracle that anyone recollects his existence. It is because Mosca is a soldier who, during the Spanish campaign, saved his own life twenty times over, pistol in hand and surrounded by pitfalls, that the prince prefers him to Rassi, who is far more pliable and cringing. The unhappy prisoners in the citadel are kept in the most strict and solitary confinement. All sorts of stories are current about them. The liberals declare that Rassi has invented a plan whereby the jailers and confessors are ordered to convince them that almost every month one of them is led out to execution. On that day they are allowed to mount onto the terrace of the huge tower, 180 feet high, and thence they see a departing procession, in which a spy represents the poor wretch supposed to be going out to meet his fate. These tales, and a score more of the same nature, and not less authentic, interested the countess deeply. The day after hearing them she questioned the count and jested at his answers. 
she thought him most entertaining and kept assuring him that he certainly was a monster though he might be unconscious of the fact one day as the count was going home to his inn he said to himself not only is the countess pietranera a charming woman but when i spend the evening in her box i contrive to forget certain things at parma the memory of which stabs me to the heart this minister in spite of his lively air and brilliant manners had not the soul of a frenchman he did not know how to forget his sorrows when there was a thorn in his pillow he was forced to break it and wear it down by thrusting it into his own throbbing limbs i must apologize for introducing this sentence translated from the italian the morning following on his discovery the count became aware that in spite of the business which had called him to milan the day was extraordinarily long he could not stay quiet anywhere and tired his carriage horses out toward six o'clock he rode out to the corso he had hoped he might have met the countess pietranera there he could not see her and recollected that the scala opened at eight o'clock thither he betook himself and did not find more than ten persons in the whole of the great building he felt quite shy at being there can it be he mused that at five-and-forty i am committing follies for which a subaltern officer would blush luckily nobody suspects it he fled and tried to pass away the time by walking about the pretty streets in the neighbourhood of the scala they are full of cafes which at that hour are teeming with customers in front of each a crowd of idlers sits on chairs spreading right out onto the street eating ices and criticizing the passers-by the count was a passer-by of considerable notoriety and he had the pleasure of being recognized and accosted three or four importunate individuals of that class which it is not easy to shake off seized this opportunity of obtaining an audience from the powerful minister two of them thrust petitions into his hands a third contented himself with giving him long-winded advice as to his political conduct so clever a man as i am must not go to sleep and a person so powerful as i should not walk in the streets he reflected he went back to the theatre and it occurred to him to take a box on the third tier thence he could gaze unnoticed right into the box on the second tier in which he hoped to see the countess appear two full hours of waiting did not seem too long to this man who was in love safely screened from his observation he gave himself up to the enjoyment of his passionate dream what is old age he said to himself surely above all other things it means that the capacity for this exquisite foolery is lost at last the countess made her appearance through his opera glasses he watched her adoringly young brilliant blithe as a bird he said she does not look five-and-twenty her beauty is the least of her charms where else could i discover a creature of such perfect sincerity one whose actions are never governed by prudence who gives herself up bodily to the feelings of the moment and asks nothing better than to be whirled off by some fresh object i can understand all count nani's wild behaviour the count gave himself excellent reasons for his extravagant feelings so long as he only thought of attaining the happiness he saw before his eyes but his arguments were not so cogent when he began to consider his own age and the anxieties some of them gloomy enough which clouded his existence a clever man whose terrors override his intelligence gives me a great position and large sums of money for acting as his minister but supposing he were to dismiss me to-morrow i should be nothing but an elderly and needy man in other words just the sort of man that every one is inclined to despise a nice sort of individual to offer to the countess these thoughts were too dreary and he turned his eyes once more upon the object of his affections he was never tired of gazing at her and he refrained from going to her box so that he might contemplate her more undisturbedly i have just been told he mused that she only encouraged nani to play a trick on Linercati, who would not take the trouble to run her husband's murderer through or have him stabbed by somebody else i would fight twenty duels for her he murmured in a passion of adoration he kept continually glancing at the scala clock with its luminous figures standing out on a black ground which as each five minutes passed warned the spectators that the hour of their admission into some fair friend's box had duly arrived the count ruminated again i have only known her such a short time that i dare not spend more than half an hour in her box 
if i stay longer than that i shall attract attention and then thanks to my age and still more to the cursed powder in my hair i shall look as foolish as a pantaloon but a sudden thought forced him to a decision supposing she were to leave her box to pay a visit to another i should be well punished for the stinginess with which i had meted out my pleasure to myself he rose to his feet meaning to go down to the box in which the countess was sitting suddenly he felt that his desire to enter it had almost entirely disappeared now this really is delightful he exclaimed and he stopped on the staircase to laugh at himself i am positively frightened such a thing hasn't happened to me for five-and-twenty years he had almost to make a conscious effort to go into the box and like a clever man he took advantage of the circumstance he made no attempt whatever to appear at his ease or to show off his wit by plunging headlong into some joking conversation he had the courage to be shy and applied his mind to letting his agitation betray itself without rendering him ridiculous if she takes it amiss said he to himself i am done forever what shyness in a man with powdered hair hair which would be grey if the powder did not cover it but it is the truth therefore it cannot be ridiculous unless i exaggerate it or wave it like a trophy before her eyes the countess had so often been bored at the castle of grianta among the powdered heads of her brother her nephew and some tiresome neighbours of the right way of thinking that she never gave a thought to the fashion in which her new adorer dressed his hair her good sense then saved her from bursting out laughing when he entered and her whole attention was absorbed by the french news which mosca always confided to her particular ear when he entered her box some of this news no doubt he invented as she talked it over with him that evening she noticed his glance which was open and kindly i fancy she said that when you are at parma surrounded by your slaves you do not look at them in so kindly a manner that would spoil everything and give them some hope of not being hanged the total absence of pretension on the part of a man who bore the reputation of being the foremost diplomatist in italy struck the countess as peculiar and even endowed him with a certain charm in her eyes on the whole and considering how well and brilliantly he talked she was not at all displeased that he should have taken it into his head to play the part of her attentive swain for this one evening and with no serious ulterior intentions a great point had been gained and a very risky one fortunately for the minister who at parma never saw his advances rejected the countess had only just returned from grianta and her mind was still numb with the dullness of her rural life she had forgotten so to speak how to be merry and everything connected with the elegancies and frivolities of life wore an appearance of novelty which almost made them sacred in her eyes she had no inclination to laugh at anything not even at a shy man of five-and-forty who had fallen in love with her a week later the count's boldness might have met with a quite different reception as a rule no visit paid to a box in the scala lasts more than twenty minutes the count spent the whole evening in that in which he had been so happy as to find the countess pietranera this woman said he to himself brings me back to all the follies of my youth yet he felt the danger of his position will she forgive my folly for the sake of my reputation as an all-powerful pasha at a place forty leagues off how tiresome that life of mine at parma is nevertheless as each quarter struck he vowed to himself he would depart you must consider signora he said laughingly to the countess that i am bored to death at parma and that therefore i must be allowed to drink deep draughts of pleasure whenever pleasure lies in my path thus for this one evening and without making any ulterior claim on your kindness give me leave to pay my court to you in a few days alas i shall be far from this box where i forget all my sorrows and you will say perhaps all the proprieties a week after that lengthy visit to the box at the scala which had been followed by various little incidents too numerous to relate here count mosca was madly in love and the countess was beginning to think that his age need be no objection if he pleased her in other respects matters had reached this point when mosca was recalled by a courier from parma it was as though his prince had grown frightened at being left alone the countess went back to grianta that beautiful spot no longer idealized now by her imagination seemed to her a desert 
have i really grown fond of this man said she to herself mosca wrote and found himself at a loss separation had dried up the springs of his ideas his letters were amusing and there was a quaintness connected with them which did not fail to please so as to avoid the remarks of the marchese del dongo who was not fond of paying for the delivery of letters these were sent by messengers who posted them at como lecco varese and other pretty little towns in the near neighbourhood of the lake one object of this manoeuvre was that the couriers might bring back answers it was successfully attained before long the countess began to watch for the days when the post arrived the couriers brought her flowers fruit little presents of no value but which entertained her and her sister-in-law as well her memory of the count began to be mingled with thoughts of his great power and the countess grew curious about everything that was said concerning him even the liberals paid homage to his talents the chief ground of the count's evil reputation rested on the fact that he was considered the head of the ultra party at the court of parma where the liberal party was led by an intriguing woman capable of anything even of success and very rich into the bargain the marchesa raversi the prince was very careful not to discourage whichever of the two parties was not in power he knew well enough that he would always be master even with a ministry chosen out of the marchesa raversi's circle numerous details of these intrigues were related at grianta mosca whom all the world described as a minister of first-rate talent and a man of action was not present and therefore the countess was free to forget the hair powder which in her eyes symbolized everything that is most slow and dreary that after all was an infinitesimal detail one of the obligations imposed by the court at which he otherwise played so noble a part the court is an absurd thing said the countess to the marchesa but it's amusing it's an interesting game but it must be played according to the rules did anybody ever think of rebelling against the rules of piquet yet once one has grown accustomed to them there is great enjoyment in beating one's adversary the countess gave many a thought to the writer of all those pleasant letters the days on which she received them were bright days to her she would call for her boat and go and read them at the most beautiful spots on the lake at pliniana at bellano or in the wood of the sfondrata these letters seemed to bring her some consolation for fabrizio's absence at any rate she could not deny the count the right to be desperately in love with her and before the month was out she was thinking of him with a very tender affection count mosca on his part was very nearly in earnest when he offered to send in his resignation leave the ministry and spend his life with her at milan or elsewhere i have four hundred thousand francs he said that would always give us fifteen thousand francs a year an opera box and horses again reflected the countess the dream was a tempting one the charms of the sublime scenery round como appealed to her afresh on the shores of the lake she dreamed again over the strange and brilliant existence which contrary to all appearances was opening once more before her she saw herself in milan on the corso happy and gay as she had been in the days of the viceroy my youth would come back to me my life would be full at all events her ardent imagination sometimes deceived her but she had never laboured under those voluntary illusions which are the result of cowardice above all things she was perfectly straightforward with herself if i am a little beyond the age for committing follies envy which can deceive as well as love may poison the happiness of my life at milan after my husband's death my proud poverty and my refusal of two great fortunes were admired this poor little count of mine has not a twentieth part of the wealth those two simpletons limercati and nani laid at my feet the tiny widow's pension obtained with so much difficulty the sending away of my servants the little room on the fifth story which brought twenty coaches to the door of the house all that was curious and interesting at the time but i shall have some disagreeable moments however cleverly i may manage if with no more private fortune than my widow's pension i go back to milan and live there in the modest middle-class comfort which the fifteen thousand francs a year that will remain to mosca after his resignation will ensure us one curious objection which will become a terrible weapon in the hands of the envious is that though the count has been separated from his wife for years he is married 
at parma everybody is aware of this but at milan it will be news and it will be ascribed to me therefore farewell my beautiful scala my heavenly lake of como fare thee well in spite of all her forebodings if the countess had had the smallest fortune of her own she would have accepted mosca's offer to resign she believed herself to be growing old and the idea of a court alarmed her but the fact which on this side of the alps will appear incredible to the last degree is that the count would have given in his resignation most joyfully at least he contrived to convince his friend that it was so every letter of his besought her with ever-growing eagerness to grant him another interview at milan she did so if i were to swear that i loved you madly she said to him i should lie to you i should be only too happy if now that i am past thirty i could love as i loved at two-and-twenty but too many things which i believed eternal have faded from my sight i have the most tender affection for you i feel the most unbounded confidence in you and i prefer you to every other man i know she believed herself perfectly sincere but the close of this declaration was not absolutely truthful it may be that if fabrizio had chosen he might have swept everything else out of her heart but fabrizio in count mosca's eyes was no more than a child the minister arrived in milan three days after the young madcap had departed for novara and lost no time in speaking to baron binder in his favour the count's opinion was that there was no chance of saving the youth from banishment he had not come to milan alone in his carriage had travelled the duke san severina taxis a nice-looking little old man of sixty-eight grey-haired polished well-groomed immensely rich but of inadequate birth his grandfather had amassed millions of money by farming the revenues of the state of parma his father had induced the then reigning prince to appoint him his ambassador at a certain court by means of the following argument your highness allows your envoy at the court of so-and-so thirty thousand francs a year and he cuts a very poor figure on the money if your highness will appoint me i will be content with a salary of six thousand francs i will never spend less than a hundred thousand francs a year on my embassy and my man of business shall pay twenty thousand francs a year to the department of foreign affairs at parma this sum will be the salary of any secretary of my embassy selected by the government i shall show no jealousy about being informed as to diplomatic secrets if any such exist my object is to shed honour on my family which is still a new one and to increase its dignity by holding a great official position the present duke son of the ambassador had been clumsy enough to betray some liberal tendencies and for the last two years he had been in a state of despair he had lost two or three millions in napoleon's time by his obstinate insistence on remaining abroad and notwithstanding this he had failed since the sovereigns had been re-established in europe to obtain a certain great order which figured in his father's portrait the absence of this order was wasting him away with sorrow so complete is the intimacy which in italy results on love that personal vanity could be no stumbling block between the two friends it was therefore with the most perfect simplicity that mosca said to the woman he worshipped i have two or three plans to suggest to you all of them fairly well laid i have dreamed of nothing else for the last three months first i can resign and we will live quietly at milan florence naples or where you will we have fifteen thousand francs a year independently of the prince's bounty to us which will last for a time at all events second if you will condescend to come to the country where i have some power you will buy a country place let us say sacca for instance a charming house in the forest overlooking the po you can have the contract of sale duly signed within a week the prince will give you a position at his court but here a great difficulty comes in you would be well received at court nobody would venture to hesitate as to that in my presence and besides the princess thinks she is unfortunate and i have just rendered her several services with an eye to your benefit but there is one capital objection of which i must remind you the prince is exceedingly religious and as you know i am unluckily a married man this would give rise to innumerable small difficulties you are a widow and that charming title must be exchanged for another here my third proposal comes in it would be easy enough to find a husband who would give us no trouble 
but above all things we must have a man of considerable age for why should you refuse me the hope of taking his place some day well i have arranged this curious business with the duke san severina taxis who is quite ignorant of course of the name of his future duchess all he knows about her is that she will make him an ambassador and will procure him the order his father held and without which he himself is the most unhappy of men apart from that mania the duke is by no means a fool he gets his coats and wigs from paris he is not at all the kind of man who deliberately plots wickedness he honestly believes that his honour is involved in wearing that particular order and he is ashamed of his money a year ago he came and proposed to me to build a hospital so as to get his order i laughed at him but he did not laugh at me when i proposed this marriage my first condition of course was that he was never to set his foot in parma again but do you know that the suggestion you make to me is exceedingly immoral said the countess not more immoral than everything else at our court and at twenty others there's one convenience about absolute power that it sanctifies everything in the eyes of the people now where is the importance of an absurdity that nobody notices our policy for the next twenty years will consist in being afraid of the jacobins and what a terror it will be every year we shall believe ourselves on the brink of another ninety-three some day i hope you will hear the remarks i make on that subject at my receptions they are really fine everything which may tend to diminish this terror however little will be superlatively moral in the eyes of the nobles and the bigots now at parma everyone who is not either noble or a bigot is in prison or on the road thither you may be quite sure that till the day i am disgraced no one will think this marriage the least extraordinary the arrangement involves no dishonesty to anyone and that i imagine is the great point the prince whose favour is our stock in trade has only imposed one condition to ensure his consent that the future duchess should be of noble birth last year as far as i can reckon my post brought me in a hundred and seven thousand francs and my whole income must have been a hundred and twenty two thousand i have invested a sum of twenty thousand francs at lyon now you must choose between a life of splendor with a hundred and twenty two thousand francs a year to spend which in parma would be as much as four hundred thousand in milan but in this case you must accept the marriage which will give you the name of a very decent man whom you will never see except at the altar or a modest existence on fifteen thousand francs a year at florence or naples for i agree with you you have been too much admired at milan we should be tormented by envy there and it might end by making us unhappy the life at parma would i hope have some charm of novelty even for you who have seen the court of prince eugene it would be worth your while to make acquaintance with it before we close that door do not think i desire to influence your decision as far as i am concerned my choice is made i would rather live with you on a fourth floor than continue alone in my great position the possibility of this strange marriage was discussed daily between the lovers the countess saw the duke at a ball at the scala and thought him very presentable in one of their last conversations mosca thus summed up the matter we must take some decisive step if we want to spend our lives happily and not to grow old before our time the prince has given his approbation he owns the finest palace in parma and a huge fortune he is sixty-eight years old and is madly in love with the collar of an order but there is one great blot upon his life he bought a bust of napoleon by canova for ten thousand francs his second misdoing which will be the death of him if you do not come to his rescue is that he once lent twenty-five napoleons to ferrante palla a madman from our country but a man of genius all the same whom we have since condemned to death by default i am happy to say this ferrante once wrote two hundred lines of poetry which are quite unrivalled i will recite them to you they are as fine as dante the prince will send san severina to the court of so-and-so he will marry you the day he starts and in the second year of his journey which he calls an embassy he will receive the collar of the order for which he sighs in him you will find a brother whom you will not dislike he is ready to sign every document i give him beforehand and besides you will see him hardly ever or never just as you choose he will be glad not to show himself in parma where the memory of his grandfather the farmer-general 
and his own imputed liberalism make him feel uncomfortable rassi our persecutor declares that the duke subscribed secretly to the constitutionnel though ferrante the poet nah. rassi our persecutor declares that the duke subscribed secretly to the constitutionnel through ferrante the poet and for a long time this calumny was a serious obstacle in the way of the prince's consent why should the historian be blamed for faithfully reproducing the smallest details of the story he has heard is it his fault if certain persons led away by a passion which he unfortunately for himself does not share stoop to actions of the deepest immorality it is true indeed that this sort of thing is no longer done in a country where the only passion that which has survived all others is the love of money which is the food of vanity three months after the events above related the duchess san severina taxis was astonishing the court of parma by her easy charm and the noble serenity of her intellect her house was beyond all comparison the most agreeable in the city this fulfilled the promise made by count mosca to his master the reigning prince ranuzio ernest the fourth and the princess his wife to whom the duchess was presented by two of the greatest ladies in the country received her with the utmost respect she had been curious to see the prince the arbiter of the late she had been curious to see the prince the arbiter of the fate of the man she loved she desired to please him and succeeded only too well she beheld a man of tall and somewhat heavy build his hair moustaches and huge whiskers were of what his courtiers called a beautiful golden colour elsewhere their dull tinge would have earned the unflattering title of toe from the middle of a large face there projected very slightly a tiny almost feminine nose but the duchess remarked that to realise all these various uglinesses a close examination of the royal features was necessary taking him altogether the prince had the appearance of a clever and resolute man his air and manner were not devoid of majesty but very often he took it into his head to try and impress the person to whom he was speaking then he grew confused himself and rocked almost perpetually from one leg to the other apart from this ernest the fourth's glance was penetrating and authoritative there was something noble about the gesture of his arm and his speech was both measured and concise mosca had warned the duchess that the prince's audience chamber contained a full-length portrait of louis the fourteenth and a very fine florentine scagliola table the imitation struck her very much it was evident that the prince sought to reproduce the noble look and utterance of louis the fourteenth and he leaned against the scagliola table so as to make himself look like joseph the second immediately after his first words to the duchess he seated himself so as to give her an opportunity of making use of the tabouret which her rank conferred on her at this court the only ladies who have a right to sit are duchesses princesses and wives of spanish grandees the rest all wait until the prince or princess invites them to be seated and these august persons are always careful to mark the degree of rank by allowing a short interval to elapse before giving this permission to a lady of less rank than a duchess the duchess thought the prince's imitation of louis the fourteenth was occasionally somewhat too marked as for instance when he threw back his head and smiled good-naturedly ernest the fourth wore a dress coat of the fashion then reigning in paris every month he received from that city which he abhorred a dress coat a walking coat and a hat but on the day of the duchess's visit he had attired himself with a whimsical mixture of styles in red pantaloons silk stockings and very high shoes such as may be observed in the pictures of joseph the second he received the lady graciously and said several sharp and witty things to her but she saw very clearly that civil as her reception was there was no excessive warmth about it and do you know why said count mosca when she returned from her audience it is because milan is a larger and finer city than parma he was afraid that if he received you as i expected and as he had given me reason to hope you would take him for a provincial person in ecstasies over the charms of a fine lady just arrived from the capital doubtless too he is vexed by a peculiarity which i hardly dare express to you 
the prince sees no lady at his court who can compete with you in beauty last night when he was going to bed that was the sole object of his conversation with pernice his chief valet who is a friend of mine i foresee a small revolution in matters of etiquette my greatest enemy at this court is a blockhead who goes by the name of general fabio conti you must imagine an extraordinary creature who has spent one full day of his whole life perhaps on active service and who therefore gives himself the airs of a frederick the great and further because he is the head of the liberal party here god alone knows how liberal they are endeavours to reproduce the noble affability of general lafayette i know fabio conti said the duchess i had a glimpse of him at como he was quarrelling with the gendarmes she related the little incident which my readers may possibly recollect some of these days madam if your intellect ever contrives to probe the depths of our etiquette you will become aware that no young lady is presented at this court till after her marriage well so fervent is our prince's patriotic conviction of the superiority of his own city of parma over every other that i am ready to wager anything he will find means to have young clelia conti our lafayette's daughter presented to him she is a charming creature on my honour and only a week ago was supposed to be the loveliest person in the prince's dominions i do not know the count went on whether the horrible stories put about by our sovereign's enemies have travelled as far as grianta he is described as a monster and an ogre as a matter of fact ernest the fourth is full of good commonplace virtues and it might be added that if he had been as invulnerable as achilles he would have continued to be a model potentate but in a fit of boredom and bad temper and a little too for the sake of imitating louis the fourteenth who found some hero of the fronde living quietly and insolently in a country house close to versailles fifty years after the close of that rebellion and forthwith cut off his head ernest the fourth had two liberals hanged these impudent fellows were in the habit it appears of meeting on certain days to speak evil of the prince and earnestly implore heaven to send a plague on parma and so deliver them from the tyrant the use of the word tyrant was absolutely proved rassi declared this was a conspiracy he had them sentenced to death and the execution of one of them count l was a horrible business all this happened before my time ever since that fatal moment continued the count dropping his voice the prince has been subject to fits of terror which are unworthy of any man but which are the sole and only source of the favour i enjoy if it were not for the sovereign's alarms my particular style of excellence would be too rough and rugged to suit this court where stupidity reigns supreme will you believe that the prince looks under every bed in his apartments before he gets into his own and spends a million yearly which at parma is what four millions would be at milan to ensure himself a good police force the head of that terrible police force madam now stands before you through the police that is to say through the prince's terrors i have become minister of war and of finance and as the minister of the interior is my nominal chief insomuch as the police falls within his department i have caused that portfolio to be bestowed on count zurla contarini an idiot who delights in work and is never so happy as when he can write eighty letters in a day this very morning i have received one on which the count has had the pleasure of writing number twenty thousand seven hundred and fifteen with his own hand the duchess san severina was presented to the melancholy-looking princess of parma clara paolina who because her husband had a mistress the marchesa balbi a rather pretty woman thought herself the unhappiest and had thus become the most tiresome woman perhaps in the universe the duchess found herself in the presence of a very tall and thin woman who had not reached the age of six-and-thirty and who looked fifty her face with its noble and regular features might have been thought beautiful in spite of a pair of large round eyes out of which she could hardly see if the princess had not grown so utterly careless of her personal appearance she received the duchess with such evident shyness that certain of the courtiers who hated count mosca ventured to remark that the sovereign looked like the woman who was being presented and the duchess like the sovereign who received her the duchess surprised and almost put out of countenance did not know what terms she should employ to indicate the inferiority of her own position 
to that which the princess chose to take up the only thing she could devise to restore some composure to the poor princess who was really not lacking in intelligence was to begin and carry on a long dissertation on the subject of botany the princess really knew a great deal about the subject she had very fine hothouses filled with tropical plants the duchess while simply attempting to get out of her own difficulty made a lasting conquest of the princess clara paulina who timid and nervous as she had been at the opening of the audience was so perfectly at her ease before its close that contrary to every rule of etiquette this first reception lasted no less than an hour and a quarter the very next day the duchess purchased quantities of exotic plants and gave herself out as a great lover of botany the princess spent all her time with the venerable father landriani archbishop of parma a learned and even a witty man and a perfectly well-mannered man into the bargain but it was a curious sight to see him enthroned in the crimson velvet chair which he occupied by virtue of his office opposite the armchair in which the princess sat surrounded by her ladies of honour and her two ladies in waiting the aged prelate with his long white hair was even more shy if that were possible than the princess they met every day of their lives and every audience began with a full quarter of an hour of silence to such a point indeed that one of the ladies in waiting the countess alvisi had become a sort of favourite because she possessed the knack of encouraging them to open their lips and making them break the stillness to wind up her presentations the duchess was received by the hereditary prince who was taller than his father and even shyer than his mother he was sixteen years old and an authority on mineralogy when the duchess appeared he blushed scarlet and was so put out that he was quite unable to invent anything to say to the fair lady he was very good-looking and spent his whole life in the woods with a hammer in his hand when the duchess rose to her feet to bring the silent audience to a close heavens madam he cried how beautiful you are and the lady who had been presented to him did not think the remark altogether ill-chosen the marchesa balbi a young woman of five-and-twenty might some two or three years before the arrival of the duchess in parma have been quoted as a most perfect type of italian beauty she still had the loveliest eyes in the world and the most graceful little gestures but close observation showed her skin to be covered with innumerable tiny wrinkles which made her into a young-looking old woman seen from a distance in her box at the theatre for instance she was still beautiful and the good people in the pit thought the prince showed very good taste he spent all the evenings in the marchesa balbi's house but frequently without opening his lips and her consciousness that the prince was bored had worried the poor woman into a condition of extraordinary thinness she gave herself airs of excessive cleverness and was always smiling archly she had the most beautiful teeth in the world and in season and out she endeavoured to smile people into the belief that she meant something different from what she was saying count mosca declared it was this perpetual smile while she was yawning in her heart which had given her so many wrinkles the balbi had her finger in every business and the state could not conclude a bargain of a thousand francs without a remembrance so it was politely termed at parma for the marchesa according to public report she had invested six millions of francs in england but her fortune which was certainly a thing of recent growth did not really exceed one million five hundred thousand francs it was to protect himself from her cunning and to keep her dependent on him that mosca had made himself minister of finance the marchesa's sole passion was fear disguised in the shape of sordid avarice i shall die destitute she would sometimes say to the prince who was furious at the very idea the duchess remarked that the splendid gilded antechamber of the balbi's palace was lighted by a solitary candle which was guttering down on to a precious marble table and her drawing-room doors were blackened by the servant's fingers she received me said the duchess to her friend as if she expected me to give her a gratuity of fifty francs the tide of these successes was somewhat checked by the reception of the duchess received at the hands of the cleverest woman at the court of parma the celebrated marchesa raversi a consummate intrigante who led the party opposed to count mosca 
she was bent on his overthrow and had been so more especially during the last few months for she was the duke san severina's niece and was afraid the charms of the new duchess might diminish her own share of his inheritance the raversi is by no means a woman to be overlooked said the count to his friend so great is my opinion of her capacity that i separated from my wife simply and solely because she insisted on taking one of the marchesa's friends the cavaliere bentivoglio as her lover the marchesa raversi a tall masterful woman with very black hair remarkable for the diamonds which she wore even in the daytime and for the rouge with which she covered her face had declared her enmity to the duchess beforehand and was careful to begin hostile operations as soon as she beheld her san severina's letters betrayed so much satisfaction with his embassy and especially such delight in his hope of obtaining his much coveted order that his family feared he might leave part of his fortune to his wife on whom he showered a succession of trifling presents the raversi though a thoroughly ugly woman had a lover count baldi the best-looking man about the court as a general rule she succeeded in everything she undertook the duchess kept up a magnificent establishment the palazzo san severina had always been one of the most splendid in parma and the duke in honour of his embassy and his expected decoration was spending large sums on improvements the duchess superintended all these charges the count had guessed aright a few days after the duchess's presentation the young clelia conti appeared at the court she had been created a canoness to parry the blow the conferring of this favour might appear to have given the count's credit the duchess under pretext of opening the gardens of her palace gave a fete and in her graceful way made clelia whom she called her little friend from the lake of como the queen of the revels her initials appeared as though by chance on all the chief transparencies which adorned the grounds the youthful clelia though a trifle pensive spoke in the most charming fashion of her little adventure on the shore of the lake and of her own sincere gratitude she was said to be very devout and fond of solitude i'll wager said the count she's clever enough to be ashamed of her father the duchess made a friend of the young girl she really felt drawn toward her she did not wish to appear jealous and included her in all her entertainments she made it her rule to endeavour to soften all the various hatreds of which the count was the object everything smiled on the duchess the court existence over which the storm clouds always hang threateningly entertained her life seemed to have begun afresh for her she was tenderly attached to the count and he was literally beside himself with delight his private happiness had endued him with the most absolute composure regarding matters which only affected his ambition and hardly two months after the duchess's arrival he received his patent as prime minister and all the honours appertaining to that position which fell but little short of those rendered to the sovereign himself the count's influence over his master's mind was all-powerful a striking proof of the fact was soon to become evident in parma ten minutes walk from the town toward the southeast rises the far-famed citadel renowned all over italy the great tower of which some hundred and eighty feet high may be described from an immense distance this tower built toward the beginning of the sixteenth century by the farnese grandsons of paul the third in imitation of the mausoleum of adrian at rome is so thick that room has been found on the terrace at one end of it to build a palace for the governor of the citadel and a more modern prison known as the farnese tower this citadel built in honour of ranuzio ernest the second who had been his own stepmother's favourite lover has a great reputation in the country both for its beauty and as a curiosity the duchess took a fancy to see it on the day of her visit the heat in parma had been most oppressive at the altitude on which the prison stood she found a breeze and was so delighted that she remained there several hours rooms in the farnese tower were immediately opened for her convenience on the terrace of the great tower she met a poor imprisoned liberal who had come up to enjoy the half hour's walk allowed him every third day she returned to parma and not having yet attained the discretion indispensable at an autocratic court she talked about the man who had told her his whole story 
the marchesa raversi's party laid hold of the duchess's remarks and made a great deal of them in the eager hope that they would give umbrage to the prince as a matter of fact ernest the fourth was fond of reiterating that the great point was to strike people's imaginations forever he would say is a great word and sheds more terror in italy than anywhere else consequently he had never granted a pardon in his life a week after her visit to the fortress the duchess received a written commutation of a prisoner's sentence signed by the prince and minister and with the name left blank any prisoner whose name she might insert was to recover his confiscated property and to be allowed to depart to america and there spend the remainder of his days the duchess wrote the name of the man to whom she had spoken by ill luck he happened to be a sort of half rascal a weak-hearted fellow it was on his confessions that the celebrated ferrante palla had been condemned to death the peculiar circumstances connected with this pardon crowned the duchess san severina's success count mosca was deliriously happy it was one of the brightest moments in his life and had a decisive influence on fabrizio's future the young man was still at romagnano near novara confessing his sins hunting reading nothing at all and making love to a high-born lady according to the instructions given him the duchess was still somewhat disgusted by this last stipulation another sign which was not a good one for the count was that though on every other subject she was absolutely frank with him and in fact thought aloud in his presence she never mentioned fabrizio without having carefully prepared her sentence beforehand if you wish it said the count to her one day i will write to that delightful brother of yours on the lake of como and with a little trouble on my own part and that of my friends i can certainly force the marchese del dongo to sue for mercy for your dear fabrizio if it be true and i should be sorry to think it was not that the boy is somewhat superior to the majority of the young men who ride their horses up and down the streets of milan what a life lies before him that of a man who at eighteen years old has nothing to do and never expects to have any occupation if heaven had granted him a real passion for anything on the face of the earth even for rod fishing i would respect it but what is to become of him at milan even if he is pardoned at one particular hour of the day he will ride out upon the horse he will have brought over from Eng england at another fixed hour sheer idleness will drive him into the arms of his mistress whom he will care for less than he does for his horse still if you order me to do it i will endeavour to procure your nephew the opportunity of leading that kind of life i should like him to be an officer said the duchess could you advise any sovereign to confer such a position which may at any moment become one of some importance on a young man who in the first place is capable of enthusiasm and in the second has proved his enthusiasm for napoleon to the extent of going to join him at waterloo consider what we should all be now if napoleon had won that battle true there would be no liberals for us to dread but the only way in which the sovereigns of the ancient families could retain their thrones would be by marrying his marshal's daughters for fabrizio the military career would be like the life of a squirrel in a cage constant movement and no advancement he would have the vexation of seeing his services outweighed by those of any and every plebeian the indispensable quality for every young man in the present day that is to say for the next fifty years during which time our terrors will last and religion will not yet be firmly re-established must be lack of intelligence and incapacity for all enthusiasm i have thought of one thing but you will begin by crying out at the very idea and it is a matter which would give me infinite trouble that would last for many a day still it is a folly that i am ready to commit for you and tell me if you can what folly i would not commit for the sake of a smile from you well said the duchess well three archbishops of parma have been members of your family ascanio del dongo who wrote a book in sixteen dash fabrizio who was born here fabrizio who was here in sixteen ninety nine and another ascanio in seventeen forty if fabrizio will enter the church and give proofs of first-rate merit i will first of all make him bishop of some other place and then archbishop here provided my influence lasts long enough the real objection is this 
shall i continue in power sufficiently long to re realize this fine plan it will take several years the prince may die or he may have the bad taste to dismiss me still after all this is the only means i can perceive of doing anything for fabrizio which will be worthy of you there was a long discussion the idea was very repugnant to the duchess prove to me once again said she to the count that no other career is possible for fabrizio the count repeated his argument and he added what you regret is the gay uniform but in that matter i am powerless the duchess asked for a month to think it over and then with a sigh she accepted the minister's wise counsels he must either ride about some big town on an english horse with a stuck-up air or take up a way of life which is not unsuitable to his birth i see no middle course repeated the count a nobleman unfortunately cannot be either a doctor or a lawyer and this is the century of lawyers but remember madam he continued that it is in your power to give your nephew the same advantages of life in milan as are enjoyed by the young men of his age who are considered to be fortune's favourites once his pardon is granted you can allow him fifteen twenty or thirty thousand francs a year the sum will matter little neither you nor i expect to put away money but the duchess pined for glory she did not want her nephew to be a mere spendthrift she gave in her adhesion to her lover's project observe the count said to her that i do not the least claim that fabrizio should become an exemplary priest like so many that you see about you no first and foremost he remains an aristocrat he can continue perfectly ignorant if he so prefers it and that will not prevent him from becoming a bishop and an archbishop if the prince only continues to consider me a useful servant if your will condescends to change my proposal into an immutable decree he continued our protege must not appear at parma in any modest position his ultimate honours would give umbrage if he had been seen here as an ordinary priest he must not appear at parma without the violet stockings and all the appropriate surroundings footnote in italy young men who are learned or protected in high quarters are created monsignori and prelates which does not mean that they are bishops they then wear violet stockings a monsignore takes no vows and can relinquish his violet stockings if he desires to marry End of footnote. then everybody will guess that your nephew is going to be a bishop and nobody will find fault if you will be ruled by me you will send fabrizio to naples for three years to study theology during the vacations he can if he chooses go and see paris and london but he must never show himself at parma this last sentence made the duchess shiver she sent a courier to her nephew desiring him to meet her at piacenza i need hardly say that the messenger carried all necessary funds and passports fabrizio who was the first to arrive at piacenza ran to meet the duchess and kissed her in a transport of affection which made her burst into tears she was glad the count was not present it was the first time since the beginning of their liaison that she had been conscious of such a sensation fabrizio was greatly touched and deeply distressed also by the plans the duchess had made for him his hope had always been that once his waterloo escapade had been excused he might yet become a soldier one thing struck the duchess and increased her romantic admiration for her nephew he absolutely refused to lead the ordinary life of young men in large italian cities don't you see yourself at the corso in florence or naples said the duchess riding your thoroughbred english horses and then in the evening your carriage and beautiful rooms and so forth she dwelt with delight on her description of the commonplace enjoyments from which she saw fabrizio turn in disdain he is a hero thought she to herself and after ten years of that delightful life said fabrizio what shall i have done what shall i be nothing but a middle-aged young man who will have to make way for the first good-looking youth who rides into society on another english horse at first he would not hear of going into the church he talked of going to new york obtaining citizenship and serving as a soldier in the republic of america what a mistake you will make you will have no fighting and you will just fall back into the old cafe life only without elegance without music and without love-making replied the duchess believe me your life in america would be a sad business both for you and me 
and she explained what dollar worship was and the respect necessarily paid to the artisan class on whose votes everything depended they went back again to the church plan before you lose your temper over it said the duchess try to understand what the count asks you to do it is not at all a question of your living a poor and more or less exemplary life like father blanes remember the history of your ancestors who were archbishops of parma read the notices of their lives in the appendix to the genealogy the man who bears a great name must be first and foremost a true nobleman high-hearted generous a protector of justice destined from the outset to stand at the head of his order guilty of but one piece of knavery in his life and that a very useful one alas cried fabrizio so all my illusions have vanished into thin air and he sighed deeply it is a cruel sacrifice i confess i never reckoned with the horror of enthusiasm and intelligence even when used in their own service which will reign for the future among all absolute sovereigns consider that a proclamation or a mere freak of the affections may drive an enthusiastic man into the opposite party to that in the service of which he has spent his whole life enthusiastic i repeated fabrizio what an extraordinary accusation i am not i cannot even contrive to fall in love what exclaimed the duchess when i have the honour of paying my court to a beautiful woman even though she be religious and of the highest birth i never can think of her except when i am looking at her this confession had a very peculiar effect upon the duchess give me a month said fabrizio to take leave of signora c at novara and what is far more difficult to bid farewell to the dreams of all my life i will write to my mother who will be good enough to come and see me at belgirate on the piedmontese shore of lago maggiore and on the one and thirtieth day from this one i will be at parma incognito do not dream of such a thing exclaimed the duchess she had no wish that count mosca should see her with fabrizio they met once more at piacenza this time the duchess was sorely agitated a storm had broken at court the marchesa raversi's party was on the brink of triumph it was quite on the cards that count mosca might be replaced by general fabio conti the head of what was known at parma as the liberal party with the exception of the name of the rival whose favour was thus growing with the prince the duchess foretold fabrizio everything she discussed all his future chances over again even to the possibility that the count's all-powerful protection might fail him i am to spend three years at the ecclesiastical academy at naples exclaimed fabrizio but as i am to be first and foremost a young man of family and as you do not expect me to lead the severe life of a virtuous seminarist the idea of my stay at naples does not alarm me the life there will at all events be no worse than that in romagnano the best company of that place was beginning to look on me as a jacobin during my exile i have discovered that i know nothing not even latin nay not even how to spell i had determined to begin my education afresh at novara i shall be glad to study theology at naples it is a complicated science the duchess was overjoyed if we are dismissed she said we will go and see you at naples but as for the moment you accept the idea of the violet stockings the count who knows the present condition of italy thoroughly has given me a hint for you believe whatever is taught you or not as you choose but never express any objection tell yourself you are being taught the rules of whist would you make any demur about the rules of whist i told the count you were a believer and he was very glad of it it is useful both in this world and in the next but do not because you believe fall into the vulgarity of speaking with horror of voltaire diderot reynal and all the other wild frenchmen who were the precursors of the two chambers those names should hardly ever be pronounced by you but if the necessity should arise you must refer to them with the calmest irony as people whose theories have long since been rejected and whose attacks are no longer of the slightest consequence accept everything you are told at the academy with the blindest faith recollect that there are individuals within its walls who will take faithful note of your most trifling objection a little love affair if judiciously managed will be forgiven you but a doubt never advancing years suppress the tendency to love-making and increase that toward doubt 
when you go to confession act on this principle you will have a letter of recommendation to the bishop who acts as factotum to the cardinal archbishop of naples to him alone you will confess your escapade in france and your presence near waterloo on the eighteenth of june and even so shorten the matter make little of the adventure only confess it so that nobody may be able to reproach you with having concealed it you were so young when it happened the second hint which the count sends you is this if a brilliant argument occurs to you or a crushing reply which would change the course of a conversation do not yield to the temptation to shine keep silence clever people will read your intelligence in your eyes it will be time enough for you to be witty when you are a bishop fabrizio began life at naples with a quiet-looking carriage and four faithful milanese servants sent him by his aunt after a year's study no one called him a clever man he rather bore the reputation of being an aristocrat studious very generous and something of a libertine the year which had been a highly pleasant one to fabrizio had been terrible for the duchess two or three times the count had been within an inch of ruin the prince who being ill was more timorous than ever fancied that by dismissing him he would get rid of the odium of the executions which had taken place before the count became minister rassi was the favourite with whom the sovereign was determined not to part the count's peril made the duchess cling to him with passionate affection she never gave a thought to fabrizio to give some colour to their possible retirement she discovered that the heir of parma which is indeed somewhat damp like that of the whole of lombardy was quite unsuited to her health at last after intervals of disgrace during which the prime minister sometimes spent three weeks without seeing his master privately moscow won the day he had general fabio conti the so-called liberal appointed governor of the citadel in which the liberals sentenced by rassi were imprisoned if conti shows any indulgence to his prisoners said mosca to his mistress he will be disgraced as a jacobin whose political views have made him forget his duty as a soldier if he proves severe and merciless which as i fancy is the direction in which he will most likely lean he comes to be the leader of his own party and alienates all the families whose relations are imprisoned in the citadel the poor wretch knows how to put on an air of the deepest respect whenever he appears before the prince he can change his clothes four times a day he can discuss a question of etiquette but his head is not strong enough to guide him along the difficult path which is the only one that can lead him to safety and anyhow i am on the spot the day after general fabio conti's appointment which closed the ministerial crisis it was noised abroad that an ultra-monarchical newspaper was to be published in parma what quarrels this newspaper will cause said the duchess the idea of publishing the newspaper is perhaps the best i ever had replied the count with a laugh little by little and in spite of myself i shall let the ultra furies take the management out of my hands i have had good salaries attached to all the positions connected with the editorial staff people will apply to be appointed from all quarters the matter will keep us busy for a month or two and so my late dangers will be forgotten those serious personages so and so and so and so have already joined the staff but the whole thing will be too revoltingly absurd i hope so indeed replied the count the prince shall read it every morning and admire the doctrine of the newspaper i have founded as regards the details he will approve of some and find fault with others that will take up two of his working hours the newspaper will get into difficulties but by the time the serious troubles begin eight or ten months hence it will be entirely in the hands of the ultras then that party which is a trouble to me will have to answer for it and i shall make complaints against the newspaper on the whole i would rather have a hundred vile absurdities than see a single man hanged who will remember an absurdity two years after its publication in the official newspaper whereas if i have to hang a man his son and his whole family vow a hatred against me which will last my whole life and may shorten it the duchess who was always passionately interested in one thing or another constantly active and never idle was cleverer than the whole court of parma together but she had not the patience and calmness indispensable to success in intrigue nevertheless she contrived to follow the working of the various coteries with eager interest and was even beginning to enjoy some personal credit with the prince 
the reigning princess clara paulina who was loaded with honours but girt about with the most superannuated etiquette looked on herself as the unhappiest of women the duchess san severina paid court to her and undertook to convince her she was not so very wretched after all it must be explained that the prince never saw his wife except at dinner this repast lasted about twenty minutes and sometimes for weeks and weeks the prince never opened his lips to clara paulina the duchess endeavoured to change all this she herself amused the prince all the more so because she had managed to preserve her independence even if she had desired it she could not have contrived never to displease any of the fools who swarmed at court it was this utter incapacity on her part that caused her to be detested by the common herd of courtiers all of them men of title most of them enjoying incomes of about five thousand francs a year she realized this misfortune during her first days at parma and turned her exclusive attention to pleasing the prince and his consort who completely swayed the hereditary prince the duchess knew how to amuse the sovereign and took advantage of the great attention he paid to her lightest word to cast hearty ridicule on the courtiers who hated her since the follies into which rassi had led him and blood-stained follies cannot be repaired the prince was occasionally frightened and very often bored this had brought him to a condition of melancholy envy he realized that he was hardly ever amused and looked glum if he thought other people were amusing themselves the sight of happiness drove him wild we must hide our love said the duchess to her lover and she allowed the prince to surmise that her affection for the count charming fellow though he was was by no means so strong as it had been this discovery ensured his highness a whole day of happiness from time to time the duchess would let fall a word or two concerning a plan she had for taking a few months holiday every year and spending the time in seeing italy for she did not know the country at all she would pay visits to naples florence and rome now nothing in the world could possibly be more displeasing to the prince than any idea of such desertion this was one of his ruling weaknesses any action which might be imputed to scorn of his native city stabbed him to the heart he felt he had no means of detaining the duchess san severina and the duchess san severina was by far the most brilliant woman in parma people even came back from their country houses in the neighbourhood to be present at her thursday parties a wonderful effort for these idle italians these thursday gatherings were real fates at which the duchess almost always produced some fresh and attractive novelty the prince was dying to see one of these parties but how was he to set about it to go to a private house was a thing which neither he nor his father had ever done on a certain thursday it was raining and bitterly cold all through the evening the duke had been listening to the carriages rattling across the pavement of the square in front of his palace on their way to the palazzo san severina a fit of impatient anger seized him other people were amusing themselves and he their sovereign prince and absolute lord who ought to amuse himself more than anybody in the world was feeling bored he rang for his aide-de-camp it took a little time to station a dozen trusty servants in the street leading from the palace of his highness to the palazzo san severina at last after an hour which to the prince seemed like a century and during which he had been tempted twenty times over to set forth boldly without any precaution whatsoever and take his chance of dagger thrusts he made his appearance in the duchess san severina's outer drawing-room if a thunderbolt had fallen in that drawing-room it could not have caused such great surprise in the twinkling of an eye as the prince passed forward a stupor of silence fell upon the rooms which had just been so noisy and so gay every eye was fixed on the prince and stared wider and wider the courtiers seemed put out of countenance the duchess alone did not appear astonished when the power of speech returned the great anxiety of all the company present was to decide the important question whether the duchess had been warned of the impending visit or whether it had taken her like everybody else by surprise the prince amused himself and my readers will now be able to realize the impulsive nature of the duchess and the infinite power which the vague ideas of possible departure she had so skilfully dropped had enabled her to attain as she accompanied the departing prince to the door he addressed her in the most flattering strain 
a strange notion entered her head and she ventured to say quite simply and as though it were the most ordinary matter in the world if your most serene highness would address two or three of the gracious expressions you have showered on me to the princess you would ensure my happiness far more thoroughly than by telling me here that i am pretty for i would not for all the world that the princess should look askance at the signal mark of favour with which your highness has just honoured me the prince looked hard at her and responded dryly i suppose i am free to go where i choose the duchess coloured my only desire she instantly replied was to avoid giving your highness the trouble of driving out for nothing for this thursday will be my last i am going to spend a few days at bologna or florence when she passed back into the drawing-rooms everyone thought she had reached the very height of court favour and she had just dared what no one in the memory of man had ever dared at parma she made a sign to the count who left his whist-table and followed her into a small room which though lighted up was empty what you have done is very bold he said i should not have advised you to do it but when a man's heart is really engaged he added with a laugh happiness increases love and if you start to-morrow morning i follow you to-morrow night the only thing which will delay me is this troublesome finance ministry which i have been foolish enough to undertake but in four hours of steady work i shall be able to give over a great many cash boxes let us go back dear friend and show off our ministerial conceit freely and unreservedly it may be the last performance we shall give in this city if the man thinks he is being set at defiance he is capable of anything he will call that making an example when all these people have departed we will see about barricading you in for the night perhaps your best plan would be to start at once for your house at sacca near the po which has the advantage of being only half an hour's journey from the austrian states it was an exquisite moment both for the duchess's love and for her vanity she looked at the count and her eyes were moist with tears that so powerful a minister surrounded by a mob of courtiers who overwhelmed him with homage equal to that they paid to the prince himself should be ready to leave everything for her and that so cheerfully when she went back to her rooms she was giddy with delight everyone bowed down before her how happiness does change the duchess said the courtiers on every side one would hardly know her again at last that roman soul which as a rule scorns everything actually condescends to appreciate the exceeding favour which the sovereign has just shown her toward the end of the evening the count came to her i must tell you some news immediately the persons close to the duchess retired to a distance when the prince returned to the palace the count went on he sent to the princess to announce his arrival imagine her astonishment i have come he said to give you an account of a really very pleasant evening which i have just spent with the san severina it is she who begged me to give you details of the manner in which she has rearranged that smoky old palace and then the prince seating himself began to describe each of your rooms he spent more than five-and-twenty minutes with his wife who was shedding tears of joy in spite of her cleverness she could not find a word to carry on the conversation in the light tone which it was his highness's pleasure to give it the prince was not a bad man whatever the italian liberals might say of him he had it is true cast a certain number of them into prison but this was out of fright and he would sometimes reiterate as though to console himself for certain memories it is better to kill the devil than to let the devil kill us on the morrow after the party to which we have just referred he was quite joyous he had done two good actions he had been to the party and had talked to his wife at dinner he spoke to her again in a word that thursday party at the san severina palace brought about a domestic revolution which resounded all over parma the raversi were dismayed and the duchess tasted a twofold joy she had been able to serve her lover and she had found him more devoted than ever and all that because a very imprudent notion came into my head said she to the count i should have more freedom no doubt at rome or at naples but could i find any existence so fascinating as this no my dear count and in good truth i owe my happiness to you end of chapter six
Chapter Seven of the Chartres of Parma by Stendhal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Seven. Any history of the four years that now elapsed would have to be filled up with small court details as insignificant as those we have just related every spring the marchesa and her daughters came to spend two months either at the palazzo san severina or at the duchess's country house at sacca on the banks of the po these were very delightful visits during which there was much talk of fabrizio but the count would never allow him to appear at parma the duchess and the prime minister found it necessary to repair an occasional blunder but on the whole fabrizio followed the line of conduct mapped out for him with tolerable propriety he was the great nobleman studying theology who did not reckon absolutely upon his virtue to ensure his advancement at naples he had taken a strong fancy to antiquarian studies he made excavations and this passion almost took the place of his fondness for horses he sold his english horses so as to continue his researches at miseno where he found a bust of the youthful Tiberius, which soon ranked as one of the finest known relics of antiquity. The discovery of this bust was almost the keenest pleasure Fabrizio knew while he was at Naples. He was too proud-spirited to imitate other young men, and, for instance, to play the lover's part with a certain amount of gravity. He had mistresses, certainly, but they were of no real consequence to him, and in spite of his youth he might have been said not to know what love was this only made the women love him more there was nothing to prevent him from behaving with the most perfect coolness for in his case one young and pretty woman was always as good as any other young and pretty woman only the one whose acquaintance he had last made seemed to him the most attractive during the last year of his sojourn one of the most admired beauties in naples had committed imprudences for his sake this had begun by amusing him and ended by boring him to death and that to such a point that one of the joys connected with his departure was that it delivered him from the pursuit of the charming duchess of blank it was in eighteen twenty one that his examination having been passed with tolerable success the director of studies received a decoration and a pecuniary acknowledgment and he himself started at last to see that city of parma of which he had often dreamed he was a monsignore and had four horses to his carriage at the last posting station before parma he took two horses instead and when he reached the town he stopped before the church of st john it contained the splendid tomb of the archbishop ascanio del dongo his great-great-uncle author of the latin genealogy he prayed beside the tomb and then went on foot to the palace of the duchess who did not expect him till several days later her drawing-room was very full soon she was left alone well are you pleased with me he said and threw himself into her arms thanks to you i have been spending four fairly happy years at naples instead of boring myself at novara with the mistress the police authorized me to take the duchess could not get over her astonishment she would not have known him if she had met him in the street she thought him what he really was one of the best-looking men in italy it was his expression especially that was so charming when she had sent him to naples he had looked a reckless daredevil the riding whip which never left his hand seemed an inherent portion of his being now when strangers were present his manner was the most dignified and guarded imaginable and when they were alone she recognized all the fiery ardor of his early youth here was a diamond which had lost nothing in the cutting hardly an hour after fabrizio's arrival count mosca made his appearance he had come a little too soon the young man spoke so correctly about the parmesan order conferred on his tutor and expressed his lively gratitude for other benefits to which he dared not refer in so open a manner with such perfect propriety that at the first glance the minister judged him correctly this nephew of yours he murmured to the duchess is born to adorn all the dignities to which you may ultimately desire to raise him up to this point all had gone marvellously well but when the minister who had been very much pleased with fabrizio and until then had given his whole attention to his behaviour and gestures looked at the duchess the expression in her eyes struck him as strange this young man makes an unusual impression here said he to himself 
the thought was a bitter one the count had passed his fiftieth year a cruel word the full meaning of which can only be realized perhaps by a man who is desperately in love he was exceedingly kind-hearted very worthy to be loved except for his official severity but in his eyes that cruel phrase my fiftieth year cast a black cloud over all his life and might even have driven him to be cruel on his own account during the five years which had elapsed since he had persuaded the duchess to settle in parma she had often roused his jealousy more especially in the earlier days but she had never given him any cause for real complaint he even believed and he was right that it was with the object of tightening her hold upon his heart that the duchess had bestowed apparent favour on certain of the young beaux about the court he was sure for instance that she had refused the advances of the prince who indeed had dropped an instructive remark on the occasion but the duchess had objected laughingly if i accepted your highness's attentions how should i ever dare to face the count again i should be almost as much put out of countenance as you the poor dear count my friend but that is a difficulty very easily surmounted and which i have already considered the count should be shut up in the citadel for the rest of his life at the moment of fabrizio's arrival the duchess was so transported with delight that she gave no thought at all to the ideas her looks might stir in the count's brain their effect was deep and his consequent suspicion ineradicable two hours after his arrival fabrizio was received by the prince the duchess foreseeing the good effect of this impromptu audience on the public mind had been soliciting it for two months beforehand this favour placed fabrizio from the very outset above the heads of all his equals the pretext had been that he was only passing through parma on his way to see his mother in piedmont just at the very moment when a charming little note from the duchess brought the prince the information that fabrizio was waiting on his pleasure his highness was feeling bored now said he to himself i shall behold a very silly little saint he will be either empty-headed or sly the commandant of the fortress had already reported the preliminary visit to the archbishop uncle's tomb the prince saw a tall young man enter his presence but for his violet stockings he would have taken him for a young officer this little surprise drove away his boredom here thought he to himself is a fine-looking fellow for whom i shall be asked god knows what favours all and any that are at my disposal he has just arrived he must feel some emotion i'll try a little jacobinism and we shall see what kind of answers he'll give after the first few gracious words spoken by the prince well monsignore said he to fabrizio are the inhabitants of naples happy is the king beloved most serene highness replied fabrizio without a moment's hesitation as i passed along the streets i used to admire the excellent demeanour of the soldiers of his majesty's various regiments all good society is respectful as it should be to its masters but i confess i have never in my life permitted people of the lower class to speak to me of anything but the labour for which i pay them the douche thought the prince what a priestling here's a well-trained bird the sanseverina's own wit thoroughly piqued the prince used all his skill to draw fabrizio into talk upon this risky subject the young man stimulated by the danger of his position was lucky enough to find admirable answers to put forward one's love for one's king said he is almost an insolence what we owe him is blind obedience the sight of so much prudence almost made the prince angry this young man from naples seems to be a clever fellow and i don't like the breed it's all very well for a clever man to behave according to the best principles and even to believe in them honestly somehow or other he is always sure to be first cousin to voltaire and rousseau the prince felt there was a sort of defiance of himself in the correct manners and unassailable answers of this youth just leaving college things were by no means turning out as he had foreseen in the twinkling of an eye he changed his tone to one of simple good nature and going back in a few words to the great principles of society and government he reeled off applying them to the occasion certain sentences from fenelon which had been taught him in his childhood for use at public audiences these principles surprise you young man said he to fabrizio he had addressed him as monsignore at the beginning of the audience and proposed to repeat the title when he dismissed him 
but during the course of the conversation he considered it more skilful and more favourable to the development of the feelings to use a more intimate and friendly term these principles young man surprise you i confess they have no close resemblance with the slices of absolutism he used the very word which are served up every day in my official newspaper but good god why do i quote that to you you know nothing of the writers in that paper i beg your most serene highness's pardon not only do i read the parma newspaper which seems to me fairly well written but i share its opinion that everything which has been done since the death of louis the fourteenth in seventeen fifteen is at once a folly and a crime man's foremost interest is his own salvation there cannot be two opinions on that score and that bliss is to last for all eternity the words liberty justice happiness of the greatest number are infamous and criminal they give men's minds a habit of discussion and disbelief the chamber of deputies mistrusts what those people call the ministry once that fatal habit of distrust is contracted human weakness applies it to everything man ends by distrusting the bible the commands of the church tradition and so forth and thenceforward he is lost even supposing and it is horribly false and criminal to say it this distrust of the authority of the princes set up by god could ensure happiness during the twenty or thirty years of life on which each of us may reckon what is half a century or even a whole century compared with an eternity of torment the manner in which fabrizio spoke showed that he was endeavouring to arrange his ideas so that his auditor might grasp them as easily as possible he was evidently not repeating a lesson by rote soon the prince ceased to care about coping with the young man whose grave and simple manner made him feel uncomfortable farewell monsignore he said abruptly i see that the education given in the ecclesiastical academy at naples is an admirable one and it is quite natural that when these excellent teachings are sown in so distinguished an intelligence brilliant results should be obtained farewell and he turned his back on him that fool is not pleased with me said fabrizio to himself now thought the prince as soon as he was alone it remains to be seen whether that handsome young fellow is susceptible of any passion for anything in that case he will be perfect could he possibly have repeated his aunt's lessons more cleverly i could have fancied i heard her speaking if there was a revolution here it would be she who would edit the moniteur just as the san felice did in the old days at naples but in spite of her five-and-twenty years and her beauty the san felice was hanged for good and all a warning to ladies who were too clever when the prince took fabrizio for his aunt's pupil he made a mistake clever folk born on the throne or close behind it soon lose all their delicacy of touch they proscribe all freedom of conversation around them taking it for coarseness they will not look at anything but masks and yet claim to be judges of complexion and the comical thing is that they believe themselves to be full of tact in this particular case for instance fabrizio did believe very nearly everything we have heard him say it is quite true that he did not bestow a thought on those great principles more than twice in a month he had lively tastes he had intelligence but he also had faith the taste for liberty the fashion for and worship of the happiness of the greatest number which is one of the manias of the nineteenth century was in his eyes no more than a heresy which would pass away like others after slaying many souls just as the plague while it rages in any particular region kills many bodies and in spite of all this fabrizio delighted in reading the french newspapers and even committed imprudences for the sake of procuring them when fabrizio returned rather in a flutter from his audience at the palace and began to relate the prince's various attacks upon him to his aunt you must call at once she said on father landriani our excellent archbishop go to his house on foot slip quietly up the stairs don't make much stir in the antechamber and if you have to wait all the better a thousand times better be apostolic in a word i understand said fabrizio the man is a tartuffe not the least in the world he is the very embodiment of virtue even after what he did at the time of count palanza's execution returned fabrizio in astonishment yes my friend even after what he did then our archbishop's father was a clerk in the ministry of finance quite a humble middle-class person that explains everything monsignore landriani is a man of intelligence lively far-reaching and profound 
he is sincere he loves virtue i am convinced that if the emperor decius were to come back to earth he would cheerfully endure martyrdom like polyuctus in the opera that was performed here last week there you have the fair side of the medal here is the reverse the moment he enters the sovereign's presence or even the presence of his prime minister he is dazzled by so much grandeur he flushes grows confused and it becomes physically impossible to him to say no this accounts for the things he has done and which have earned him his cruel reputation all over italy but what is not generally known is that when public opinion opened his eyes as to count palanza's trial he voluntarily imposed on himself the penance of living on bread and water for thirteen weeks as many weeks as there are letters in the name davide palanza there is at this court an exceedingly clever rascal of the name of rassi the prince's chief justice or head of the law department who at the period of count palanza's death completely bewitched father landriani while he was doing his thirteen weeks penance count mosca out of pity and a little out of spite used to invite him to dinner once or twice a week to please his host the good archbishop ate his dinner like anybody else he would have thought it rebellion and jacobinism to parade his repentance of an action approved by his sovereign but it was quite well known that for every dinner which his duty as a faithful subject had forced him to eat like everybody else he endured a self-imposed penance of two days on bread and water monsignore landriani though his mind is superior and his knowledge first class has one weakness he likes to be loved you must look at him tenderly therefore and at your third visit you must be frankly fond of him this together with your birth will make him adore you at once show no surprise if he accompanies you back to the head of the stairs look as if you were accustomed to his ways he is a man who was born on his knees before the nobility for the rest be simple apostolic no wit no brilliancy no swift repartee if you do not startle him he will delight in your company remember it is on his own initiative that he must appoint you his grand vicar the count and i will appear surprised and even vexed at your too rapid promotion that is essential on account of the sovereign fabrizio hurried to the archiepiscopal palace by remarkable good luck the good prelate's servant who was a trifle deaf did not catch the name of del dongo he announced a young priest called fabrizio the archbishop was engaged with a priest of not very exemplary morals whom he had summoned in order to reprimand him he was in the act of administering a reproof a very painful effort to him and did not care to carry the trouble about with him any longer he therefore kept the great nephew of the famous archbishop ascanio del dongo waiting for three-quarters of an hour how shall i reproduce his excuses and his despair when having conducted the parish priest as far as the outermost antechamber he inquired as he passed back toward his apartment what he could do for the young man who stood waiting caught sight of his violet stockings and heard the name fabrizio del dongo the matter struck our hero in so comic a light that even on this first visit he ventured in a passion of tenderness to kiss the saintly prelate's hand it was worth something to hear the archbishop reiterating in his despair that a del dongo should have waited in my antechamber he felt obliged in his own excuse to relate the whole story of the parish priest his offences his replies and so forth can that really be the man said fabrizio to himself as he returned to the palazzo san severina who hurried on the execution of that poor count palanza what does your excellency think said count mosca laughingly as he entered the duchess's room the count would not allow fabrizio to call him your excellency i am utterly amazed i know nothing about human nature i would have wagered if i had not known his name that this man could not bear to see a chicken bleed and you would have won replied the count but when he is in the prince's presence or even in mine he cannot say no as a matter of fact i must have my yellow ribbon across my coat if i am to produce my full effect upon him in morning dress he would contradict me and i always put on my uniform before i receive him it is no business of ours to destroy the prestige of power the french newspapers are demolishing it quite fast enough the respectful mania will hardly last out our time and you nephew you'll outlive respect you'll be a good-natured man fabrizio delighted in the count's society he was the first superior man who had condescended to converse with him seriously 
and further they had a taste in common that for antiques and excavations the count on his side was flattered by the extreme deference with which the young man listened to him but there was one capital objection fabrizio occupied rooms in the palazzo san severina he spent his life with the duchess and let it appear in all innocence that this intimacy constituted the great happiness of his life and fabrizio's eyes and skin were distressingly brilliant for a long time ranuzio ernest the fourth who seldom came across an unaccommodating fair had been nettled by the fact that the duchess whose virtue was well known at court had made no exceptions in his favour as we have seen fabrizio's intelligence and presence of mind had displeased him from the very outset he looked askance at the extreme affection somewhat imprudently displayed between aunt and nephew he listened with excessive attention to the comments of his courtiers which were endless the young man's arrival and the extraordinary audience granted him were the talk and astonishment of the court for a good month whereupon the prince had an idea in his guard there was a private soldier who could carry his wine in the most admirable manner this man spent his life in taverns and reported the general spirit of the military direct to the sovereign carlone lacked education otherwise he would long ago have been promoted his orders were to be in the palace every day when the great clock struck noon the prince himself went a little before noon to arrange something about the sunblind in a room on the mezzanine connected with the apartment in which his highness dressed he returned to this room a little after noon had struck and found the soldier there the prince had a sheet of paper and an ink bottle in his pocket he dictated the following note to the soldier your excellency is a very clever man no doubt and it is thanks to your deep wisdom that we see this state so well governed but my dear count such great successes cannot be obtained without rousing a little envy and i greatly fear there may be some laughter at your expense if your sagacity does not guess that a certain handsome young man has had the good fortune to inspire in spite of himself it may be a most extraordinary passion this fortunate mortal is we are told only twenty-three years of age and dear count what complicates the question is that you and i are much more than double that in the evening and at a certain distance the count is delightful sprightly a man of wit as charming as he can be but in the morning and in close intimacy the newcomer may if we look at matters closely prove more attractive now we women think a great deal of that freshness of youth especially when we ourselves are past thirty is there not talk already of settling the charming young man at our court in some great position and who may the person be who most constantly mentions the subject to your excellency the prince took the letter and gave the soldier two crowns these over and above your pay he said with a gloomy look you will keep absolute silence to everybody or you will go to the dampest of the lower dungeons in the citadel in his writing-table the prince kept a collection of envelopes addressed to the majority of the people about his court by the hand of this same soldier who was supposed not to know how to write and never did write even his police reports the prince chose out the envelope he wanted a few hours later count mosca received a letter through the post the probable hour of its arrival had been carefully calculated and at the moment when the postman who had been seen to go in with a letter in his hand emerged from the minister's palace mosca was summoned to the presence of his highness never had the favourite appeared wrapped in so black a melancholy to enjoy it more thoroughly the prince called out as he entered i want to divert myself by gossiping with my friend not to work with my minister i am enjoying the most frightful headache to-night and i feel depressed into the bargain must i describe the abominable temper that ranged in the breast of count mosca della rovere prime minister of parma when he was at last permitted to take leave of his august master ranuzio ernest the fourth possessed a finished skill in the art of torturing the human heart and i should not do him much injustice if i were to compare him here with a tiger who delights in playing with his victim the count had himself driven home at a gallop called out that not a soul was to be admitted sent word to the auditor in waiting that he was dismissed the very thought of a human being within hearing distance of his voice was odious to him and shut himself up in his great picture gallery there at last he could give rein to all his fury and there he spent his evening walking to and fro in the dark like a man beside himself he tried to silence his heart so as to concentrate all the strength of his attention on the course he should pursue 
plunged in an anguish which would have stirred the pity of his bitterest enemy he mused the man i hate lives with the duchess spends every moment of his time with her must i try to make one of her women speak nothing could be more dangerous she is so kind she pays them well they adore her and who great god does not adore her here lies the question he began again passionately must i let her guess the jealousy which devours me or must i hide it if i hold my peace no attempt at concealment will be made i know gina she is a woman who always follows her first impulse her behaviour is unforeseen even by herself if she tries to trace out a plan beforehand she grows confused at the moment of action some new idea always occurs to her which she follows delightedly as being the best in the world and which ruins everything if i say nothing of my martyrdom then nothing is hidden from me and i see everything which may happen yes but if i speak i call other circumstances into existence i make them reflect i prevent many of the horrible things which may happen perhaps he will be sent away the count drew a breath then i shall almost have won my cause even if there were a little temper at first i could calm that down and if there were temper what could be more natural she has loved him like a son for the last fifteen years there lies all my hope like a son but she has not seen him since he ran away for to waterloo but when he came back from naples to her especially he was a different man a different man he reiterated furiously and a charming man too above all he has that tender look and smiling eye which gives so much promise of happiness and the duchess cannot be accustomed to seeing such eyes at our court their place is taken here by glances that are either dreary or sardonic i myself worried by business ruling by sheer influence only over a man who would fain turn me into ridicule what eyes must i often have ah whatever care i take it is my eyes after all that must have grown old is not my very laughter always close on irony i will go further for here i must be sincere does not my merriment betray its close association with absolute power and wickedness do not i say to myself sometimes especially when i am exasperated i can do what i choose and i even add a piece of foolishness i must be happier than others because in three matters out of four i possess what others have not sovereign power well then let me be just this habit of thought must spoil my smile must give me a look of satisfied selfishness and how charming is that smile of his it breathes the easy happiness of early youth and sheds that happiness around him unfortunately for the count the weather that evening was hot oppressive close on a thunderstorm a sort of weather in a word which in those countries inclines men to extreme resolves how can i reproduce all the arguments all the views of what had happened to him which for three mortal hours tortured the passionate hearted man at last prudent counsels prevailed solely as a result of this reflection in all probability i am out of my mind when i think i am arguing i am not arguing at all i am only turning about in search of a less cruel position and i may pass by some decisive reason without perceiving it as the excess of my suffering blinds me let me follow that rule approved by all wise men which is called prudence besides once i have spoken the fatal word jealousy my line is marked out for good and all if on the contrary i say nothing to-day i can always speak to-morrow and everything remains in my hand the excitement had been too violent the count would have lost his reason if it had lasted he had a moment's relief his attention had just fixed itself on the anonymous letter whence could it come hereupon supervened a search for names and a verdict on each as it occurred which created a diversion at last the count recollected the spiteful flash in the sovereign's eye when he had said toward the close of the audience yes dear friend there can be no doubt that the pleasures and cares of the most fortunate ambition and even of unlimited power are nothing compared with the inner happiness to be found in the relations of a tender and loving intercourse myself i am a man before i am a prince and when i am so happy as to love it is the man and not the prince that my mistress knows the count compared that twinkle of spiteful pleasure with the words in the letter it is thanks to your deep wisdom that we see this state so well governed the prince wrote that sentence he exclaimed it is too gratuitously imprudent for any courtier the letter comes from his highness 
that problem once solved the flush of satisfaction caused by the pleasure of guessing it soon faded before the cruel picture of fabrizio's charms which once more rose up before him it was as though a huge weight had fallen back upon the heart of the unhappy man what matters it who wrote the anonymous letter he cried in his fury does it make the fact it reveals to me any less true this whim may change my whole life he added as though to excuse his own excitement at any moment if she cares for him in a certain way she may start off with him to belgirate to switzerland or to any other corner of the world she is rich and besides if she had only a few louis a year to live on what would that matter to her did she not tell me only a week ago that she was tired of her palace well arranged and magnificent as it is that youthful nature must have novelty and how simply this new happiness offers itself to her she will be swept away before she has thought of the danger before she has thought of pitying me and yet i am so wretched he exclaimed bursting into tears he had sworn he would not go to see the duchess that evening but he could not resist the temptation never had his eyes so thirsted for the sight of her about midnight he entered her rooms he found her alone with her nephew at ten o'clock she had dismissed all her company and closed her doors at the sight of the tender intimacy between the two and the unaffected delight of the duchess a frightful difficulty and an unexpected one rose up before the count's eyes he had not thought of it during his lengthy ponderings in the picture gallery how was he to conceal his jealousy not knowing what pretext to adopt he pretended he had found the prince exceedingly prejudiced against him that evening contradicting everything he said and so forth he had the pain of perceiving that the duchess hardly listened to him and paid no attention to circumstances which only two nights before would have led her into a whole train of argument the count looked at fabrizio never had that handsome lombard countenance seemed to him so simple and so noble fabrizio was paying much more attention than the duchess to the difficulties he was relating really said he to himself that face combines extreme kind-heartedness with a certain expression of tender and artless delight which is quite irresistible it seems to say the only serious matters in this world are love and the happiness it brings and yet if any detail which demands intelligence occurs the eye kindles and one is quite astonished and amazed in his eyes everything is simple because everything is sent from above my god how am i to struggle against such an enemy and after all what will my life be without gina's love with what delight she seems to listen to the charming sallies of that young intellect which to a woman's mind must seem unique a frightful thought clutched the count like a cramp shall i stab him there in her sight and kill myself afterward he walked up and down the room his legs were shaking under him but his hand closed convulsively upon the handle of his dagger neither of the others were paying any attention to him he said he was going to give an order to his servant they did not even hear him the duchess was laughing fondly at something fabrizio had just said to her the count went under a lamp in the outer drawing-room and looked to see whether the point of his dagger was sharp my manner to the young man must be gracious and perfectly polite he thought as he returned and drew close to them his brain was boiling they seemed to him to be bending forward and exchanging kisses there in his very sight that is not possible under my eyes he thought my reason is going i must compose myself if i am rough the duchess is capable out of sheer pique to her vanity of following him to belgirate and there or during the journey a chance word may give a name to what they feel for each other and then in a moment all the consequences must come solitude will make that one word decisive and besides what is to become of me once the duchess is far away from me and if after a great many difficulties with the prince i should go and show my aged and careworn face at belgirate what part should i play between those two in their delicious happiness even here what am i but the terzo incomodo our beautiful italian language was made for the purposes of love terzo incomodo the third party in the way what anguish for a man of parts to feel himself in this vile position and not to have the strength of mind to get up and go away the count was on the point of breaking out or at all events of betraying his suffering by the disorder of his countenance as he walked around the drawing-room finding himself close to the door he took to flight calling out in good-natured and friendly fashion good-bye you two i must not shed blood he murmured to himself 
on the morrow of that horrible evening after a night spent partly in revolving fabrizio's advantages and partly in the agonizing paroxysms of the most cruel jealousy it occurred to the count to send for a young manservant of his own this man was making love to a girl named cecchina one of the duchess's waiting-maids and her favourite by good luck this young servant was exceedingly steady in his conduct even stingy and was anxious to be appointed doorkeeper in one of the public buildings at parma the count ordered this man to send instantly for cecchina the man obeyed and an hour later the count appeared unexpectedly in the room occupied by the girl and her lover the count alarmed them both by the quantity of gold coins he gave them then looking into the trembling cecchina's eyes he addressed her in the following words are there love passages between the duchess and monsignore no said the girl making up her mind after a moment's silence no not yet but he often kisses the signora's hands he laughs i know but he kisses them passionately this testimony was borne out by a hundred answers to as many questions put by the distracted count his passionate anxiety ensured the poor folks honest earning of the money he had given them he ended by believing what they told him and felt less wretched if ever the duchess suspects this conversation of ours he said to cecchina i will send your lover to spend twenty years in the fortress and you will never see him again till his hair is white a few days went by during which it became fabrizio's turn to lose all his cheerfulness i assure you he kept saying to the duchess count mosca has an antipathy to me so much the worse for his excellency she replied with a touch of peevishness this was not the real cause of the anxiety which had driven away fabrizio's gaiety the position he mused in which chance has placed me is untenable i am quite sure she will never speak a too significant word would be as horrifying to her as an act of incest but supposing that one evening after a day of imprudence and folly she should examine her own conscience what will my position be if she believes i have guessed at the inclination she seems to feel toward me i shall simply be the casto giuseppe an italian proverb alluding to joseph's ridiculous position with regard to the wife of the eunuch potiphar shall i make her understand by confiding to her frankly that i am quite incapable of any serious passion my ideas are not sufficiently well ordered to enable me to express the fact so as to prevent its appearing a piece of deliberate impertinence my only other resource is to simulate a great devotion for a fair lady left behind me in naples and in that case i must go back there for four-and-twenty hours this plan is a wise one but what a trouble it will be i might try some obscure little love affair here at parma this might cause displeasure but anything is preferable to the horrible position of the man who will not understand this last expedient may indeed compromise my future i must try to diminish that danger by my prudence and by buying discretion the cruel thought amid all these considerations was that fabrizio really cared for the duchess far more than he did for anybody else in the world i must be awkward indeed said he to himself angrily if i am so afraid of not being able to convince her of what is really true he had not wit to extricate himself from the difficulty and he soon grew gloomy and morose what would become of me great heavens if i were to quarrel with the only being on earth to whom i am passionately attached on the other hand fabrizio could not make up his mind to disturb so delightful a condition of felicity by an imprudent word his position was so full of enjoyment his intimate relations with so charming and so pretty a woman were so delightful as regarded the more trivial aspects of life her protection ensured him such an agreeable position at the court the deep intrigues of which thanks to the explanations she gave him amused him like a stage play but at any moment he reflected i may be wakened as by a thunderclap if one of these evenings so cheerful and affectionate spent alone with this fascinating woman should lead to anything more fervent she will expect to find a lover in me she will look for raptures and wild transports and all i can ever give her is the liveliest affection without any love nature has bereft me of the capacity for that sort of sublime madness what reproaches i have had to endure on that score already i fancy i still hear the duchess of blank and i could laugh at the duchess but she will think that i fail in love for her whereas it is love which fails in me and she will never understand me 
often when she has told me some story about the court with all the grace and frolicsomeness that she alone possesses and a story besides which it is indispensable for me to know i kiss her hands and sometimes her cheek as well what should i do if her hand pressed mine in one particular way fabrizio showed himself daily in the most esteemed and dullest houses in parma guided by his aunt's wise counsels he paid skilful court to the two princes father and son to the princess clara paolina and to the archbishop success came to him but this did not console him for his mortal terror of a misunderstanding with the duchess End of chapter 7chapter eight of the chartreuse of parma by stendhal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot o r g chapter eight thus only a month after his arrival at court fabrizio was acquainted with all the worries of a courtier and the intimate friendship which had been the happiness of his life was poisoned one evening harassed by these thoughts he left the duchess's apartments where he looked far too much like the reigning lover and wandering aimlessly through the town happened to pass by the theatre which was lighted up he went in this for a man of his cloth was a piece of gratuitous imprudence and one which he had fully intended to avoid while at parma which after all is only a small town of forty thousand inhabitants it is true indeed that from the first days of his residence there he had put aside his official dress and in the evenings unless he was going to very large parties he wore plain black like any man in mourning at the theatre he took a box on the third tier so as not to be seen the piece was goldoni's locandiera he was looking at the architecture of the house and had hardly turned his eyes upon the stage but the numerous audience was in a state of constant laughter fabrizio glanced at the young actress who was playing the part of the locandiera and thought her droll he looked at her more attentively and she struck him as being altogether pretty and above all exceedingly natural she was a simple young creature the first to laugh at the pretty things goldoni had put into her mouth which seemed to astonish her as she spoke them he inquired her name and was told it was marietta valserra ah thought he to himself she has taken my name how odd contrary to his intention he did not leave the theatre until the play was over the next day he came back three days after that he had found out where marietta valserra lived on the very evening of the day on which with a good deal of difficulty he had procured this address he noticed that the count looked at him in the most pleasant manner the poor jealous lover who had hard work to restrain himself within the bounds of prudence had set spies upon the young man's conduct and was delighted at his freak for the actress how shall i describe the count's delight when the day after that on which he had been able to force himself to be gracious to fabrizio he learned that the young man partly disguised indeed in a long blue overcoat had climbed to the wretched apartment on the fourth floor of an old house behind the theatre in which marietta valserra lived his delight increased twofold when he knew that fabrizio had presented himself under a false name and was honoured by the jealousy of a good-for-nothing fellow of the name of giletti who played third-rate servants parts in the city and danced on the tight-rope in the neighbouring villages this noble lover of marietta's was heaping volleys of abuse on fabrizio and vowed he would kill him opera companies are formed by an impresario who engages the artists he can afford to pay or finds disengaged from all quarters and the company thus collected by chance remains together for a season or two at the outside this is not the case with comedy companies these though they move about from town to town and change their place of residence every two or three months continue nevertheless as one family the members of which either love or hate each other these companies frequently comprise couples living in constant and close relations which the bows of the towns in which they occasionally perform find it very difficult to break up this is exactly what happened to our hero 
little marietta liked him well enough but she was horribly afraid of giletti who claimed to be her lord and master and kept a close eye upon her he openly declared that he would kill the monsignore for he had dogged fabrizio's steps and had succeeded in finding out his name this giletti was certainly the most hideous of beings and the least attractive imaginable as a lover he was enormously tall hideously thin deeply pitted with smallpox and had something of a squint into the bargain notwithstanding this he was full of the graces peculiar to his trade and would make his entry on the wings where his comrades were assembled turning wheels on his hands and feet or performing some other pleasing trick his great parts were those in which the actor appears with his face whitened with flour and receives or inflicts innumerable blows with a stick this worthy rival of fabrizio's received a salary of thirty-two francs a month and thought himself very well off indeed to count mosca it was as though he had been brought back from the gates of the tomb when his watchers brought him the proofs of all these details his good nature reasserted itself he was gayer and better company than ever in the duchess's rooms and took good care not to tell her anything of the little adventure which had restored him to life he even took precautions to prevent her hearing anything of what was happening until the latest possible moment and finally he gathered courage to listen to his reason which for a month had been vainly assuring him that whenever a lover's merits fade that lover should take a journey important business summoned him to bologna and twice a day the cabinet couriers brought him not so much the necessary papers from his offices as news of little marietta's amours of the redoubtable giletti's fury and of fabrizio's undertakings several times over one of the count's agents bespoke performances of arlecchino scheletro e pasta one of giletti's triumphs he emerges from the pie just as his rival brighella is going to eat it and thrashes him soundly this made a pretext for sending him a hundred francs giletti who was over head and ears in debt took good care to say nothing about this windfall but his pride reached an astonishing pitch what had been a whim in fabrizio's case now became a matter of piqued vanity young as he was his anxieties had already driven him to indulge in whims his vanity led him to the theatre the little girl acted very well and amused him when the play was over he was in love for quite an hour the count receiving news that fabrizio was in real danger returned to parma giletti who had served as a dragoon in the fine napoleon regiment was seriously talking of murdering fabrizio and was making arrangements for his subsequent flight into the romagna if my reader be very young he will be scandalized by my admiration for this fine tray of virtue yet it involved no small effort of heroism on the count's part to leave bologna for too often indeed in the mornings his complexion looked sorely jaded and fabrizio's was so fresh and pleasant to look at who could have reproached him with fabrizio's death if it had occurred in his absence and on account of so foolish a business but to his rare nature the thought of a generous action which he might have done and which he had not performed would have been an eternal remorse and further he could not endure the idea of seeing the duchess sad and by his fault when he arrived he found her taciturn and gloomy this is what had happened her little maid cecchina tormented by remorse and gauging the importance of her own fault by the large sum she had been paid for committing it had fallen sick one night the duchess who had a real regard for her went up to her room the young girl could not resist this mark of kindness she burst into tears begged her mistress to take back the money still remaining to her out of what she had received and at last gathered courage to tell her the story of the count's questions and her own replies the duchess ran across to the lamp and put it out then she told cecchina that she would forgive her but only on condition that she never said a word about the strange scene to anybody on earth the poor count she added carelessly is afraid of looking ridiculous all men are alike the duchess hurried down to her own apartments she had hardly shut herself into her own room before she burst into tears the idea of love passages with fabrizio at whose birth she had been present was horrible to her and yet what other meaning could her conduct bear such had been the first cause of the black depression in which the count found her plunged when he arrived 
she had fits of impatience with him and almost with fabrizio she would have liked never to have seen either of them again she was vexed by fabrizio's behaviour with little marietta which seemed to her ridiculous for the count who like a true lover could keep nothing from his mistress had told her the whole story she could not grow accustomed to this disaster there was a flaw in her idol at last in a moment of confidence she asked the count's advice it was an exquisite instant for him and a worthy reward for the upright impulse which had brought him back to parma what can be more simple said the count with a smile these young fellows fall in love with every woman they see and the next morning they have forgotten all about her ought he not to go to belgirate to see the marchesa del dongo very well then let him start while he is away i shall request the comedy company to remove itself and its talents elsewhere and will pay its travelling expenses but we shall soon see him in love again with the first pretty woman chance may throw across his path that is the natural order of things and i would not have it otherwise if it is necessary let the marchesa write to him this suggestion emitted with an air of the most complete indifference was a ray of light to the duchess she was afraid of giletti that evening the count mentioned as though by chance that one of his couriers was about to pass through milan on his way to vienna three days later fabrizio received a letter from his mother he departed very much annoyed because giletti's jealousy had hitherto prevented him from taking advantage of the friendly feelings of which marietta had assured him through her mamaccia an old woman who performed the functions of her mother fabrizio met his mother and one of his sisters at belgirate a large piedmontese village on the right bank of lago maggiore the left bank is in milanese territory and consequently belongs to austria this lake which is parallel to the lake of como and like it runs from north to south lies about thirty miles further westward the mountain air the calm and majestic aspect of the splendid lake which recalled that near which he had spent his childhood all contributed to change fabrizio's annoyance which had verged upon anger into a gentle melancholy the memory of the duchess rose up before him clothed with infinite tenderness it seemed to him now he was far from her that he was beginning to love her with that love which he had never yet felt for any woman nothing could have been more painful to him than the thought of being parted from her for ever and if while he was in this frame of mind the duchess had condescended to the smallest coquetry such for example as giving him a rival she would have conquered his heart but far from taking so decisive a step she could not help reproaching herself bitterly because her thoughts hovered so constantly about the young traveller's path she upbraided herself for what she still called a fancy as if it had been an abomination her kindness and attention to the count increased twofold and he bewitched by all these charms could not listen to the healthy reason which prescribed a second trip to bologna the marchesa del dongo greatly hurried by the arrangements for the weddings of her eldest daughter with a milanese duke could only spend three days with her beloved son never had she found him so full of tender affection amid the melancholy which was taking stronger and yet stronger hold of fabrizio's soul a strange and even absurd idea had presented itself to him and was forthwith carried into effect dare we say he was bent on consulting father blanes the good old man was perfectly incapable of understanding the sorrows of a heart torn by various boyish passions of almost equal strength and besides it would have taken a week to give him even a faint idea of the various interests at parma which fabrizio was forced to consider yet when fabrizio thought of consulting him all the fresh feelings of his sixteenth year came back to him shall i be believed when i affirm that it was not simply to the wise man and the absurdly faithful friend that fabrizio longed to speak the object of this excursion and the feelings which agitated our hero all through the fifty hours of its duration are so absurd that for the sake of my story i should doubtless do better to suppress them i fear fabrizio's credulity may deprive him of the reader's sympathy but thus he was why should i flatter him more than another i have not flattered count mosca nor the prince fabrizio then if the truth must be told accompanied his mother to the port of laveno on the left bank of the lago maggiore on the austrian side where she landed about eight o'clock at night the lake itself is considered neutral and no passports are asked of anyone who does not land 
but darkness had hardly fallen before he too had put himself ashore on that same austrian bank in a little wood which juts out into the water he had hired a sediola a sort of country gig which travels very fast in which he was able to follow about five hundred paces behind his mother's carriage he was disguised as a servant belonging to the casa del dongo and none of the numerous police or customs officers thought of asking him for his passport a quarter of a league from como where the marchesa del dongo and her daughter were to spend the night he took a path to the left which after running round the village of vico joined a narrow newly made road along the very edge of the lake it was midnight and fabrizio had reason to hope he would not meet any gendarmes the black outline of the foliage on the clumps of trees through which the road constantly passed stood out against a starry sky just veiled by a light mist a profound stillness hung over the waters and the sky fabrizio's soul could not resist this sublime beauty he stopped and seated himself on a rock which jutted out into the lake and formed a little promontory nothing broke the universal silence save the little waves that died out at regular intervals upon the beach fabrizio had the heart of an italian i beg the fact may be forgiven him this drawback which will make him less attractive consisted above all in the following fact he was only vain by fits and starts and the very sight of sublime beauty filled his heart with emotion and blunted the keen and cruel edge of his sorrows sitting on his lonely rock no longer forced to keep watch against police agents sheltered by the darkness of the night and the vast silence soft tears rose in his eyes and he enjoyed at very little cost the happiest moments he had known for many a day he resolved he would never tell a lie to the duchess and it was because he loved her to adoration at that moment that he swore an oath never to tell her that he loved her never would he drop into her ear that word love because the passion to which the name is given had never visited his heart in the frenzy of generosity and virtue which made him feel so happy at that moment he resolved on the earliest opportunity to tell her the whole truth that his heart had never known what love might be once this bold decision had been adopted he felt as though a huge weight had been lifted off him perhaps she will say something to me about marietta very good then i will never see little marietta again he answered his own thought joyously the morning breeze was beginning to temper the overwhelming heat which had prevailed the whole day long the dawn was already outlining the alpine peaks which rise over the northern and eastern shores of the lake of como with a pale faint light their masses white with snow even in the month of june stand out sharply against the clear blue of a sky which at those great heights no cloud ever dims a spur of the alps running southward toward the favoured land of italy separates the slopes of como from those of garda fabrizio's eyes followed all the branchings of the noble range the dawn as it drove away the light mists rising from the gorges revealed the valleys lying between he had resumed his way some minutes previously he climbed the hill which forms the durini promontory and at last his eyes beheld the church tower of grianta from which he had so often watched the stars with father blanes how crassly ignorant i was in those days he thought i couldn't even understand the absurd latin of the astrological treatises my master thumbed and i believe the chief reason of my respect for them was that as i only comprehended a word here and there my imagination undertook to supply their meaning after the most romantic fashion gradually his reverie wandered into another direction was there anything real about this science why should it be different from others a certain number of fools and of clever people for instance agree between themselves that they understand the mexican language by this means they impose on society which respects them and on governments who pay them they are loaded with favours just because they are stupid and because the people in power need not fear their disturbing the populace and stirring interest and pity by their generous sentiments look at father bari on whom ernest the fourth has just bestowed a pension of four thousand francs and the cross of his order for having reconstituted nineteen lines of a greek dithyram but after all what right have i to think such things absurd he exclaimed of a sudden stopping short has not that very same cross been given to my own tutor 
fabrizio felt profoundly uncomfortable the noble passion for virtue which had lately thrilled his heart was being transformed into the mean satisfaction of enjoying a good share in the proceeds of a robbery well said he at last and his eyes grew dim as the eyes of a man who is discontented with himself since my birth gives me a right to profit by these abuses i should be an arrant fool if i did not take my share but i must not venture to speak evil of them in public places this argument was not devoid of sense but fabrizio had fallen a long way below the heights of sublime delight on which he had hovered only an hour before the thought of his privileges had scorched that always delicate plant which men call happiness if i must not believe in astrology he went on making an effort to divert his thoughts if like three-fourths of the non-mathematical sciences this one is no more than an association of enthusiastic simpletons with clever humbugs paid by those they serve how comes it that i dwell so often and with so much emotion upon that fatal episode i did escape long since from the jail at so-and-so but i was wearing the clothes and using the papers of a soldier who had been justly cast into prison fabrizio's reasoning would never carry him any farther than this he revolved the difficulty in a hundred ways but he never could surmount it he was too young as yet during his leisure moments his soul was steeped in the delight of tasting the sensations arising out of the romantic circumstances with which his imagination was always ready to supply him he by no means employed his time in patiently considering the real peculiarities of things and then discovering their causes reality still seemed to him dull and dirty i can conceive its not being pleasant to look at but then one should not argue about it above all things one should not put forward one's own various forms of ignorance as objections thus it was that though fabrizio was no fool he was not able to realize that his half-belief in omens really was a religion a profound impression received at his entrance into life the thought of this belief was a sensation and a happiness and he obstinately endeavoured to discover how it might be proved a science which really did exist like that of geometry for instance he eagerly ransacked his memory for the occasions on which the omens he had observed had not been followed by the happy or unfortunate event that they appeared to prognosticate but though he believed himself to be following out a course of argument and so drawing nearer to the truth his memory dwelt with delight on those cases in which the omen had on the whole been followed by the accident good or evil which he had believed it to foretell and his soul was filled with emotion and respect and he would have felt an invincible repugnance toward any one who denied the existence of such signs more especially if he had spoken of them jestingly fabrizio had been walking along without any regard for distance and he had reached this point in his powerless arguments when raising his head he found himself confronted by the wall of his own father's garden this wall which supported a fine terrace rose more than forty feet above the road on the right-hand side a course of dressed stone running along the top close to the balustrade gave it a monumental appearance it's not bad said fabrizio coldly to himself the architecture is good very nearly roman in style he was applying his new antiquarian knowledge then he turned away in disgust his father's severity and above all his brother ascanio's denunciation after his return from france came back to his mind that unnatural denunciation has been the origin of my present way of life i may hate it i may scorn it but after all it has changed my fate what would have become of me once i had been sent to novara where my father's man of business could hardly endure the sight of me if my aunt had not fallen in love with a powerful minister and then if that same aunt had possessed a hard and unfeeling nature instead of that tender passionate heart which loves me with a sort of frenzy that astounds me where should i be now if the duchess had been like her brother the marchese del dongo lost in these bitter memories fabrizio had been walking aimlessly forward he reached the edge of the moat just opposite the splendid facade of the castle he scarcely cast a glance at the huge time-stained building the noble language of its architecture fell on deaf ears the memory of his father and his brother shut every sensation of beauty out of his heart his only thought was that he must be on his guard in the presence of a dangerous and hypocritical enemy for an instant but in evident disgust he glanced at the little window of the third-floor room he had occupied before eighteen fifteen 
his father's treatment had wiped all the charm out of his memories of early days i have never been back in it he thought since eight o'clock at night on that seventh of march i left it to get the passport from vasi and the next morning in my terror of spies i hurried on my departure when i came back after my journey to france i had not time even to run up and look once at my prince and all that thanks to my brother's accusation fabrizio turned away his head in horror father blanes is more than eighty-three now he mused sadly he hardly ever comes to the castle so my sister tells me the infirmities of years have laid their hand upon him that noble steady heart is frozen by old age god knows how long it may be since he has been in his tower i'll hide myself in his cellar under the vats or the wine press until he wakes i will not disturb the good old man's slumbers probably he will even have forgotten my face six years make so much difference at my age i shall find nothing but the shell of my old friend and it really is a piece of childishness he added to have come here to face the odious sight of my father's house fabrizio had just entered the little square in front of the church it was with an astonishment that almost reached delirium that he saw the long narrow window on the second story of the ancient tower lighted up by father blanes's little lantern it was the father's custom to place it there when he went up to the wooden cage which formed his observatory so that the light might not prevent him from reading his planisphere this map of the sky was spread out on a huge earthenware vase which had once stood in the castle orangery in the orifice at the bottom of the vase was the tiniest of lamps the smoke of which was carried out of the vase by a slender tin tube and the shadow cast by this tube on the map marked the north all these memories of simple little things flooded fabrizio's soul with emotion and filled it with happiness almost unthinkingly he raised his two hands and gave the little low short whistle which had once been the signal for his admission at once he heard several pulls at the cord running from the observatory which controlled the latch of the tower door in a transport of emotion he bounded up the stairs and found the father sitting in his accustomed place in his wooden armchair his eye was fixed on the little telescope with his left hand the father signed to him not to interrupt the observation a moment afterward he noted down a figure on a playing card then turning in his chair he held out his arms to our hero who cast himself into them bursting into tears the abbe blanes was his real father i was expecting you said blanes when the first outburst of tenderness had subsided was the abbe posing as a wise man or was it that thinking of fabrizio so often as he did some astrological sign had warned him by a mere chance of his return the hour of my death draws near said father blanes what exclaimed fabrizio much affected yes returned the father and his tone was serious but not sad five months and a half or six months and a half after i have seen you again my life which will have attained its full measure of happiness will fade out come face al mancar del alimento even as the little lamp when the oil fails in it before the closing moment comes i shall probably be speechless for one month or two after that i shall be received into our father's bosom provided indeed that he is satisfied that i have fulfilled my duty at the post where he set me as sentinel you are worn out with weariness your agitation makes you inclined for sleep since i have expected you i have hidden a loaf and a bottle of brandy in the large case which contains my instruments support your life with these and try to gather enough strength to listen to me for a few moments more i have it in my power to tell you several things before this night has altogether passed into the day i see them far more distinctly now than i may perhaps see them to-morrow for my child we are always weak and we must always reckon with this weakness to-morrow it may be the old man the earthly man in me will be making ready for my death and to-morrow night at nine o'clock you must leave me when fabrizio had obeyed him in silence as was his wont it is true then the old man resumed that when you tried to see waterloo all you found at first was a prison yes father replied fabrizio much astonished well that was a rare good fortune for your soul warned by my voice may make itself ready to endure another prison far more severe infinitely more terrible you will probably only leave it through a crime but thanks be to heaven the crime will not be committed by your hand never fall into crime however desperately you may be tempted 
i think i see that there will be some question of your killing an innocent man who without knowing it has usurped your rights if you resist this violent temptation which will seem justified by the laws of honour your life will be very happy in the eyes of men and reasonably happy in the eyes of the wise he added after a moment's reflection you will die my son like me sitting on a wooden seat far from all luxury and undeceived by it and like me without having any serious reproach upon your soul now future matters are ended between us i am not able to add anything of much importance in vain i have sought to know how long your imprisonment will last whether it will be six months a year ten years i cannot discover anything i must i suppose have committed some sin and it is the will of heaven to punish me by the sorrow of this uncertainty i have only seen that after the prison yet i do not know whether it is at the very moment of your leaving it there will be what i call a crime but happily i think i may be sure that it will be not committed by you if you are weak enough to dabble in that crime all the rest of my calculations are but one long mistake then you will not die with peace in your soul sitting on a wooden chair and dressed in white as he spoke those words the father tried to rise and then it was that fabrizio became aware of the ravages time had worked on his frame he took almost a minute to get up and turn toward fabrizio the young man stood by motionless and silent the father threw himself into his arms and strained him close to him several times over with the utmost tenderness then with all the old cheerfulness he said try to sleep in tolerable comfort among my instruments take my fur-lined wrappers you will find several which the duchess san severina sent me four years ago she begged me to foretell your future to her but i took care to do nothing of the kind though i kept her wrappers and her fine quadrant any announcement of future events is an infringement of the rule and involves this danger that it may change the event in which case the whole science falls to the ground and becomes nothing more than a childish game and besides i should have had to say some hard things to the ever lovely duchess by the way do not let yourself be startled in your sleep by the frightful noise the bells will make in your ear when they ring for the seven o'clock mass later on they will begin to sound the big bell on the lower floor which makes all my instruments rattle to-day is the feast of san jovita soldier and martyr you know our little village of grianta has the same patron saint as the great city of brescia which by the way led my illustrious master jacopo marini of ravenna into a very comical error several times over he assured me i should attain a very fair ecclesiastical position he thought i was to be priest of the splendid church of san jovita at brescia and i have been priest of a little village numbering seven hundred and fifty souls but it has all been for the best i saw not ten years since that if i had been priest of brescia my fate would have led me to a prison on a hill in moravia the spielberg to-morrow i will bring you all sorts of dainty viands stolen from the great dinner which i am giving to all the neighbouring priests who are coming to sing in my high mass i will bring them into the bottom of the tower but do not try to see me do not come down to take possession of the good things until you have heard me go out again you must not see me by daylight and as the sun sets at twenty-seven minutes past seven to-morrow i shall not come to embrace you till towards eight o'clock and you must depart while the hours are still counted by nine that is to say before the clock has struck ten take care you are not seen at the tower windows the gendarmes hold a description of your person and they are in a manner under the orders of your brother who is a thorough tyrant the marchese del dongo is breaking added blanes sadly and if he were to see you perhaps he would give you something from his hand directly into yours but such benefits with the stain of fraud upon them are not worthy of a man such as you whose strength one day will be in his conscience the marchese hates his son ascanio and to that son five or six millions of his property will descend that is just when he dies you will have four thousand francs a year and fifty yards of black cloth for your servant's mourning end of chapter eight chapter nine of the chartres of parma by stendhal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9 the old man's discourse fabrizio's deep attention to it and his own excessive weariness had thrown him into a state of feverish excitement he found it very difficult to sleep and his slumber was broken by dreams which may have been omens of the future at ten o'clock the next morning he was disturbed by the rocking of the tower and a frightful noise which seemed to be coming from without terrified he leaped to his feet and thought the end of the world must have come then he fancied himself in prison, and it was some time before he recognized the sound of the great bell which forty peasants had set swinging in honor of the great San Giovita. Ten would have done it just as well. Fabrizio looked about for a place whence he might look on without being seen. He observed that from that great height he could look all over his father's gardens, and even into the inner courtyard of his house. He had forgotten it the thought of his father now nearing the close of his life changed all his feelings toward him he could even distinguish the sparrows hopping about in search of a few crumbs on the balcony of the great dining-room they're the descendants of those i once tamed he thought this balcony like all the others was adorned with numerous orange trees set in earthenware vases large and small the sight of them touched him there was an air of great dignity about this inner courtyard thus adorned with its sharply cut shadows standing out against the brilliant sunshine the thought of his father's failing health came back to him it really is very odd he said to himself my father is only thirty-five years older than i am thirty-five and twenty-three only make fifty-eight the eyes which were gazing at the windows of the room occupied by the harsh parent whom he had never loved brimmed over with tears he shuddered and a sudden chill ran through his veins when he fancied he recognized his father crossing an orange-covered terrace on the level of his chamber but it was only a manservant just beneath the tower a number of young girls in white dresses and divided into several groups were busily outlining patterns in red blue and yellow flowers on the soil of the streets along which the procession was to pass but there was another sight which appealed yet more strongly to fabrizio's soul from his tower he could look over the two arms of the lake for a distance of several leagues and this magnificent prospect soon made him forget every other sight it stirred the most lofty feelings in his breast all his childish memories crowded on his brain and that day spent prisoned in a church tower was perhaps one of the happiest in his life his felicity carried him to a frame of thought considerably higher than was as a rule natural to him young as he was he pondered over the events of his past life as though he had already reached its close i must acknowledge that never since i came to parma he mused at last after several hours of the most delightful reverie have i ever known calm and perfect delight such as I used to feel at Naples, when I galloped along the roads of Vomero, or wandered on the coasts of Misena. All the complicated interests of that spiteful little court have made me spiteful, too. I find no pleasure in hating anybody. I even think it would be but a poor delight to me to see my enemies humiliated, if I had any. But hold, he cried, I have an enemy, Giletti now it is curious he went on that my pleasure at the idea of seeing that ugly fellow going to the devil should have outlived the very slight fancy i had for little marietta she is not to be compared to the duchesse de a so and so to whom i was obliged to make love at naples because i had told her i had fallen in love with her heavens how bored i used to be during those long hours of intimacy with which the fair duchess used to honour me i never felt anything of that sort in the shabby room bedroom and kitchen too in which little marietta received me twice and for two minutes each time and heavens again what do these people eat it was pitiful i ought to have given her mamacha a pension of three beefsteaks a day that little marietta he added distracted me from the wicked thoughts with which the neighbourhood of the court had inspired me perhaps i should have done better to take up with the cafe life as the duchess calls it she seemed rather to incline to it and she is much cleverer than i am thanks to her bounty or even with this income of four thousand francs a year 
and the interest of the forty thousand francs invested at lyons which my mother intends for me i should always have been able to keep a horse and to spend a few crowns on making excavations and forming a collection as i am apparently never destined to know what love is my greatest pleasures will always lie in that direction i should like before i die to go back once to the battlefield of waterloo and try to recognize the meadow where i was lifted from my horse in such comical fashion and left sitting on the grass once that pilgrimage had been performed i would often come back to this noble lake there can be nothing so beautiful in the whole world to my heart at all events why should i wander so far away in search of happiness it lies here under my very eyes ah said fabrizio again but there is a difficulty the police forbid my presence near the lake of como but i am younger than the people who direct the police here he added with a laugh i shall find no duchesse de a but i should have one of the little girls who are scattering flowers down yonder and i am sure i should love her just as much even in love matters hypocrisy freezes me and our fine ladies aim at too much sublimity in their effects napoleon has given them notions of propriety and constancy the devil he exclaimed a moment later pulling his head in suddenly as if afraid he might be recognized in spite of the shadow cast by the large wooden shutters which kept the rain off the bells here come the gendarmes in all their splendour ten gendarmes in fact four of whom were non-commissioned officers had appeared at the head of the principal street of the village the sergeant posted them a hundred paces apart along the line the procession was to follow everybody here knows me if i am seen i shall be carried at one bound from the shores of como to the spielberg where i shall have a hundred and ten pound weight of fetters fashioned to each of my legs and what a grief for the duchess it was two or three minutes before fabrizio was able to realize that in the first place he was eighty feet above other people's heads that the spot where he stood was comparatively dark that anybody who might glance upward would be blinded by the blazing sun and last of all that every eye was staring wide about the village streets the houses of which had been freshly whitewashed in honour of the feast of san giovita in spite of the cogency of these arguments fabrizio's italian soul would have been incapable of any further enjoyment if he had not interposed a rag of old sacking which he nailed up to the window between himself and the gendarmes making two holes in it so that he might be able to look out the bells had been crashing out for ten minutes the procession was passing out of the church the mortaretti were exploding loudly fabrizio turned his head and looked at the little esplanade surrounded by a parapet on which his childish life had so often been endangered by the mortaretti fired off close to his legs because of which his mother always insisted on keeping him beside her on feast days these mortaretti or little mortars it should be explained are nothing but gun barrels sawn off in lengths of about four inches it is for this purpose that the peasants so greedily collect the musket barrels which european policy since the year seventeen ninety six has soon broadcast over the plains of lombardy when these little tubes are cut up into four inch lengths they are loaded up to the very muzzle set on the ground in a vertical position and a train of powder is laid from one to the other they are ranged in three lines like a battalion to the number of some two or three hundred in some clear space near the line of procession when the holy sacrament approaches the train of powder is lighted and then begins a sharp dropping fire of the most irregular and ridiculous description which sends all the women wild with delight nothing more cheery can be imagined than the noise of these mortaretti as heard from a distance across the lake and softened by the rocking of the waters the curious rattle which had so often been the delight of his childhood put the over-serious notions which had assailed our hero to flight he fetched the father's big astronomical telescope and was able to recognize most of the men and women taking part in the procession many charming little girls whom fabrizio had left behind him as slips of eleven and twelve years old had now grown into magnificent-looking women in all the flower of the most healthy youth the sight of them brought back our hero's courage and for the sake of exchanging a word with them he would have braved the gendarmes willingly when the procession had passed and re-entered the church by a side door which was out of fabrizio's reign of vision the heat at the top of the tower soon became intense the villagers returned to their homes and deep silence fell over the place 
several boats filled with peasants departed to bellagio menaggio and other villages on the shores of the lake fabrizio could distinguish the sound of every stroke of the oars this detail simple as it was threw him into a perfect ecstasy his delight at that moment was built up on all the unhappiness and discomfort which the complicated life of courts had inflicted upon him what a pleasure would it have been at that moment to row a league's distance over that beautiful calm lake in which the depths of the heavens were so faithfully reflected he heard somebody open the door at the bottom of the tower father blanes's old servant laden with a big basket it was as much as he could do to refrain from going to speak to her she has almost as much affection for me as her master has he thought and i am going away at nine o'clock to-night would she not keep silence as she would swear to me to do even for those few hours but said fabrizio to himself i should displease my friend i might get him into trouble with the gendarmes and he let gita depart without saying a word to her he made an excellent dinner and then lay down to sleep for a few minutes he did not wake till half-past eight at night father blanes was shaking his arm and it had grown quite dark blanes was exceedingly weary he looked fifty years older than on the preceding night he made no further reference to serious matters seating himself in his wooden chair kiss me he said to fabrizio several times over he clasped him in his arms at last he spoke death which will soon end this long life of mine will not be so painful as this separation i have a purse which i shall leave in gita's care with orders to use its contents for her own need but to make over whatever it may contain to you if you should ever ask her for it i know her once i have given her this command she is capable in her desire to save for you of not eating meat four times in the year unless you give her explicit orders on the subject you may be reduced to penury yourself and then your old friends might may be of service to you expect nothing but vile treatment from your brother and try to earn money by some labor that will make you useful to society i foresee strange tempests fifty years hence perhaps no idle man will be allowed to live your mother and your aunt may fail you your sisters must obey their husband's will then suddenly he cried go go fly he had just heard a little noise in the clock a warning that it was about to strike ten he would not even give fabrizio time for a farewell embrace make haste make haste he cried it will take you at least a minute to get down the stairs take care you do not fall that would be a terrible omen fabrizio rushed down the stairs and once out on the square he began to run he had hardly reached his father's castle before the clock struck ten every stroke echoed in his breast and filled him with a strange sense of agitation he paused to reflect or rather to give rein to the passionate feelings inspired by the contemplation of the majestic edifice at which he had looked so coolly only the night before his reverie was disturbed by human footsteps he looked up and saw himself surrounded by four gendarmes he had two excellent pistols the priming of which he had renewed during his dinner the click he made as he cocked them attracted one of the gendarmes notice and very nearly brought about his arrest he recognized his danger and thought of firing at once he would have been within his rights for it was his only chance of resisting four armed men fortunately for him the gendarmes who were going round to clear the wine shops had not treated the civilities offered them in several of those hospitable meeting places with absolute indifference they were not sufficiently quick in making up their minds to do their duty fabrizio fled at the top of his speed the gendarmes ran a few steps after him shouting stop stop then silence fell on everything once more some three hundred paces off fabrizio stopped to get his breath the noise of my pistols very nearly caused my arrest it would have served me right if the duchess had told me if ever i had been allowed to look into her beautiful eyes again that my soul delights in contemplating things that may happen ten years hence and forgets to look at those which are actually under my nose fabrizio shuddered at the thought of the danger he had just escaped he hastened his steps but soon he could not restrain himself from running which was not over prudent for he attracted the attention of several peasants on their homeward way yet he could not prevail upon himself to stop till he was on the mountain over a league from grianta 
and even then he broke into a cold sweat whenever he thought of the spielberg i have been in a pretty fright he said he to himself and at the sound of the word he felt almost inclined to be ashamed but does not my aunt tell me that the thing i need most is to learn how to forgive myself i am always comparing myself with a perfect model which can have no real existence so be it then i will forgive myself my fright for on the other hand i was very ready to defend my liberty and certainly those four men would not all have been left to take me to prison what i am doing at this moment he added is not soldierly instead of rapidly retiring after having fulfilled my object and possibly roused my enemy's suspicions i am indulging a whim which is perhaps more absurd than all the good father's predictions and in fact instead of returning by the shortest road and gaining the banks of the lago maggiore where the boat awaited him he was making a huge detour for the purpose of seeing his tree my readers will perhaps recollect fabrizio's affection for a chestnut tree planted by his mother some three-and-twenty years previously it would be worthy of my brother he thought if he had had that tree cut down but such creatures as he have no feeling for delicate matters he will not have thought of it and besides he added resolutely it would not be an evil omen two hours later there was a consternation in his glance mischievous hands or a stormy wind had broken off one of the chief branches of the young tree and it was hanging withered with the help of his dagger fabrizio cut it off carefully and closely pared the wound so that the rain might not enter the trunk then though time was very precious to him for it was nearly dawn he spent a good hour in digging up the ground round the beloved tree when all these follies were accomplished he rapidly proceeded on his way toward the lago maggiore he did not feel depressed on the whole the tree was doing well it was stronger than ever and in five years it had almost doubled in size the broken branch was a mere accident of no consequence now that it had been lopped off the tree would not suffer and would even grow the taller as its limbs divided at a greater height before fabrizio had travelled a league a brilliant strip of white light in the east outlined the peaks of the resegon di lec a well-known mountain in that country the road he was now following was full of peasants but instead of thinking of military matters fabrizio was filled with emotion by the sublime or touching aspects of the forest round the lake of como they are perhaps the most lovely in the world i do not mean those which bring in the greatest number of new crowns as they say in switzerland but those which appeal most strongly to the human soul to a man in fabrizio's position exposed to all the attentions of the gendarmes of lombardy and venetia it was mere childishness to listen to their language at last he said to himself i am half a league from the frontier i shall meet the customs officers and the gendarmes making their round this fine cloth coat of mine will rouse their suspicions they will ask me for my passport the said passport bears a name doomed to a prison written in fair characters and so i find myself under the agreeable necessity of committing murder if the gendarmes walk together as they generally do i dare not wait till one of them seizes me by the collar before i fire if he should hold me for one instant before he falls i shall find myself at the spielberg fabrizio filled with a special horror at the idea of firing first and possibly on an old soldier who had served under his uncle count pietranera ran to hide himself in the hollow trunk of a huge chestnut tree he was putting fresh caps into his pistols when he heard a man coming through the wood singing as he came in a charming voice a delightful air by mercadante then fashionable in italy that's a good omen said fabrizio to himself he listened attentively to the melody and the sound of it wiped out the little touch of anger which had begun to season his arguments he looked carefully up and down the high road and saw nobody the singer will come up some side road thought he to himself almost at that very moment he saw a servant very neatly dressed in the english style ride slowly up the road on a hack leading a very fine blood horse perhaps a trifle too thin ah said fabrizio to himself if i had reasoned like mosca who is perpetually telling me that the risk a man runs always marks the ratio of his rights over his neighbour i should crack this serving man's skull with a pistol shot and once i was on that horse i should snap my fingers at all the gendarmes in the world then as soon as i got back to parma i would send money to the man or his widow but that would be an abominable action 
End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the Chartres of Parma by Stendhal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Ten. Even as he moralized, Fabrizio sprang upon the high road from Lombardy to Switzerland which at this spot is quite four or five feet below the level of the forest if my man takes fright said our hero to himself he will start off at a gallop and i shall be left here looking a sorry fool by this time he was not more than ten paces from the servant who had stopped singing fabrizio read in his eyes that he was frightened perhaps he was going to turn his horses round without any conscious intention fabrizio made a bound and seized the near horse by the bridle my friend said he to the serving man i am not a common thief for i am going to begin by giving you twenty francs but i am obliged to borrow your horse i shall be killed if i do not clear out at once the four brothers riva those great hunters whom you doubtless know are on my heels they have just caught me in their sister's bedroom i jumped out of the window and here i am they have turned out into the forest with their hounds and their guns i had hidden myself in that big hollow chestnut tree because i saw one of them cross the road their hounds will soon be on my track i am going to get on your horse and gallop a league beyond como thence i shall go to milan to cast myself at the viceroy's feet if you consent with a good grace i'll leave your horse at the posting-house with two napoleons for yourself if you make the slightest difficulty i shall kill you with these pistols if when i am once off you set the gendarmes after me my cousin the brave count alari the emperor's equerry will see to your bones being broken for you fabrizio invented his speech as he delivered it which he did in the most gentle manner for the rest he said laughing my name is no secret i am the marchesino ascanio del dongo my home is close by at grianta now then he cried raising his voice let the horse go the stupefied servant said never a word fabrizio put up the pistol he had held in his left hand laid hold of the bridle which the man had dropped sprang on the horse and cantered off when he had ridden three hundred paces he perceived he had forgotten to give him the twenty francs he had promised he pulled up the road was still empty except for the servant who was galloping after him he waved him forward with his handkerchief and when he was within fifty paces threw a handful of silver coins upon the road and started off again looking back from a distance he saw the servant picking up the silver now that really is a sensible man said fabrizio laughing not a useless word did he say he rode rapidly southward halted at a lonely house and started forth again a few hours later by two o'clock in the morning he had reached the lago maggiore he soon saw his boat standing on and off he made the signal agreed on and she approached the shore he could find no peasant with whom he might leave the horse so he turned the noble creature loose and three hours later he was at belgirate once in a friendly country he took some repose he was full of joy for he had been thoroughly successful dare we mention the true cause of his delight his tree was growing splendidly and his soul had been refreshed by the deep emotion he had felt in father blanis's arms does he really believe said he to himself in all the predictions he has made to me or is it that as my brother has given me the reputation of a jacobin a man who knows neither truth nor law and capable of any crime he simply desired to induce me to resist the temptation of taking the life of some villain who may do me an evil turn the day after the next fabrizio was at parma where he vastly entertained the duchess and the count by relating with the greatest exactness as was his wont the whole story of his journey when fabrizio arrived he found the porter and all the servants at the palazzo san severina garbed in the deepest mourning whose loss do we mourn he inquired of the duchess that excellent man who was known as my husband has just died at baden he has left me the palace that was a settled thing but as a proof of his regard he has added a legacy of three hundred thousand francs and this places me in a serious difficulty 
i will not give it up for the benefit of his niece the marchesa raversi who plays me the vilest of tricks every day of her life you who understand art must really find me some good sculptor and i will put up a monument to the duke which shall cost three hundred thousand francs the count began to tell stories about the raversi in vain have i striven to soften her by kindness said the duchess as for the duke's nephews i have had them all made colonels or generals and in return never a month passes without their sending me some abominable anonymous letter i have been obliged to hire a secretary to read all my letters of that description and their anonymous letters are the least of all their sins continued count mosca they carry on a regular manufacture of vile accusations twenty times over i ought to have had the whole set brought before the courts and your excellency turning to fabrizio will guess whether my worthy judges would have condemned them or not well that's what spoils all the rest to me replied fabrizio with that artlessness that sounded so comical at court i would much rather see them sentenced by magistrates who would judge them according to their own consciences if you who travel to improve your mind would give me the addresses of a few such magistrates you would do me a real kindness i would write to them before i went to bed to-night if i were a minister this lack of upright judges would wound my vanity but it strikes me rejoined the count that your excellency who is so fond of the french and once upon a time even lent them the help of your invincible arm is forgetting one of their great maxims it is better to kill the devil than that the devil should kill you i should very much like to see how anybody could govern those eager beings who read the history of the french revolution all day long with judges who would acquit the persons i accused they would end by acquitting rascals whose guilt was perfectly evident and every man of them would think himself a brutus but i have a bone to pick with you does not your sensitive soul feel some remorse concerning that fine horse rather too lean which you have just turned loose on the shores of lac maggiore i certainly intend said fabrizio very gravely to send the owner of the horse whatever sum may be necessary to pay him the expenses of advertising and any others he may have incurred in recovering the beast from the peasants who must have found it i propose to read the milanese newspaper carefully so as to find any advertisement touching a strayed horse i am quite familiar with the appearance of this one he really is primitive said the count to the duchess and what would have become of your excellency he continued laughing if while you were galloping along on that horse's back he had happened to stumble you would have found yourself at the spielberg my dear young nephew and with all my credit i should barely have contrived to get some thirty pounds struck off the weight of the shackles on each of your legs in that delightful retreat you would have spent quite ten years your legs would possibly have swelled and mortified then they would have been neatly cut off for you ah for pity's sake don't carry the wretched story any further broke in the duchess with tears in her eyes he is back and safe and i am even more glad of it than you you may be sure of that responded the minister very gravely but pray since this boy was set on going into lombardy why did he not ask me to get him a passport and a fitting name the moment i heard of his arrest i should have hurried off to milan and my friends there would have been willing enough to close their eyes and pretend their police had taken up one of the prince of parma's subjects the story of your trip is entertaining and amusing enough i am quite ready to admit that the count continued and his tone grew less gloomy your leap on to the high road decidedly enchants me but between ourselves since that serving man held your life in his hands you had a right to deprive him of his we propose to raise your excellency to a brilliant position at least such are the orders this lady gives me and i do not think my bitterest enemies can accuse me of ever having neglected her commands what a heartbreak it would have been to her if that lean horse of yours had happened to make a false step while you were riding a steeplechase upon his back it would almost have been better if he had broken your neck outright you are very tragic to-night dear friend said the duchess quite overcome because tragic events are happening all around us replied the count and he too was moved this is not france where everything ends with a song or a sentence of imprisonment and i really am wrong to laugh when i talk to you of such matters well nephew mine granting that i find a chance some day of making you a bishop for frankly i cannot begin with making you archbishop of parma as the duchess here would very reasonably have me do supposing you were settled in your bishopric 
and far from the sound of our wise counsels tell us what your policy would be i would kill the devil sooner than let him kill me as my friends the french so sensibly say answered fabrizio with shining eyes i would hold the position you gave me by every means even with my pistols i have read the story of our ancestor who built grianta in the del dongo genealogy toward the end of his life his good friend galeazzo duke of milan sent him to inspect a fortified castle on our lake there was some fear of a fresh invasion by the swiss i really must send a civil word to the commandant of the fortress said the duke just as he was dismissing him he wrote two lines and gave him the letter then he took it back it will be more courteous if i seal it said the prince vespasiano del dongo departed but as he was sailing over the lake he remembered an old greek story for he was a learned man he opened his good master's letter and found it was an order to the commandant of the fortress to put him to death the moment he arrived so absorbed had sforza been in his effort to make the deception he had been playing on our ancestor lifelike that he had left a considerable space between the last line of his note and his signature vespasiano del dongo inserted an order to recognize him as governor-general of all the late castles in the blank space and tore the upper part of the letter off when he had reached the fortress and his authority had been duly acknowledged he threw the commandant down a well declared war on sforza and after a few years exchanged his strong castle for the huge estates which have enriched every branch of our family and which will one day benefit me to the extent of four thousand francs a year you talk like an academician said the count laughingly you have told the story of a splendid prank but it is not once in ten years that the delightful opportunity for doing such startling things presents itself a man who may be stupid at times but is watchful and prudent always may often enjoy the pleasure of outwitting men of imagination it was a freak of the imagination that led napoleon to put himself into the hands of the prudent john bull instead of trying to escape to america john bull sat in his counting-house and laughed at the emperor's letter and his reference to themistocles the mean sancho panzas of the world will always triumph over the noble-hearted don quixotes if you will consent not to do anything extraordinary i don't doubt you may be a highly respected if not a highly respectable bishop nevertheless i hold to my previous observation in this matter of the horse your excellency behaved very foolishly you have been within an ace of imprisonment for life fabrizio shuddered at the words he sat on plunged in a deep astonishment was that the imprisonment which threatens me he mused is that the crime i was not to commit father blanus's predictions the prophetic value of which he had despised began to assume all the importance of real omens in his eyes well cried the duchess quite surprised what is the matter with you the count has cast you into a very gloomy reverie the light of a new truth has fallen upon my mind and instead of rebelling against it i am adopting it it is quite true i have been very near a prison that never would have opened its doors again but the servant lad looked so handsome in his english livery it would have been a sin to kill him the count was delighted with his air of youthful wisdom he is satisfactory in every way he said looking at the duchess i must tell you my boy that you have made a conquest and perhaps the most desirable one you could possibly have made ha thought fabrizio now i shall hear some jest about little marietta he was mistaken the count went on your evangelic simplicity has won the heart of our venerable archbishop father landriani one of these days you will be made a grand vicar and the beauty of the joke is that the three present grand vicars all of them men of parts and hard working and two of them i believe grand vicars before you were born are about to send a fine letter to their archbishop begging you may take rank above them all these gentlemen base this request on your virtuous qualities in the first place and in the second on the fact that you are great-nephew to the famous archbishop ascanio del dongo when i heard of the respect your virtues had inspired i instantly promoted the senior grand vicar's nephew to a captaincy he had remained a lieutenant ever since he had served at the siege of tarragona under marshal suchet go at once just as you are in your travelling dress and pay an affectionate call on your archbishop exclaimed the duchess tell him all about your sister's marriage when he knows she is going to be a duchess he will think you more apostolic than ever 
of course you will forget everything the count has just confided to you about your approaching appointment fabrizio hurried off to the archiepiscopal palace his behaviour there was both modest and simple this was a tone he could assume only too easily for him the effort was when he had to play the nobleman while he was listening to monsignor landriani's somewhat lengthy dissertations he kept saying to himself ought i to have fired my pistol at the manservant who was leading the lean horse his reason replied in the affirmative but he could not reconcile his heart to the thought of that handsome young fellow dropping disfigured from the saddle that prison which would have swallowed me up if the horse had stumbled was it the prison with which so many omens threatened me the question was of sovereign importance to him and the archbishop was enchanted with his air of deep attention End of chapter 10chapter eleven of the chartreuse of parma by stendhal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter eleven when fabrizio left the archiepiscopal palace he hurried off to marietta's dwelling in the distance he heard giletti's rough voice he had sent out for wine and was carousing with his friends the prompter and the candle snuffer the mamaccia who performed the functions of a mother to marietta was the only person who answered his signal things have happened while you have been away she cried two or three of our actors have been accused of having held an orgy in honour of the great napoleon's birthday and our unlucky company has been given the name of jacobin so we have been ordered to clear out of the dominion of parma and evviva napoleone but the prime minister is supposed to have paid our reckoning giletti certainly has money in his pocket i don't know how much but i have seen him with a handful of crown pieces the manager has given marietta five crowns for her travelling expenses to mantua and venice and one for mine she is still very much in love with you but she is afraid of giletti three days ago at her last performance he really would have killed her he boxed her ears soundly twice over and what is abominable he tore her blue shawl if you would give her a blue shawl it would be very good-natured of you and we would say we had won it in the lottery the drum-master of the carabineers is holding a competition to-morrow you will see the hour advertised at every street corner come and see us then if giletti goes to the match and we can hope he will stay away for any time i will be at the window and will beckon you to come up try to bring us something very pretty and marietta dotes upon you as he descended the winding stairs that led from the vile garret fabrizio's soul was filled with compunction i am not a bit altered he thought all those fine resolutions i made on the shores of the lake when i looked at life with so much philosophy have flown away i was not in my normal condition then it was all a dream which disappears when i have to face stern realities this would be the moment for action he went on as he re-entered the san severina palace about eleven o'clock at night but in vain did he search his heart for that noble sincerity which had seemed so easy of attainment during the night he had spent on the shores of como i shall displease the person i love best in the world if i speak i shall look like an inferior play-actor i really never am worth anything except in certain moments of excitement the count is wonderfully good to me said he to the duchess after he had given her an account of his visit to the archbishop i value his kindness all the more highly because i fancy i notice that he does not particularly care about me therefore i must be all the more correct in my behaviour to him i know he has excavations at sanguigna in which he still delights judging at least by his expedition the day before yesterday galloping twelve leagues to spend two hours with his workmen he is afraid that if they find fragments of statuary in the antique temple the foundations of which he has just laid bare they may steal them i should like to offer to go and spend thirty-six hours at sanguigna i am to see the archbishop to-morrow about five o'clock i could start in the evening and take advantage of the cool hours of the night for my ride the duchess made no answer at first presently she said to him in a very tender voice 
it looks as if you were seeking pretexts for getting away from me you are hardly back from belgirate and you find out a reason for starting off again here's a fine opportunity for me thought fabrizio but i was a little mad when i was sitting by the lake in my passion for truthfulness i overlooked the fact that my compliment winds up with an impertinence i should have to say i regard you with the most devoted friendship and so on but my heart is not capable of real love is not that tantamount to saying i see you are in love with me but pray take care i cannot return it to you in kind if the duchess has any passion for me she will be vexed at my having guessed it if her feeling for me is one of mere friendship she will be disgusted by my impudence and such offences are never forgiven while he was weighing these important considerations fabrizio was walking quite unconsciously up and down the room looking grave and proud like a man who sees misfortune hovering within ten paces of him the duchess gazed at him with admiration this was not the child she had known from his birth the nephew ever ready to obey her commands this was a serious man a man whose love would be an exquisite possession she rose from the ottoman on which she had been sitting and threw herself passionately into his arms are you bent on leaving me she cried no he said looking like a roman emperor but i want to behave well the phrase was susceptible of several interpretations fabrizio had not the courage to go further and run the risk of wounding the adorable woman before him he was too young too easily moved his mind did not suggest any well-turned expression which might convey his meaning in a fit of passion which was natural enough and in spite of his reason he clasped the charming creature in his arms and rained kisses upon her just at that moment the count's carriage was heard in the courtyard and almost instantly he entered the room he looked quite affected you inspire very strange devotions said he to fabrizio who was almost stunned by the phrase this evening the archbishop was received in audience by the prince as he is regularly every thursday the prince has just informed me that the archbishop who seemed greatly agitated began by making a very prosy speech evidently learned by heart of which the prince could make nothing at all landriani ended by saying that it was important for the sake of the church in parma that monsignore fabrizio del dongo should be appointed his chief grand vicar and afterward as soon as he had reached his five-and-twentieth year his coadjutor and his ultimate successor this idea alarmed me i confess said the count it is somewhat precipitate and i was afraid it might throw the prince into a fit of ill-humour but he looked at me and laughed and said to me in french ce sont là vos coups monsieur i will take my oath before god and your highness i cried with the utmost possible fervour that i was utterly ignorant of this idea of the future succession then i went on to tell the real truth as we talked it over here a few hours since and i added impulsively that i should have considered his highness had conferred an overwhelming favour on me if he had ultimately granted you a modest bishopric to begin with the prince must have believed me for it pleased him to be gracious he said to me in the simplest possible way this is an official affair between me and the archbishop you have nothing whatever to do with it the old gentleman has sent me in a very long and tolerably tiresome report which he winds up with a formal proposal i replied that the individual was still very young and more especially a very new arrival at my court that i should almost look as if i were honouring a letter of credit drawn on me by the emperor if i bestowed the reversion of so high a dignity on the son of one of the great officials of his lombardo venetian kingdom the archbishop protested there had been no pressure of any such kind it was a pretty piece of folly to say that to me it surprised me in a man who is generally so intelligent but he always loses his head completely when he talks to me and to-night he was more nervous than ever which led me to think he passionately desired what he asked for i told him that nobody knew better than myself that there had been no attempt in high quarters to put forward del dongo that nobody about my court denied his powers that his reputation for virtue was a fair one but that i feared he was capable of enthusiasm and that i had made a vow i would never place madmen of that kind on whom rulers never can rely in any exalted position then his highness continued i had to endure a pathetic appeal nearly as long as the first 
the archbishop sang the praises of enthusiasm for god's house bungler said i to myself you are risking the appointment you were very near getting you should have cut it short and thanked me fervently not a bit he went on pouring out his homily with a bravery that was ridiculous i cast about for an answer that would not be too unfavourable to young del dongo's cause i found it and a fairly apposite one as you will perceive monsignore i said pius the seventh was a great pope and a great saint he was the only one of all the sovereigns who dared to say no to the tyrant at whose feet europe grovelled well he was capable of enthusiasm and this led him when he was bishop of imola into writing that famous pastoral of the citizen cardinal chiaramonti in support of the cisalpine republic my poor archbishop was struck dumb and to complete his stupefaction i said to him very gravely farewell monsignore i will take four-and-twenty hours to think over your proposal the poor man added a few more entreaties which were both ill-expressed and considering i had bidden him farewell somewhat inopportune now count mosca della rovere i desire you will inform the duchess that i will not delay for four-and-twenty hours a matter which may give her pleasure sit you down here and write the archbishop the note of approval which will close the whole business i wrote the note he signed it and he said take it to the duchess instantly here madam is the note and to it i owe the happiness of seeing you again to-night the duchess perused the paper with delight while the count had been telling his long story fabrizio had had time to collect himself he did not appear astonished by the incident he took it like a true aristocrat who had always believed in his own right to that extraordinary advancement those lucky chances which might very well throw a common man off his balance he expressed his gratitude but in measured language and ended by saying to the count a good courtier should flatter the ruling passion yesterday you expressed your fear that your workmen at sanguigna might steal the fragments of antique statuary they may unearth i delight in excavations if you will give me leave i will go and look after those workmen to-morrow evening after i have paid the necessary visits to return thanks at the palace and to the archbishop i will start for sanguigna but can you imagine said the duchess any reason for the good archbishop's sudden devotion to fabrizio there is no need of any imagination the grand vicar whose brother is a captain said to me yesterday father landriani argues on this unvarying principle that the holder of the title is superior to the coadjutor and he is beside himself with delight at having a del dongo at his orders and under an obligation conferred by himself everything that draws attention to fabrizio's high birth increases his private satisfaction that is the man he has under him in the second place he likes monsignor fabrizio he does not feel shy in his presence and finally for the last ten years he has been nursing a hearty hatred of the bishop of piacenza who openly avows his expectation of succeeding him at parma and who is besides the son of a miller it is with an eye to his future succession that the bishop of piacenza has entered into close relations with the marchesa raversi and this intimacy makes our archbishop tremble for his pet plan that of seeing a del dongo on his staff and of issuing his orders to him very early on the next morning but one fabrizio was overlooking the workers on the excavations at sanguigna opposite colorno the versailles of the parmese princes these excavations stretched across the plain close to the high road leading from parma to the bridge of casal maggiore the nearest austrian town the workmen were cutting a long ditch along the plain it was eight feet deep and as narrow as might be the object was to find alongside the old roman road the ruins of a second temple which according to local tradition had been still standing in the middle ages notwithstanding the prince's authority many peasants looked with a jealous eye on the long trenches cut across their land in spite of everything they were told they fancied search was being made for some treasure and fabrizio's presence was particularly valuable as a check on any little outbreak on their part he was not at all bored he watched the work with passionate interest now and then some middle was turned up and he was resolved he would not give the labourers time to agree among themselves to pilfer it it was about six o'clock in the morning of a lovely day he had borrowed an old single-barrelled gun he shot at a few larks 
one of them fell wounded on the high road fabrizio when he followed it saw a carriage in the distance coming from parma and travelling toward casal maggiore he had just reloaded his gun when the vehicle a very shabby one came slowly up to him and in it he recognized little marietta with her were the ungainly giletti and the old woman she passed off as her mother giletti took it into his head that fabrizio had set himself thus in the middle of the road gun in hand with the idea of insulting him and perhaps of carrying off little marietta like a bold fellow he jumped out of the carriage instantly in his left hand he grasped a very large and very rusty pistol and in his right a sword still in its scabbard which he was in the habit of wearing when necessity obliged the manager of his company to allot him some nobleman's part in a play ha villain he cried i'm heartily glad to catch you here only a league from the frontier i'll soon settle your business for you your violet stockings won't protect you here fabrizio had been making signs to little marietta and scarcely paying any attention to giletti's jealous shrieks suddenly he saw the muzzle of the rusty pistol within three feet of his own chest he had only time to strike at the pistol with his gun using it as if it had been a stick the pistol went off but nobody was wounded stop you fool shrieked giletti to the vetturino skilfully contriving at the same time to spring at the barrel of his adversary's gun and hold it away from his own body he and fabrizio each tugged at the gun with all his strength giletti who was much the stronger of the two kept slipping one hand over the other toward the lock and had very nearly got possession of the weapon when fabrizio to prevent his using it touched the trigger he had previously noticed that the muzzle was over three inches above giletti's shoulder the shot went off close to the man's ear he was a little startled but pulled himself together in a moment oh ho you'd like to blow my brains out you scoundrel i'll soon settle you giletti threw away the scabbard of his sword and fell upon fabrizio with the most astonishing swiftness fabrizio who was unarmed gave himself up for lost he bolted toward the carriage which had stopped some paces behind giletti and turning to the left he caught hold of the springs ran quickly round it and passed the right-hand door which was open giletti tearing along on his long legs and not having thought of catching at the carriage springs ran several steps in his original direction before he could stop himself just as fabrizio ran past the open door he heard marietta say in an undertone look out for yourself he'll kill you here and at the same moment he saw a great hunting knife fall out of the carriage he bent down to pick it up but just at that moment a sword thrust from giletti touched him on the shoulder when fabrizio stood up he found himself within six inches of giletti who gave him a furious blow in the face with the pommel of his sword so violent was this blow that fabrizio was quite dazed and at that moment he was very near being killed fortunately for him giletti was still too close to be able to thrust at him when fabrizio recovered his wits he took to flight at the top of his speed as he ran he threw away the sheath of the hunting knife and then turning sharp round he found himself within three paces of giletti who was tearing after him giletti was running as fast as he could go fabrizio made a thrust at him and though giletti had time to strike up the hunting knife a little he received the thrust full in his cheek he passed close to fabrizio who felt himself wounded in the thigh this was by giletti's knife which he had found time to open fabrizio made a spring to the right turned round and at last the adversaries found themselves within reasonable fighting distance giletti was swearing furiously ah i'll cut your throat for you you scoundrel of a priest he cried over and over again fabrizio was quite out of breath and could not speak the blow on his face with the pommel of the sword hurt him dreadfully and his nose was pouring blood he parried various blows with his hunting knife and delivered several thrusts without well knowing what he was about he had a sort of vague idea that he was performing in a public assault at arms this idea had been suggested to him by the presence of his workmen who to the number of five and twenty or thirty had formed a ring round them but at a very respectful distance for both of the combatants kept running hither and thither and then rushing upon each other the fight seemed to be growing less fierce the thrusts rather less rapidly exchanged when fabrizio said to himself judging by the way my face hurts me he must have disfigured me stung to fury by the thought he rushed at his enemy holding the hunting knife in front of him the point entered giletti's chest on the right and passed out near his left shoulder 
at the same moment the whole length of giletti's sword ran through the upper part of fabrizio's arm but as the sword slipped beneath the skin the wound was quite a trifling one giletti had fallen just as fabrizio went toward him with his eye on his left hand which held the knife that hand unclosed mechanically and the weapon dropped from its grasp the rascal is dead thought fabrizio to himself he looked at the face the blood was pouring from giletti's mouth fabrizio ran to the carriage have you a looking-glass he cried to marietta marietta very pale was staring at him and did not answer the old woman with the greatest coolness opened a green work bag and handed fabrizio a small mirror about the size of a man's hand with a handle to it fabrizio felt his face all over as he peered into the glass my eyes are all right said he that's a great thing then he looked at his teeth they were not broken then why does it hurt me so he murmured the old woman replied because the top of your cheek has been crushed between giletti's sword and the bone we all have there it's all blue and horribly swelled put on leeches at once and it will be nothing at all ah leeches at once said fabrizio laughing and he recovered his self-possession he saw the workman gathering round giletti looking at him without daring to touch him why don't you help the man he shouted take his coat off him he would have proceeded but raising his eyes he saw some three hundred paces off five or six men advancing along the high road with slow and measured step toward the spot on which he stood those are gendarmes thought he to himself and as there's a man dead they will arrest me and i shall have the pleasure of making my solemn entry into the city of parma with them what a nice story for the courtiers who are the reversi's friends and hate my aunt instantly and as quick as lightning he threw all the money he had in his pockets to the astonished workman and jumped into the carriage prevent those gendarmes from following me he shouted to the men and i will make your fortunes tell them i am innocent that the man attacked me and would have killed me and you he added to the vetturino make your horses gallop you shall have four gold napoleons if you get across the po before those fellows can reach me all right said the vetturino don't be in a fright those men yonder are on foot and if my little horses only trot they will be left far behind as he spoke he shook them up into a gallop our hero was much offended by the coachman's use of the word fright he really had been in a horrible fright after receiving the blow from the sword pommel in his face we may meet people on horseback coming this way said the vetturino thinking of his poor napoleons and the men who are following us may shout to them to stop us this meant reload your weapons ah how brave you are my little abbe cried marietta and she kissed fabrizio the old woman had thrust her head out the window presently she drew it in again nobody is following you sir she said to fabrizio very coolly and there is nobody on the road in front of you you know how precise the austrian police officials are if they see you come galloping up to the embankment beside the po you may be perfectly certain they will stop you fabrizio put his head out of the window you can trot now said he to the coachman then turning to the old woman what passport have you three instead of one replied she and each of them cost us four francs isn't that cruel for poor play actors travelling all the year round here is a passport for signor giletti a dramatic artist that shall be you and here are mariettina's and mine but giletti had all our money in his pocket what is to become of us how much had he said fabrizio forty good crowns of five francs each said the old woman that is to say six crowns and some small change laughed marietta i won't have my little abbe imposed upon is it not quite natural sir returned the old woman with the greatest calmness that i should try to do you out of four-and-thirty crowns what are thirty-four crowns to you and as for us we've lost our protector who is to look after our lodgings now and bargain with the vetturino when we travel and keep everything in order giletti was not a beauty but he was useful and if this child here had not been a fool and fallen in love with you at first sight giletti would never have noticed anything and you would have given us good silver crowns i can assure you we are very poor fabrizio was touched he took out his purse and gave the old woman several gold pieces you see he said that i have only fifteen left so it will be useless to try and get any more out of me little marietta threw her arms round his neck and the old woman kissed his hands the carriage was still trotting slowly forward 
when the yellow barriers striped with black which marked the austrian frontier appeared in sight the old woman addressed fabrizio you would do well to pass on foot with giletti's passport in your pocket we will stop a few minutes on the pretext of making ourselves look tidy and besides the customs officers will open our baggage if you will take my advice you had better walk lazily through casa maggiore even turn into the cafe and drink a glass of brandy once you're out of the village make off the police on austrian territory are devilishly sharp they will soon find out that a man has been killed you are travelling with a passport which does not belong to you for less than that you might get two years in prison when you leave the town turn to the right and get to the banks of the po hire a boat and take refuge at ravenna or ferrara get out of the austrian states as quickly as ever you can two louis will buy you another passport from some custom-house officer this one would be the ruin of you remember you've killed the man fabrizio carefully re-read giletti's passport as he walked toward the bridge of boats at casa maggiore our hero was seriously alarmed he had a vivid recollection of all count mosca had told him concerning the risk he would run if he re-entered austrian territory and only two paces in front of him he saw the fateful bridge which was to admit him to those dominions the capital of which in his eyes was the spielberg but what else was he to do by an express convention between the two states the duchy of modena which bounds the dominion of parma on the south returned all fugitives who passed over its borders the parmese frontier running up into the mountain country near genoa was too distant his misadventure would be known at parma before he could reach those mountains nothing remained to him therefore except the austrian states on the left bank of the po thirty-six hours or two days would probably elapse before there could be time to write to the austrian authorities and request his arrest on the whole fabrizio thought it wiser to burn his own passport which he lighted at the end of his cigar he would be safer on austrian ground as a vagabond than as fabrizio del dongo and there was the possibility of his being searched apart from his very natural repugnance to the idea of staking his life on the unhappy giletti's passport the document itself presented some material difficulties fabrizio's stature did not at the most exceed five foot five instead of the five foot ten described in the passport he was nearly twenty-four and looked younger giletti was thirty-nine we will confess that our hero spent a full half hour walking up and down an embankment on the river close by the bridge of boats before he could make up his mind to go down upon it what advice should i give to another man in my place said he to himself at last clearly to go across it is dangerous to stay in parma a gendarme may be sent in pursuit of the man who has killed another even against his own will fabrizio turned out his pockets tore up all his papers and kept literally nothing except his handkerchief and his cigar case it was important to shorten by every possible means the examination he would have to undergo he thought of a terrible difficulty which might be made and to which he could find no good answer he was going to call himself giletti and all his linen was marked f d fabrizio as will be discovered was one of those unhappy beings who are tortured by their own imaginations a somewhat common weakness among intelligent people in italy a french soldier of equal or even inferior courage would have set about crossing the bridge at once without thinking of any difficulty beforehand and he would have done it with perfect composure whereas fabrizio was very far from being composed when at the far end of the bridge a little man dressed in grey said to him go into the police office and show your passport the office had dirty walls studded with nails on which the officials pipes and greasy hats were hung the big deal writing-table at which they sat was covered with ink-stains and wine-stains two or three big green leather registers also showed stains of every shade of colour and the edges of the pages were blackened by dirty hands on these registers which were piled one upon the other lay three splendid laurel wreaths which had been used the night before in honour of one of the emperor's fete days fabrizio was struck by all these details they sent a pang through his heart this was the price he paid for the splendid luxury and freshness of his beautiful rooms in the palazzo san severina he was obliged to enter the dirty office and stand there like an inferior he was soon to be cross-questioned the official who stretched out a yellow hand to receive his passport 
was a short dark man with a brass jewel in his neckcloth here's a common man in a bad temper said fabrizio to himself he seemed very much surprised when he read the passport and the perusal lasted quite five minutes you've had an accident said he to the stranger looking at his cheek the vetturino upset us over the river embankment then silence fell again and the official cast strange glances at the traveller i have it said fabrizio to himself he's going to tell me that he's sorry to have to give me an unpleasant piece of news and that i am arrested all sorts of wild notions crowded on to our hero's brain his logic at that moment was of the weakest description he thought for instance of bolting through the office door which was standing open i would get rid of my coat i would jump into the po and i have no doubt i could swim across anything is better than the spielberg while he weighed his chances of succeeding in this prank the police officer was looking hard at him their two faces were a study the presence of danger inspires a sensible man with genius raising him so to speak above himself in the case of the man of imagination it inspires him with romances which may indeed be bold but which are frequently absurd our hero's look of indignation under the scrutinizing glance of this police officer with the brass jewellery was something worth seeing if i were to kill him said fabrizio to himself i should be sentenced to twenty years at the galleys or to death that would be far less awful than the spielberg with a chain weighing a hundred and twenty pounds on each foot and eight ounces of bread for my daily food and it would last twenty years so that i should be forty-four before i came out fabrizio's logical mind overlooked the fact that as he had burned his own passport there was nothing to acquaint the police officer with the detail of his being the rebel fabrizio del dongo our hero was tolerably frightened as my readers perceive his alarm would have been far greater if he had been aware of the thoughts passing in the official's mind the man was a friend of giletti's his surprise at seeing his passport in the hands of another person may therefore be imagined his first impulse had been to arrest the stranger then he reflected that very likely giletti had sold the passport to the good-looking young fellow who had probably just got into some scrape at parma if i arrest him said he to himself giletti will get into trouble it will easily be discovered that he has sold his passport but on the other hand what will my superiors say if they find out that i who am a friend of giletti's have countersigned his passport when presented by another person the officer stood up with a yawn and said to fabrizio wait here sir then as was natural to a policeman he added there is a difficulty fabrizio said within himself what there is going to be is my flight the official indeed had left the office leaving the door open and the passport was still lying on the deal table there's no doubt about my danger thought fabrizio to himself i will take up my passport and walk quietly back across the bridge if the gendarme questions me i will tell him i have forgotten to get it countersigned by the police officer at the last village in the dominion of parma the passport was actually in fabrizio's hand when to his inexpressible astonishment he heard the clerk with the brass jewellery say upon my soul i am done up i'm choking with heat i'm going to get a cup of coffee at the cafe when you've finished your pipe just go into the office there's a passport to be signed the traveller is waiting fabrizio who was just stepping out on tiptoe found himself face to face with a good-looking young fellow who was humming a tune and heard him say very good we'll see to their passport i'll oblige them with my flourish where do you wish to go sir to mantua venice and ferrara ferrara let it be answered the official whistling he took up a stamp printed the visa upon the passport in blue ink and rapidly inserted the words mantua venice and ferrara in the blank space left by the stamp then he waved his hand in the air several times signed his name and dipped his pen in the ink again to make his flourish a feat he performed slowly and with infinite care fabrizio watched every motion of his pen the clerk looked complacently at his flourish added five or six dots and then returned the passport to fabrizio saying indifferently a pleasant journey to you sir fabrizio was departing with a rapidity which he was attempting to conceal when he felt himself stopped by a touch on his left arm instinctively his hand sought the handle of his dagger and if he had not seen houses all around him he might have been guilty of a blunder 
the man who had touched his left arm seeing his startled look said apologetically but i spoke to you three times sir and you did not answer have you anything to declare at the custom house i have nothing on me but my handkerchief i am going to shoot with one of my relations quite close by he would have been sorely puzzled if he had been asked to mention that relation's name thanks to the great heat and his own emotions fabrizio was dripping as if he had fallen into the po i am brave enough when i have to do this with play actors but custom-house clerks with brass jewellery drive me beside myself i'll write the duchess a comic sonnet on that subject fabrizio entered the town of casal maggiore and immediately turned to the right down a shabby street leading to the po i am in sore need said he to himself of the assistance of bacchus and ceres and he entered a shop over the door of which a grey cloth hung from a pole on this cloth was inscribed the word trattoria a ragged bedsheet supported by two thin wooden hoops and hanging within three feet of the ground sheltered the door of the trattoria from the direct blaze of the sun within it a half-naked and very pretty woman received our hero respectfully a fact which gave him the keenest satisfaction he lost no time in telling her that he was starving with hunger while the woman was preparing his breakfast a man of about thirty years of age came into the room on his first entrance he made no sign of greeting but suddenly he rose from the bench on which he had cast himself with an easy gesture and said to fabrizio eccellenza la riveresco i salute your excellency fabrizio felt exceedingly cheerful at that moment and instead of at once expecting something gloomy he answered with a laugh and how the devil do you know my excellency what doesn't your excellency recollect ludovico one of the duchess san severina's coachmen at sacca the country house where we went every year i always got fever so i asked my mistress to give me a pension and i retired i am rich now for instead of the pension of twelve crowns a year which was the very most i could have expected my mistress told me that to give me leisure to write sonnets for i am a poet in the vulgar tongue she would allow me four-and-twenty crowns and the signor count told me that if ever i was in need i had only to come and tell him i had the honour of driving monsignore for a stage when he went to make his retreat like a good churchman at the carthusian monastery at vallea fabrizio looked at the man and began to recall him a little he had been one of the smartest coachmen at the casa san severina now that he was rich as he affirmed his only garments were a coarse tattered shirt and a pair of canvas nether garments which hardly reached his knees and had once been dyed black a pair of shoes and a very bad hat completed his costume and further he had not been shaved for a fortnight fabrizio as he ate his omelette chatted with him on absolutely equal terms he thought he perceived that ludovico was his hostess's lover he soon dispatched his meal and then said to ludovico in an undertone i have a word for you your excellency can speak freely before her she is a really good woman said ludovico with a tender glance well then my friends said fabrizio at once i am in trouble and i want your help to begin with there is nothing political about my business i have simply killed a man who tried to murder me because i was speaking to his mistress poor young fellow quoth the hostess your excellency may reckon on me cried the coachman with eyes that shone with the most fervent devotion where does your excellency desire to go to ferrara i have a passport but i would rather not face the gendarmes who may know something of what has happened when did you put the fellow out of the way at six o'clock this morning is there no blood on your excellency's clothes said the hostess i was thinking of that replied the coachman and besides the cloth is too fine such stuff as that is not often seen in our country it would attract attention i will go and buy clothes from the jew your excellency is about my height only thinner for mercy's sake don't call me your excellency that will attract attention yes your excellency replied the coachman as he went out of the shop hello hello shouted fabrizio what about the money come back don't talk of money said the hostess he has sixty-seven crowns which are very much at your service and i she added dropping her voice have forty which i offer you with all my heart one does not always happen to have money about when such accidents as these occur when fabrizio had entered the trattoria he had taken off his coat on account of the heat if anyone should come in that waistcoat of yours might get us into difficulties that fine english cloth would be remarked 
she gave the fugitive one of her husband's waistcoats made of canvas dyed black a tall young man entered the shop through an inner door there was a touch of elegance about his dress this is my husband said the hostess pietro antonio said she to her husband this gentleman is a friend of ludovico's he had an accident this morning on the other side of the river he wants to escape to ferrara oh we'll get him through said the husband very civilly we have carlo giuseppe's boat another weakness of our hero's character which we will confess as frankly as we have related his fright in the police office at the end of the bridge now caused his eyes to brim with tears the absolute devotion he had met with among these peasants moved him deeply he thought too of his aunt's characteristic kind-heartedness he would have liked to have been able to make all these people's fortunes ludovico now came back carrying a bundle good-bye to this other fellow said the husband in the most friendly fashion that's not it at all replied ludovico in a very anxious voice people are beginning to talk about you it was noticed when you left the main street and turned down our vicolo that you hesitated like a man who wanted to hide himself get up quickly to the room above said the husband this room was a very large and handsome one the two windows were filled with grey linen instead of glass it contained four beds each about six feet wide and five feet high and quick and quick said ludovico there's a conceited fool of a gendarme lately arrived here who wanted to make love to the pretty woman below stairs and i warned him that when next he went out patrolling on the roads he would very likely meet a bullet if that dog hears your excellency mentioned he'll want to play us a trick he'll try to get you arrested here so as to bring disrepute on theodolinda's trattoria what ludovico went on when he saw fabrizio's shirt all stained with blood and his wounds tied up with handkerchiefs so the porco defended himself this is enough to get us arrested a hundred times over i didn't buy a shirt unceremoniously he opened the husband's cupboard and handed over one of his shirts to fabrizio who was soon dressed as a rich middle-class countryman ludovico unhooked a net which was hanging on the wall put fabrizio's clothes into the basket for holding the fish ran down the stairs and went swiftly out by a back door fabrizio following him theodolinda he called out as he hurried past the shop hide what we've left upstairs we'll go and wait in the willows and you pietro antonio make haste and send us a boat it will be well paid for ludovico led fabrizio over more than twenty ditches the widest of these were bridged by very long and very elastic wooden boards ludovico pulled these planks over as fast as they crossed them when they reached the last cutting he pulled the plank away eagerly now we can breathe he said that dog of a policeman will have to go more than two leagues round before he can reach your excellency but you've turned white said he to fabrizio i have not forgotten to bring a bottle of brandy i shall be very glad of it the wound in my thigh is beginning to hurt and besides i was in a horrible fright while i was in the police office at the end of the bridge i should think so indeed said ludovico with a bloody shirt like yours i don't understand how you ever dared to go into such a place as for the wounds i know all about that sort of thing i'll take you to a nice cool place where you can sleep for an hour the boat will come to fetch us there if there's a boat to be had if not when you're a little rested we'll go on two short leagues farther and i'll take you to a mill where i can get a boat myself your excellency knows a great deal more than i do my mistress will be in despair when she hears of the accident she will be told you are mortally wounded or perhaps that you have killed the other treacherously the marchesa raversi will not fail to put about every kind of spiteful report to distress my mistress your excellency might write and how shall i send my letter the men at the mill to which we are going earn twelve sous a day they can get to parma in a day and a half that means four francs for the journey and two francs for the wear and tear of their shoes if the message was carried for a poor man like myself it would cost six francs as it will be done for a nobleman i will give twelve when they reached the resting place in a thicket of alder and willow trees very cool and shady ludovico went on an hour's distance to fetch paper and ink heavens how comfortable i am here exclaimed fabrizio fortune farewell i shall never be an archbishop when ludovico returned he found him sound asleep and would not wake him the boat did not come till near sunset as soon as ludovico saw it appearing in the distance he roused fabrizio who wrote two letters your excellency is very much wiser than i am said ludovico with a look of distress 
and i am afraid you will be displeased with me at the bottom of your heart whatever you say if i add a certain thing i am not such an idiot as you think said fabrizio and whatever you may say to me i shall always look upon you as a faithful servant of my aunt's and the man who has done everything in the world to help me out of a very terrible difficulty a good many further protestations were necessary before ludovico could be induced to speak and when he finally made up his mind he began with a preface which lasted quite five minutes fabrizio grew impatient and then he thought whose fault is this the fault of our vanity which this man has seen very clearly from his coach-box at last ludovico's devotion induced him to run the risk of speaking frankly what would not the marchesa raversi give the runner you are going to send to parma for those two letters they are written by your own hand and therefore can be used as evidence against you your excellency will take me for an indiscreet and curious person and besides you will be ashamed perhaps to let the duchess see a poor coachman's handwriting but for the sake of your safety i am forced to speak even if you do think it an impertinence could your excellency dictate those two letters to me then i should be the only person compromised and very little compromised at that for i could always say that you made your appearance in front of me in a field with an inkhorn in one hand and a pistol in the other and ordered me to write give me your hand my dear ludovico cried fabrizio and to convince you i have no desire to keep anything secret from such a friend you shall copy these two letters just as they are ludovico realized the full extent of this mark of confidence and was very much touched by it but at the end of a few lines seeing the boat coming rapidly toward them these letters will be finished more quickly said he to fabrizio if your excellency would take the trouble of dictating them to me as soon as the letters were finished fabrizio wrote an a and a b on the bottom line and on a little scrap of paper which he afterward crumpled up he wrote in french croyez a et b the messenger was to hide this scrap of paper in his clothes when the boat was within hailing distance ludovico shouted to the boatmen using names which were not their own they did not reply but approached the bank about a thousand yards lower down looking about on every side lest any custom-house officer should have caught sight of them i am at your orders said ludovico to fabrizio would you wish me to take the letters to parma myself would you like me to go with you to ferrara to come with me to ferrara is a service which i did not venture to ask of you i shall have to land and try to get into the town without showing my passport i don't mind telling you that i have the greatest repugnance to the idea of travelling under giletti's name and nobody that i can think of except yourself can procure me another passport why did you not speak of that at casal maggiore i know a spy there who would have sold us an excellent passport and not dear either for forty or fifty francs one of the two boatmen who had been born on the right bank of the po and consequently needed no passport to get into parma undertook to deliver the letters ludovico who knew how to handle an oar pledged himself to manage the boat with the other man's assistance lower down the river he said we shall meet several armed police boats and i know how to keep out of their way a dozen times they had to hide themselves in the midst of low islets covered with willows three times they landed to let the empty boat pass in front of the police boats ludovico took advantage of these long spells of idleness to recite several of his sonnets to fabrizio they were good enough as regarded feeling but this was weakened by the form of expression and none of them were worth writing down the curious thing was that the ex-coachman's passions and conception were lively and picturesque but the moment he began to write he grew cold and commonplace the very opposite said fabrizio to himself of what we see in the world there everything is gracefully expressed but the heart has nothing to do with it he discovered that the greatest pleasure he could do to his faithful servant was to correct the spelling of his sonnets when i lend my manuscript to anybody i get laughed at said ludovico but if your excellency would condescend to dictate the spelling of the words to me letter by letter envious people would have to hold their tongues spelling is not genius it was not till the evening of the second day that fabrizio was able to land in perfect safety in an alder copse a league from ponte lago oscuro all the day long he lay hid in a hemp field and ludovico went on to ferrara where he hired a little lodging in the house of a needy jew who at once realized that there was money to be earned if he would hold his tongue in the evening as the darkness was falling 
fabrizio rode into ferrara on a pony he was in urgent need of care the heat on the river had made him ill the knife thrust in his thigh and the sword thrust giletti had given him in the shoulder at the beginning of their fight had both become inflamed and made him fever end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Chartreuse of Parma by Stendhal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twelve. The Jew landlord of their lodgings brought them a discreet surgeon, who soon coming to the conclusion that there was money to be made informed ludovico that his conscience obliged him to report the wounds of the young man whom ludovico called his brother to the police the law is clear he added it is quite evident that your brother has not hurt himself as he declares by falling off a ladder with an open knife in his hand ludovico coldly answered the worthy surgeon to the effect that if he ventured to listen to the promptings of his conscience he ludovico would have the honour before he left ferrara of falling upon him with an open knife in his hand when he related the incident to fabrizio he blamed him severely but there was not an instant to be lost about decamping ludovico told the jew he was going to try what an airing would do for his brother he fetched a carriage and our friends left the house never to return to it again my readers doubtless find these descriptions of all the steps necessitated by the lack of a passport very lengthy but in italy and especially in the neighbourhood of the po everybody's talk is about passports as soon as they had slipped safely out of ferrara as if they were merely taking a drive ludovico dismissed the carriage re-entered the town by a different gate and then came back to fetch fabrizio in a sediola which he had hired to take them twelve leagues when they were near bologna our friends had themselves driven across country to the road leading into the city from florence they spent the night in the most wretched tavern they could discover and the next morning as fabrizio felt strong enough to walk a little they entered bologna on foot giletti's passport had been burned the actor's death must now be known and it was less dangerous to be arrested for having no passport than for presenting one belonging to a man who had been killed ludovico knew several servants in great houses at bologna it was agreed that he should go and collect intelligence from them he told them he had come from florence with his young brother who being overcome with sleep had let him start alone an hour before sunrise they were to have met in the village where ludovico was to halt during the sultry midday hours but when his brother did not arrive ludovico had resolved to retrace his steps he had found him wounded by a blow from a stone and several knife thrusts and robbed into the bargain by people who had picked a quarrel with him the brother was a good-looking young fellow he could groom and manage horses and would be glad to take service in some great house ludovico intended to add if necessity should arise that when fabrizio had fallen down the thieves had taken to flight and had carried off a little bag containing their linen and their passports when fabrizio reached bologna he felt very weary and not daring to go into an inn without a passport he turned into the large church of san petronio it was deliciously cool within the building and he soon felt quite recovered ungrateful wretch that i am said he to himself suddenly i walk into a church and just sit myself down as if i were in a cafe he threw himself on his knees and thanked god fervently for the protection he had so evidently extended to him since he had had the misfortune of killing giletti the danger which still made him shudder was that of being recognized in the police office at casal maggiore how was it he thought that the clerk whose eyes were so full of suspicion and who read my passport three times over did not perceive that i am not five foot ten tall that i am not eight and thirty years old and that i am not deeply pitted with the smallpox what mercies do i owe thee o oh my god and i have waited until now to lay my nothingness at thy feet my pride would fain have believed it was to vain human prudence that i owed the happiness of escaping the spielberg which was already yawning to engulf me 
more than an hour did fabrizio spend in the deepest emotion at the thought of the immense goodness of the most high he did not hear ludovico approach him and stand in front of him fabrizio who had hidden his face in his hands raised his head and his faithful servant saw the tears coming down his cheeks come back in an hour said fabrizio to him with some asperity ludovico forgave his tone in consideration of his piety fabrizio recited the seven penitential psalms which he knew by heart several times over making long pauses over the verses applicable to his present position fabrizio asked pardon of god for many things but it is a remarkable fact that it never occurred to him to reckon among his faults his plan of becoming an archbishop simply and solely because count mosca was the prime minister and considered this dignity and the great position it conferred suitable for the duchess's nephew he had not indeed desired the thing at all passionately but still he had considered it exactly as he would have considered his appointment to a ministry or a military command the thought that his conscience might be involved in the duchess's plan had never struck him this is a remarkable feature of the teaching he owed to the jesuits at milan this form of religion deprives men of courage to think of unaccustomed matters and more especially forbids self-examination as the greatest of all sins a step towards protestantism to discover in what one is guilty one must ask questions of one's priest or read the list of sins as printed in the book entitled preparation for the sacrament of penitence fabrizio knew the latin list of sins which he had learned at the ecclesiastical academy at naples by heart and when as he repeated this list he came to the word murder he had honestly accused himself before god of having killed a man though in defence of his own life he had run rapidly and without the smallest attention through the various clauses relating to the sin of simony the purchase of ecclesiastical dignities with money if he had been invited to give a hundred louis to become grand vicar to the archbishop of parma he would have shrunk from the idea with horror but although he neither lacked intelligence nor more especially logic it never once came into his head that the employment of count mosca's credit in his favour constituted a simony herein lies the triumph of the jesuits teaching it instils the habit of paying no attention to things which are as clear as day a frenchman brought up amid parisian self-interest and scepticism might honestly have accused fabrizio of hypocrisy at the very moment when our hero was laying open his heart before his god with the utmost sincerity and the deepest possible emotion fabrizio did not leave the church until he had prepared the confession which he had resolved to make the very next morning he found ludovico sitting on the steps of the huge stone peristyle which rises on the great square before the facade of san petronio just as the air is purified by a great thunderstorm so fabrizio's heart felt calmer happier and so to speak cooler i am much better i hardly feel my wounds at all he said as he joined ludovico but first of all i must ask your forgiveness i answered you crossly when you came to speak to me in the church i was examining my conscience well how does our business go it's going right well i've engaged a lodging not at all worthy of your excellency indeed kept by the wife of one of my friends who is a very pretty woman and in close intimacy besides with one of the principal police agents to-morrow i shall go and report that our passports have been stolen this declaration will be well received but i shall pay the postage of a letter which the police will send to casa maggiore to inquire whether there is a man there of the name of san michele who has a brother named fabrizio in the service of the duchess san severina of parma it's all done siamo a cavallo an italian proverb meaning we are saved fabrizio had suddenly become very grave he asked ludovico to wait for him a moment returned to the church almost at a run and had hardly got inside when he cast himself once more upon his knees and humbly kissed the stone pavement this is a miracle he cried with tears in his eyes thou sawest my soul ready to return to the path of duty and thou hast saved me o god i may be killed some day in a scuffle remember o lord when my dying moment comes the condition of my heart at this moment in a passion of the liveliest joy fabrizio once more recited the seven penitential psalms 
before he left the church he approached an old woman who sat in front of a great madonna and beside an iron triangle set vertically on a support of the same metal the edges of this triangle bristled with little spikes destined to support the small tapers which the faithful burn before cimabue's famous madonna only seven tapers were burning when fabrizio approached he noted the fact in his memory so as to reflect upon it when he should have time how much do the tapers cost said he to the woman two by occhi each and indeed they were no thicker than a penholder and not a foot high how many tapers will your triangle hold sixty-three since there are seven already ha ah, said fabrizio sixty-three and seven make seventy i must remember that too he paid for the tapers set up and lighted the first seven himself and then knelt down to make his offering as he rose from his knees he said to the old woman it is for a mercy bestowed i am dying of hunger said fabrizio to ludovico as he rejoined him don't let us go into a tavern let us go to the lodgings said his servant the mistress of the house will go out and buy you what you want for breakfast she'll cheat us out of a score of sous and that will make her feel all the more kindly to the new arrival that means that i shall have to go on starving for another hour said fabrizio laughing as merrily as a child and he entered a tavern close to san petronio to his extreme astonishment he beheld sitting at a table close to his own his aunt's principal manservant pepe the very man who had once been sent to meet him at geneva fabrizio signed to him to keep silence then after a hasty repast with a happy smile trembling on his lips he rose to his feet pepe followed him and for the third time our hero passed into san petronio ludovico discreetly held back and walked up and down the square oh monsignore how are your wounds the duchess is in dreadful anxiety for one whole day she believed you were dead and cast away on some island in the river i must send a messenger to her instantly i have been hunting for you for six days i spent three of them at ferrara going to all the inns have you a passport for me i have three one with all your excellency's names and titles one with nothing but your name and the third with a false name giuseppe bossi each of the passports will serve your excellency's purpose whether you choose to arrive from florence or from modena all you have to do is walk out beyond the town the count would be glad if you would lodge at the albergo del pellegrino which is kept by a friend of his fabrizio walked as though by chance up the right aisle of the church to the spot where his tapers were burning he fixed his eyes on the cima boy madonna then kneeling down he said to pepe i must thank god for a moment pepe followed his example as they left the church pepe noticed that fabrizio gave a twenty franc piece to the first beggar who asked charity of him the beggar set up a shout of gratitude which attracted the crowds of indigent people of every sort who generally collect on the square of san petronio all round the charitable donor everybody wanted his or her share of the napoleon the women despairing of getting through the press round the lucky mendicant fell upon fabrizio shrieking to him to say it was true he had given his gold piece to be divided among all the poor beggars pepe brandished his gold-headed cane and ordered them to leave his excellency alone oh your excellency screamed all the women at once even louder than before give the poor women another gold piece fabrizio quickened his pace the women ran after him calling aloud and many male beggars ran up from side streets so that quite a little disturbance ensued the whole of the filthy and noisy crowd kept shouting your excellency fabrizio found it by no means easy to get out of the press the scene recalled his imagination to earth i am only getting what i deserve thought he i have been rubbing shoulders with the common folk two of the women followed him as far as the saragossa gate through which he passed out of the town there pepe stopped them by threatening them seriously with his cane and throwing them some small coins fabrizio climbed the pretty hill of san michele in bosco walked partly round the town outside the walls turned into a footpath which five hundred paces farther on ran into the road from florence returned to bologna and gravely presented a passport containing a very accurate description of his person to the police commissary this passport described him as giuseppe bossi student of theology 
fabrizio noticed a little splash of red ink that seemed to have been dropped by accident on the lower right-hand corner of the paper two hours later he had a spy upon his heels on account of the title your excellency applied to him by his companion in the presence of the beggars at san petronio although his passport detailed none of these honours which entitled a man to be addressed as excellency by his servants fabrizio perceived the spy and snapped his fingers at him he gave not a thought now either to passports or police officers and was amused as a child with everything about him when pepe who had been ordered to stay with him saw how well pleased he was with ludovico he thought his own best course was to carry the good news to the duchess himself fabrizio wrote two long letters to his dear ones then he bethought him of writing a third to the venerable archbishop landriani this letter produced the most extraordinary effect it contained the exact history of his fight with giletti the good archbishop quite overcome by his emotion did not fail to go and read the letter to the prince whose curiosity to know how the young monsignore would set about excusing so terrible a murder made him willing to listen thanks to the marchesa raversi's many friends the prince like the whole city of parma believed fabrizio had obtained the assistance of some twenty or thirty peasants to kill an inferior actor who had ventured to dispute his possession of little marietta at despotic courts truth lies at the mercy of the first clever schemer just as in paris it is ruled by fashion but devil take it said the prince to the archbishop one has those things done by a third person it is not customary to do them oneself and then actors like giletti are not killed they are bought fabrizio had not the smallest suspicion of what was going on at parma as a matter of fact the death of a player who only earned thirty-two francs a month in his lifetime was going near to overthrow the ultra ministry with count mosca at its head when the news of giletti's death reached him the prince nettled by the airs of independence which the duchess gave herself had ordered rassi his minister of justice to deal with the whole trial as if the accused person had been a liberal fabrizio for his part believed that a man of his rank was above all law the fact that in countries where the bearers of great names are never punished there is nothing that cannot be achieved even against such persons by intrigue had not entered into his calculations he would often talk to ludovico of his perfect innocence which was soon to be proclaimed his great argument was that he was not guilty at last one day ludovico said to him i cannot conceive why your excellency who is so clever and knows so much takes the trouble of saying such things to me who am his devoted servant your excellency is too cautious such things are only good for use in public or before the judges this man believes i am a murderer and he does not love me the less mused fabrizio thunderstruck three days after pepe's departure fabrizio was astonished to receive a huge letter bound with a silken cord like those used in louis the fourteenth's time and addressed to his most reverend excellency monsignore fabrizio del dongo chief grand vicar of the diocese of parma canon etc etc but am i all that already he said to himself with a laugh archbishop landriani's epistle was a masterpiece of perspicacity and logic it covered no less than nineteen large sheets and gave a very good account of everything that had happened at parma with regard to giletti's death the march of a french army on the town under the command of marshal ney would not have made more stir wrote the good archbishop every soul my very dear son except the duchess and myself believes you killed the actor giletti because you wanted to do it if that misfortune had befallen you it would have been one of those matters that can be hushed up by means of a couple of hundred louis and an absence of six months but the raversi is bent on using the incident to overthrow count mosca it is not the terrible sin of murder for which the public blames you it is simply for your awkwardness or rather insolence in not having condescended to employ a bulo a kind of inferior bully i give you the clear substance of the talk i hear all round me for since this most deplorable event i go every day to three of the most important houses in this city so as to find opportunity for justifying you and never have i felt i was making a holier use of what little eloquence heaven has bestowed on me the scales began to fall from fabrizio's eyes the numerous letters he received from the duchess 
all throbbing with affection never condescended to report anything of what was happening around her the duchess assured him she would leave parma forever unless he soon returned there in triumph the count she wrote in a letter which reached him together with the archbishops will do all that is humanly possible for you as for me this last prank of yours has changed my nature i have grown as stingy as tombone the banker i have discharged all my workmen i have done more i have dictated the inventory of my belongings to the count and i find i have very much less than i thought after the death of that excellent pietranera whose murder by the way you would have done far better to avenge than to risk your life against such a creature as giletti i was left with twelve hundred francs a year and debts amounting to five thousand among other things i remember i had thirty pairs of white satin slippers which had come from paris and only one single pair of walking shoes i have almost made up my mind to take the three hundred thousand francs the duke left me and which i had intended to lay out entirely on a magnificent monument to his memory for the rest it is the marchesa raversi who is your bitterest enemy and therefore mine if you are bored at bologna you have only to say one word and i will go to you there here are four more bills of exchange the duchess never told fabrizio a word about the opinions concerning his business which prevailed at parma her first object was to console him and in any case the death of such an absurd person as giletti did not strike her as matter of any serious reproach to a del dongo how many gilettis have our ancestors sent into the next world she would say to the count and nobody ever dreamed of finding fault with them for it fabrizio filled with astonishment and perceiving for the first time the real condition of things set himself to study the archbishop's letter unfortunately the archbishop himself believed him better informed than he really was as fabrizio understood the matter the marchesa raversi's triumph rested on the impossibility of discovering any eye-witnesses of the fatal scuffle his own servant who had been the first to bring the news to parma had been inside the village tavern at sanguigna when the incident occurred little marietta and the old woman who acted as her mother had disappeared and the marchesa had bought over the man who had driven the carriage and who was now making a deposition of the most abominable kind although the proceedings are wrapped in the deepest mystery wrote the good archbishop in his ciceronian style and directed by rassi of whom christian charity forbids me to speak evil but who has made his fortune by pursuing unfortunate beings accused of crime even as the hound pursues the hare though rassi i say whose baseness and venality you cannot overrate has been charged with the management of the trial by an angry prince i have obtained a sight of the vetturino's three depositions by a signal piece of good fortune the wretch has flatly contradicted himself and i will add seeing i speak to my vicar-general who will rule this diocese when i am gone that i sent for the priest of the parish in which this wandering sinner dwells i will confide to you my very dear son though under the secret of the confessional that the priest already knows through the vetturino's wife the actual number of crowns her husband has received from the marchesa raversi i will not dare to say that the marchesa has insisted on his slandering you but that is very likely the crowns were paid over by a miserable priest who performs very dubious functions in the marchesa's service and whom i have been obliged for the second time to prohibit from saying mass i will not weary you with the recital of several other steps which you might fairly have expected from me and which in indeed it was only my duty to take a canon a colleague of yours at the cathedral who is occasionally too apt to remember the influence conferred on him by the possession of the family fortune of which by god's will he has become the sole inheritor ventured to say in the house of Kabzurla, minister of the interior that he considered this trifle clearly proved against you he was speaking of the unhappy giletti's murder i summoned him to my palace and there in presence of my three other vicars-general of my chaplain and of two priests who happened to be in my waiting-room i requested him to enlighten us his brothers as to the grounds on which he based the complete conviction he declared himself to have acquired of the guilt of one of his colleagues at the cathedral the only reasons the poor wretch could articulate were very inconclusive every one present rose up against him and although i did not think it necessary to add more than very few words 
he burst into tears and before us all made a full confession of his complete error whereupon i promised him secrecy in my own name and that of all those who had been present at the conference on condition however that he should use all his zeal to rectify the false impression produced by the remarks he had been making during the past fortnight i will not repeat my dear son what you must have known for long that out of the four-and-thirty peasants working on count mosca's excavation and who according to the reversi were paid to assist you in your crime thirty-two were hard at work at the bottom of their ditch at the moment when you seized the hunting knife and used it to defend your life against the man who had so unexpectedly attacked you two of them who were not in the ditch shouted to them he is murdering monsignore this one exclamation is a brilliant testimony to your innocence well rassi declares that these two men have disappeared and further eight of the men who were in the trench have been found when they were first examined six of them declared that they had heard the shout he is murdering monsignore i know indirectly that when they were examined for the fifth time yesterday evening five of them asserted that they could not remember whether they had actually heard the exclamation or whether they had been told of it afterward by one of their comrades orders have been given which will make me acquainted with the localities in which these workmen live and their priest will make them understand that if they allow themselves to be tempted to wrest the truth for the sake of earning a few crowns they will be damned everlastingly the good archbishop proceeded with infinite detail as may be judged by what we have already reported then he added these lines in latin this business is nothing less than an attempt to turn out the ministry if you are sentenced it can only be to the galleys or to execution in that case i should intervene and declare with all the weight of my archiepiscopal authority that i know you to be innocent that you have simply defended your life against a rascal and further that i have forbidden you to return to parma as long as your enemies triumph there i even propose to brand the minister of justice as he deserves the hatred felt for that man is as common as esteem for his character is rare but on the eve of the day whereon the minister pronounces so unjust a sentence the duchess of san severina will leave the city and perhaps even the dominion of parma in that case no one doubts that the count will immediately hand in his resignation then most probably general fabio conti will be made minister and the marchesa raversi will triumph the great difficulty about your business is that no capable man has been placed in charge of the steps indispensable for the demonstration of your innocence and for the frustration of the attempts being made to suborn witnesses the count thinks he is doing this himself but he is too great a gentleman to condescend to certain details and besides his position as minister of police obliged him at the very outset to issue the severest orders against you and finally dare i say it our sovereign master believes you guilty or simulates the belief at all events and imports a certain bitterness into the affair the words corresponding to our sovereign master and simulates the belief were in greek characters and fabrizio was infinitely grateful to the archbishop for having dared to write them at all he cut the line out of the letter with his penknife and instantly destroyed it twenty times over fabrizio broke off in the perusal of this letter he was filled with the deepest and most lively gratitude and instantly wrote a letter of eight pages in reply often he had to lift his head so as to prevent the tears from dripping on the paper the next morning just as he was about to seal his missive he bethought him that it was too worldly in tone i will write it in latin said he to himself it will seem more correct to the worthy archbishop but while he was striving to turn fine long latin phrases careful imitations of cicero he remembered that one day when the archbishop had been speaking to him of napoleon he had made it a point to call him bonaparte that instant every trace of the emotion which only the night before had affected him even to tears fled utterly o oh, king of italy he cried the faith so many swore to you in your lifetime shall be kept by me now that you are no more he cares for me no doubt but that is because i am a del dongo and he the son of a common man so that his fine italian letter might not be wasted fabrizio made some necessary changes in it and dispatched it to count mosca that very same day fabrizio met little marietta in the street she reddened with delight and signed to him to follow without speaking to her 
she took her way swiftly toward a lonely portico once there she drew forward the black lace which covered her head in the fashion of that country so that no one could recognize her and then turning round sharply how is it said she to fabrizio that you are walking about freely in the streets fabrizio told her his story great heavens you have been to ferrara and i have been hunting for you everywhere you must know that i quarrelled with the old woman because she wanted to take me to venice where i know quite well you would never go because you were on the austrian blacklist i sold my gold necklace to get to bologna something told me i should have the happiness of meeting you here and the old woman arrived two days after me i would not advise you to visit us because she would make more of those shabby attempts to get money out of you of which i am so ashamed we have lived here very comfortably since that fatal day you know of and we have not spent a quarter of what you gave her i should not like to go to see you at the albergo del pellegrino that would be a publicity try to hire some little room in a lonely street and at the ave maria nightfall i will be here under this same portico having said these words she took to flight End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the chartres of parma by stendhal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter thirteen the unexpected appearance of this charming young person drove every serious thought away fabrizio lived on at bologna with a sense of the deepest delight and security his artless propensity to find happiness in anything which filled his life betrayed itself in his letters to the duchess and to such a point as to annoy her fabrizio hardly noticed it only he noted in abbreviated signs on the dial plate of his watch when i write to the duchess i must never say when i was a prelate when i was a churchman it vexes her he had bought a pair of ponies with which he was very much pleased and harnessed them to a hired chaise whenever little marietta had a fancy to go and see one of the delightful spots in the neighbourhood of bologna almost every evening he drove her to the reno cascade on the way back he would stop at the house of the good-natured crescentini who rather believed himself to be marietta's father faith said fabrizio to himself if this be the cafe life which struck me as being so absurd for any serious man to lead i did wrong to turn up my nose at it he forgot that he never went near a cafe except to read the constitutionnel and that as he was utterly unknown to any one in bologna the pleasures of vanity had nothing to do with his present state of felicity when he was not with little marietta he was to be seen at the observatory where he was attending a course of astronomy the professor had taken a great fancy to him and fabrizio would lend him his horses on a sunday so that he and his wife might go and ruffle it in the corso of the montagnola he had a horror of making any one unhappy however unworthy the person might be marietta would not hear of his seeing the mamacha but one day when she was in church he went up to the old woman's room she flushed with anger when she saw him enter i must play the del dongo here said fabrizio to himself how much does marietta earn a month when she has an engagement he called out with very much the same air as that with which a self-respecting young parisian takes his seat in the balcon at the opera bouffe fifty crowns you lie as usual tell me the truth or by god you'll not get a centime well she was earning twenty-two crowns in our company at parma when we were so unlucky as to meet you i earned twelve crowns and we each gave giletti our protector a third of our earnings on that giletti made marietta a present almost every month something like two crowns you lie again you only earned four crowns but if you are good to marietta i will engage you as if i were an impresario you shall have twelve crowns for yourself every month and twenty-two for her but if i see her eyes red once i shall go bankrupt you're mighty proud of yourself well let me tell you your fine generosity is ruining us rejoined the old woman furiously we are losing l'aviamento our custom 
when we have the crushing misfortune of losing your excellency's protection no comedy company will know anything about us they will all be full we shall find no engagement and thanks to you we shall die of hunger go to the devil said fabrizio departing i will not go to the devil you ungodly wretch but i will go straight to the police and they shall know from me that you are a monsignore who has cast away his cassock and the giuseppe bossi is no more your name than it's mine fabrizio had already descended several steps he turned and came back in the first place the police probably know my real name better than you do but if you venture to denounce me if you dare to do anything so infamous he said very seriously ludovico will talk to you and it will not be six knife thrusts that you will have in your old carcass but four times six and you will spend six months in hospital and without tobacco the hag turned pale rushed at fabrizio's hand and tried to kiss it i accept what you are ready to do for me and marietta thankfully you looked so good-natured that i took you for a simpleton and consider this well other people might make the same mistake i would advise you to look more like a great gentleman as a rule then she added with the most admirable impudence you will think over this piece of good advice and as winter is not far off you will make marietta and me each a present of a good coat of that fine english stuff in the big shop on the piazza san petronio the pretty marietta's love offered fabrizio all the charms of the most tender friendship and this made him think of the happiness of the same description he might have found in the company of the duchess but is it not a very comical thing said he to himself that i am not capable of that exclusive and passionate preoccupation which men call love amid all my chanced liaison at novara or at naples did i ever meet a woman whose presence i preferred even in the earliest days to a ride on a good-looking horse that i had never mounted before can it be he added that what is called love is yet another lie i love of course just as i am hungry at six o'clock in the evening can it be that this somewhat vulgar propensity is what these liars have lifted into the love of othello and the love of tancred or must i believe that my organization is different from that of other men what if no passion should ever touch my heart that would be a strange fate at naples especially toward the close of his residence there fabrizio had met women who proud of their rank their beauty and the worldly position of the adorers they had sacrificed to him had tried to govern him at the very first inkling of their plans fabrizio had broken with them in the promptest and most scandalous manner now said he if i ever allow myself to be carried away by the pleasure of being on good terms with that pretty woman known as the duchess san severina i am exactly like the blundering frenchman who killed the hen that laid the golden eggs to the duchess i owe the only happiness with which a tender feeling has ever inspired me my affection for her is my life and besides apart from her what am i a miserable exile condemned to a hand-to-mouth existence in a ruinous castle near novara i remember that when the great autumn rains came i used to be obliged to hey, fasten an umbrella over the head of my bed for fear of accidents i used to ride the agent's horses and he just allowed it out of respect for my blue blood and my muscular strength but he was beginning to think i had stayed there too long my father allowed me twelve hundred francs a year and thought himself damned because he was supporting a jacobin my poor mother and my sisters went without gowns so as to enable me to make some trifling presents to my mistresses this kind of generosity used to wring my heart and besides my state of penury was beginning to be suspected and the young nobleman in the neighbourhood would soon have been pitying me sooner or later some coxcomb would have betrayed his scorn for a poor and unsuccessful jacobin for in their eyes i was nothing else i should have bestowed or received some hearty sword thrust which would have brought me to the fortress of fenestrella or forced me to take refuge in switzerland once more still with my twelve hundred francs a year to the duchess i owe the happiness of having escaped all these ills and further she it is who feels for me those transports of affection which i ought to feel for her instead of the ridiculous and shabby existence which would have turned me into that sorry animal a fool i have spent four years in a great city and with an excellent carriage which has prevented me from feeling envy and other low provincial sentiments this aunt in her extreme kindness is always scolding me because i do not draw enough money from her banker shall i spoil this admirable position forever shall i lose the only friend i have in the world 
all i have to do is to tell her a lie and say to a charming woman who probably has not her equal in the world and for whom i have the most passionate regard i love you this from me who do not know what real love means she would spend whole days reproaching me with the absence of those transports which i have never known now marietta who can not see into my heart and who takes a caress for an outburst of passion thinks me madly in love with her and believes herself the happiest of living women as a matter of fact the only slight acquaintance that i have ever had with that tender absorption which is i believe denominated love was for that young girl anakin at the inn at zonders near the belgian frontier it is with much regret that we must here relate one of fabrizio's worst actions in the middle of his tranquil life a foolish sting to his vanity took possession of the heart which love could not vanquish and carried him quite off his feet living in bologna at the same time as himself was the celebrated fausto f so and so undoubtedly one of the first singers of our time and perhaps the most capricious woman ever seen the gifted venetian poet burati had written a famous satirical sonnet concerning her which at that time was in the mouth of every one from princes to the lowest urchins in the street to will and not to will to adore and detest in one and the same day to find no happiness save in inconstancy to scorn that which the world adores so long as the world adores it fausta has all these faults and many more wherefore never cast your eyes upon the serpent if once thou seest her o oh, imprudent man all her caprices are forgotten if thou hast the happiness of hearing her thou forgettest even thyself and love at that moment makes of thee what circe once made the comrades of ulysses just at that moment this miracle of beauty was so fascinated by the huge whiskers and overweening insolence of the young count m that even his abominable jealousy did not revolt her fabrizio saw the count in the streets of bologna and was nettled by the air of superiority with which he swaggered along the pavements and graciously condescended to show off his charms before the public the young man was very rich believed he might venture anything and as his prepotency had earned him several threats he hardly ever appeared unaccompanied by eight or ten bully a sort of ruffian who wore his liveries and came from his property near brescia once or twice when he had chanced to hear the fausta sing fabrizio had crossed glances with the doughty count he was astonished by the angelic sweetness of her voice he had never dreamed of anything like it it gave him sensations of supreme delight a fine contrast to the placidity of his existence can this at last be love said he to himself full of curiosity to feel the passion and amused too by the idea of braving the count who looked far more threatening than any drum major our hero committed the childish folly of appearing much too frequently in front of the palazzo tanari in which the count had installed the fausta one day toward nightfall fabrizio who was trying to make fausta look at him was greeted by shrieks of laughter evidently intentional from the count's bully who were standing round the door of the palace he hurried home armed himself well and returned fausta hidden behind her sun-blinds was expecting this return and noted it down to his credit the count who was jealous of everybody on earth became especially jealous of signor giuseppe bossi and indulged in all sorts of absurd threats whereupon our hero sent him a letter every morning containing nothing but these words signor giuseppe bossi destroys vermin and lives at the pellegrino in the via larga number seventy nine count m inured to the respect insured him everywhere by his great fortune his blue blood and the bravery of his thirty serving men refused to understand the language of this little note fabrizio wrote more notes to the fausta m set spies upon his rival who was not perhaps unpleasing to the lady he first of all learned his real name and that for the moment at all events he did not dare to show his face in parma a few days later count m with his bully his splendid horses and fausta all departed to parma fabrizio warming to the game followed them next morning in vain did the faithful ludovico remonstrate pathetically with him fabrizio would not listen and ludovico who was a brave man himself admired him for it besides this journey would bring him nearer to his own pretty mistress at casa maggiore 
by ludovico's care eight or ten old soldiers who had served in napoleon's regiments entered signor giuseppe bossi's service nominally as servants if said fabrizio to himself when i commit this folly of going after the fausta i only hold no communication with the minister of police count mosca nor with the duchess i risk no one but myself later on i will tell my aunt that i did it all in search of love that beautiful thing that i have never been able to discover the fact is that i do think about the fausta even when i don't see her but is it the memory of her voice that i love or is it her person as he had given up all thoughts of the church as a career fabrizio had grown moustaches and whiskers almost as tremendous as those of count m and these somewhat disguised him he established his headquarters not at parma that would have been too imprudent but in a village hard by on the road to sacca where his aunt's country home was situated advised by ludovico he gave himself out in the village as the valet of a very eccentric english nobleman who spent a hundred thousand francs a year on sport but who was shortly to arrive from the lake of como where he was detained by the trout fishing fortunately the pretty little palace which count m had hired for the fair fausta stood at the southernmost end of the town of parma and just on the sacca road and fausta's windows looked on to the fine avenues of tall trees which stretch away below the high tower of the citadel fabrizio was not known in that lonely quarter of the town he did not fail to have count m followed and one day when he had just left the exquisite singer's house fabrizio was bold enough to appear in the street in broad daylight he was well armed indeed and mounted on an excellent horse musicians such as are constantly found in the italian streets and who occasionally are very good indeed ranged themselves with their instruments under the fausta's windows and after some introductory chords sang very fairly a cantata in her honour fausta appeared at the window and her attention was easily caught by a very courteous young gentleman who first of all saluted her and then began to bombard her with the most significant glances in spite of the exaggeratedly english dress fabrizio had donned she soon recognized the sender of the passionate letters which had brought about her departure from bologna this is a strange being said she to herself i fancy i am going to fall in love with him i have a hundred louis in my pocket i can very well afford to break with the terrible count he really has no intelligence and there is nothing novel about him the only thing that rather entertains me is the frightful appearance of his followers the next morning fabrizio having heard that the fausta went to mass every day about eleven o'clock in that very church of san giovanni which contained the tomb of his great-uncle the archbishop ascanio del dongo ventured to follow her there it must be said that ludovico had provided him with a fine english wig of the brightest red hair apropos to the colour of these locks that of the flame which devoured his heart he wrote a sonnet which delighted the fausta an unknown hand laid it carefully on her piano this manoeuvring went on for quite a week but fabrizio felt that in spite of all his various efforts he was making no real progress fausta refused to receive him he had overdone his eccentricity and she has since acknowledged that she was afraid of him fabrizio still retained a faint hope of arriving at the sensation which is known as love but in the meanwhile he was very often sorely bored sir let us take ourselves off said ludovico to him over and over again you are not the least in love your coolness and reasonableness are quite hopeless and besides you make no progress whatever let us decamp for very shame in the first flush of disgust fabrizio was on the very point of departing then he heard that the fausta was to sing at the duchess san severina's house perhaps that sublime voice will really set my heart on fire at last thought he and he actually dared to introduce himself in disguise into his aunt's palace where everyone knew him the emotion of the duchess may be imagined when quite toward the end of the concert she noticed a man in a chasseur's livery standing near the door of the great drawing-room something in his appearance stirred her memory she sought count mosca and it was not until then that he informed her of fabrizio's extraordinary and really incomprehensible folly he took the matter very well this love for somebody who was not the duchess was very agreeable to him 
and the count who politics apart was a man of perfect honour acted on the maxim that his own happiness depended entirely on that of the duchess i will save him from himself said he to his friend imagine our enemy's delight if he were arrested in this very palace so i have posted a hundred men of my own in the house and it was on this account that i asked you to give me the keys of the great water tank he gives himself out as being desperately in love with the fausta and hitherto he has not been able to carry her off from count m who gives the giddy creature all the luxuries of a queen the liveliest sorrow was painted on the features of the duchess fabrizio was nothing more than a libertine then incapable of any tender or serious feeling and not to see us that is what i shall never be able to forgive him she said at last and i who am writing to him every day to bologna i give him great credit for his self-restraint said the count he does not desire to compromise us by his freak and it will be very amusing to hear his account of it later the fausta was too giddy pated to be able to hold her tongue about anything which occupied her thoughts the morning after the concert during which she had sung all her airs at the tall young man dressed as a chasseur she referred in conversation with the count to an unknown and attentive individual where did you see him inquired the count in a fury in the streets in church replied the fausta in conclusion she immediately tried to repair her imprudence or at all events to remove any idea which could recall fabrizio's person she launched into an endless description of a tall red-haired young man with blue eyes some very rich and clumsy englishman doubtless or else some prince at this word the count the definiteness of whose impressions was their only virtue jumped to the conclusion a delightful one for his vanity that his rival was none other than the hereditary prince of parma this poor melancholy youth watched over by five or six governors sub-governors tutors and so forth who never allowed him to go out without holding a preliminary council was in the habit of casting strange looks at every decent-looking woman whom he was allowed to approach at the duchess's concert he had been seated as his rank demanded in front of all the other auditors in a separate armchair and three paces from the fair fausta and had gazed at her in a manner which had caused excessive vexation to the count this delightful piece of wild vanity the idea of having a prince for his rival entertained fausta vastly and she amused herself by strengthening it with a hundred details imparted in the most apparently artless fashion is your family said she to the count as old as that of the farnese to which this young man belongs as old what do you mean there are no bastards in my family Footnote pierre luigi the first sovereign of the farnese family so famous for his virtues was as is well known the natural son of pope paul the third end of footnote it so fell out that count m never could get a clear view of his pretended rival and this confirmed his flattering conviction that he had a prince for his antagonist as a matter of fact fabrizio when the necessities of the enterprise did not summon him to parma spent some time in the woods near sacca and on the banks of the po count m had grown more haughty than ever but far more prudent too since he had believed himself to be disputing fausta's affections with the prince he besought her very earnestly to behave with the utmost reserve in everything she did after casting himself at her feet like a jealous and passionate lover he told her very plainly that his honour demanded that she should not be duped by the young prince excuse me she replied i should not be his dupe if i loved him i have never yet seen a prince at my feet if you yield he responded with a haughty look i may not perhaps be able to avenge myself on the prince but vengeance i will have you may be certain and he went out banging the doors behind him had fabrizio made his appearance at that moment he would have won his cause if you value your life said count m to her that evening as he took his leave of her after the play see to it that i never find out that the young prince has entered your house i can do nothing to him but death madam do not force me to remember that i can do anything i please to you ah my little fabrizio exclaimed the fausta if i only knew where to lay my hand on you wounded vanity may drive a wealthy young man who has been surrounded by flatterers since his birth into many things the very real passion with which the fausta had inspired count m burned up again furiously the dangerous prospect of a struggle with the only son of the sovereign in whose country he was sojourning 
did not daunt him and at the same time he was not clever enough to make any attempt to get a sight of the prince or at least have him followed as he could discover no other method of attack m ventured on the idea of making him look ridiculous i shall be banished forever from the dominion of parma said he well what matter if he had made any attempt to reconnoitre the enemy's position count m would have discovered that the poor young prince never went out of doors except in the company of three or four old men the tiresome guardians of official etiquette and that the only pleasure of his own choice in which he was allowed to indulge was his taste for mineralogy both in the daytime and at night the little palazzo occupied by fausta and to which the best company in parma crowded was surrounded by watchers m was kept informed hour by hour of what she was doing and especially of what was done by those about her one point at least was praiseworthy in the precautions taken by the jealous man the lady whimsical as she was had no suspicion at first of the increasing watchfulness about her all count m's agents reported that a very young man wearing a wig of red hair constantly appeared under the fausta's windows but every time in some fresh disguise clearly that is the young prince said m to himself otherwise why should he disguise himself egad i am not the man to make way for him but for the usurpations of the venetian republic i should now be a reigning prince like him on san stefano's day the spy's reports grew more gloomy they seemed to indicate that the fausta was beginning to respond to her unknown admirer's attention i might depart instantly and take the woman with me said m to himself but i fled from bologna before del dongo here i should flee before a prince and what would the young man say he might think he had contrived to frighten me and on my soul my family is as good as his m was beside himself with rage and to crown his misery his great object was to prevent his jealousy from making him look ridiculous in the eyes of fausta with whose jeering disposition he was well acquainted therefore on san stefano's day after having spent an hour with her and received a welcome which seemed to him the very acme of falsehood he left her toward eleven o'clock when she was dressing to go and hear mass at the church of san giovanni count m returned to his rooms put on the shabby black dress of a young theological student and hurried off to san giovanni he chose out a place behind one of the tombs which adorned the third chapel on the right under the arm of a cardinal who was represented kneeling on this tomb he could see everything that went on in the church the statue blocked the light within the chapel and concealed him very sufficiently soon he saw fausta enter looking more beautiful than ever she was in full dress and twenty admirers of the highest rank attended her smiles and delight shone on her lips and in her eyes clearly thought the unhappy man she is expecting to meet the man she loves and whom thanks to me she has perhaps not been able to see for a long time suddenly the liveliest expression of happiness shone in fausta's eyes my rival is here said m to himself and the fury of his wounded vanity knew no bounds what am i doing here acting as counterweight to a young prince who puts on disguises but hard as he tried he could not discover the rival whom his hungry glance sought on every side every instant the fausta after looking all round the church would fix her eyes heavy with love and happiness on the dark corner in which m stood concealed in a passionate heart love is apt to exaggerate the very slightest things and deduce consequences of the most ridiculous nature thus poor m ended by persuading himself that the fausta had caught sight of him and that having perceived his mortal jealousy in spite of his desperate efforts to conceal it she was seeking by her tender glances at once to reproach and to console him the cardinal's tomb behind which he had taken up his point of observation was raised some four or five feet above the marble pavement of san giovanni when toward one o'clock the fashionable mass was brought to a close most of the congregation departed and the fausta dismissed the city bows on the pretext that she desired to perform her devotions she remained kneeling on her chair and her eyes which had grown softer and more brilliant than ever rested on m now that only a few persons remained in the church she did not take the trouble of looking all round it before allowing them to dwell with delight on the cardinal's statue what delicacy said count m who thought she was gazing at him 
at last the faust arose and went quickly out of church after having made some curious motions with her hands m drunk with love and almost wholly cured of his foolish jealousy was leaving his place to fly to his mistress's palace and overwhelm her with his gratitude when as he passed in front of the cardinal's tomb he noticed a young man all in black this fatal being had remained kneeling close against the epitaph on the tomb in such a position that the lover's jealous eyes had passed over his head and so failed to catch sight of him the young man rose moved quickly away and was instantly surrounded by seven or eight rather awkward and odd-looking fellows who seemed to belong to him m rushed after him but without any too evident effort the clumsy men who seemed to be protecting his rival checked his progress in the little procession necessitated by the wooden screen round the entrance door when at last he got out into the street behind them he had only time to see the door of a sorry-looking carriage which by an odd contrast was drawn by two excellent horses swiftly closed and in a moment it was out of sight he went home choking with fury he was soon joined by his spies who coolly informed him that on that day the mysterious lover disguised as a priest had knelt very devoutly close up against a tomb standing at the entrance of a dark chapel in the church of san giovanni that the fausta had remained in the church until it was almost empty and she had then swiftly exchanged certain signs with the unknown person making something like crosses with her hands m rushed to the faithless woman's house for the first time she could not conceal her confusion with all the lying simplicity of a passionate woman she related that she had gone to san giovanni as usual but had not seen her persecutor there on these words m beside himself told her she was the vilest of creatures related all he had seen himself and as the more bitterly he accused her the more boldly she lied to him he drew his dagger and would have fallen upon her with the most perfect calmness the fausta said well everything you complain of is perfectly true but i have tried to hide it from you so as to prevent your boldness from carrying you into mad plans of vengeance which may be the ruin of us both let me tell you once for all i take this man who persecutes me with his attentions to be one who will find no obstacle to his will in this country at all events then having skilfully reminded m that after all he had no rights over her the fausta ended by saying that she should probably not go again to the church of san giovanni m was desperately in love it was possible that a touch of coquetry might have mingled with prudence in the young woman's heart he felt himself disarmed he thought of leaving parma the young prince powerful as he was would not be able to follow him or if he followed him he would be no more than his equal then his pride reminded him once more that such a departure would always look like flight and count m forbade himself to think of it again he has not an idea of my little fabrizio's existence thought the delighted singer and now we shall be able to laugh at him most thoroughly fabrizio had no suspicion of his own good fortune the next morning when he saw the fair lady's windows all carefully closed and could not catch sight of her anywhere the joke began to strike him as lasting rather too long his conscience began to prick him into what a position am i putting poor count mosca the minister of police he will be taken for my accomplice and my coming to this country will be the ruin of his fortunes but if i give up a plan i have followed for so long what will the duchess say when i tell her of my attempts at love-making one night when feeling thoroughly inclined to give up the game he thus reasoned with himself as he prowled up and down under the great trees which divide the palace in which fausta was living from the citadel he became aware that he was being followed by a spy of exceedingly small stature in vain did he walk through several streets in his endeavour to get away from him he could not shake off the tiny form which seemed to dog his steps losing patience at last he moved quickly into a lonely street running along the river in which his servants were lying in wait at a signal from him they sprang upon the poor little spy who threw himself at their feet it turned out to be bettina the fausta's waiting woman after three days of boredom and retirement she had disguised herself in man's attire to escape count m's dagger which both she and her mistress greatly dreaded and had undertaken to come out and tell fabrizio that he was passionately loved and intensely longed for 
but that any reappearance at the church of san giovanni was quite impossible it was high time thought fabrizio to himself well done my obstinacy the little waiting woman was exceedingly pretty a fact which soon weaned fabrizio from his communings with morality she informed him that the public promenade and all the streets through which he had passed that evening were carefully though secretly guarded by spies in the count's pay they had hired rooms on the ground floor and on the first floor and hidden behind the window shutters they watched everything that went on in the streets even those which seemed the loneliest and heard everything that was said if the spies had recognized my voice said little bettina i should have been stabbed without mercy as soon as i got home and my poor mistress with me perhaps fabrizio thought her terror increased her charms count m she added is furious and my mistress knows he is capable of anything she bade me tell you that she wishes she were with you and a hundred leagues from here then she told the story of all that had happened on san stefano's day and of the fury of the count who had not missed one of the loving glances and signs which the fausta who had been quite beside herself with passion that day had bestowed on fabrizio the count had unsheathed his dagger and caught hold of fausta by the hair and but for her presence of mind would certainly have killed her fabrizio conducted the pretty waiting maid to a lodging he had hard by he told her that he was the son of a great turinese nobleman who chanced to be at parma at that moment and that therefore he was obliged to act with the greatest caution Miss bettina answered laughingly that he was a much greater man than he chose to appear it was some time before our hero contrived to understand that the charming girl took him for no less a person than the hereditary prince himself the fausta was beginning to take alarm and also to care for fabrizio she had resolved not to tell her waiting maid his real name and had spoken of him to her as the prince fabrizio ended by confessing to the pretty girl that she had guessed aright but if my name is noticed abroad he added in spite of my great passion for your mistress of which i have given her so many proofs i shall not be able to see her any more and my father's ministers those spiteful wretches whom i shall one day send about their business will not fail to give her instant orders to clear out of the country which she has hitherto embellished by her presence toward morning fabrizio and the fair waiting maid laid several plans for meeting so as to enable him to get to fausta he sent for ludovico and another of his men a very cunning fellow who arrived at an understanding with bettina while he was writing the most exaggerated letter to fausta tragic exaggeration quite fitted in with the situation and fabrizio used it without stint it was not till daybreak that he parted with the pretty waiting maid who was highly delighted with the treatment she had received at the hands of the young prince a hundred times over they had agreed that now that fausta had entered into communications with her lover he was not to appear under the windows of the little palace until she was able to admit him when he would be duly warned but fabrizio who was now in love with bettina and believed himself near success with fausta could not stay quietly in his village two leagues from parma toward midnight on the morrow he came on horseback with a sufficient train of servants and sang under the fausta's windows an air then fashionable to which he had put words of his own is this not a common practice among lovers said he to himself now that the fausta had given him to understand that she desired a meeting this long pursuit seemed very wearisome to fabrizio no this is not love said he to himself as he sang not particularly well under the windows of the little palace bettina seems to me a hundred times more attractive than fausta and it is she whom i should best like to see at this moment he was returning to his village feeling rather bored when about five hundred paces from fausta's palace he was sprung upon by some fifteen or twenty men four of them seized his horse's bridle two others took hold of his arms ludovico and fabrizio's bravi were attacked but contrived to escape and several pistols were fired the whole affair was over in an instant then as though by magic and in the twinkling of an eye fifty men bearing lighted torches appeared in the street every man well armed fabrizio in spite of the people who were holding him had jumped off his horse and struggled fiercely to get free he even wounded one of the men who was holding his arms in a vice-like grasp 
but he was very much astonished to hear the fellow say in the most respectful tone your highness will give me a good pension for this wound and that will be far better for me than to fall into the crime of high treason by drawing my sword against my prince now here comes the chastisement of my folly thought fabrizio i shall have damned myself for a sin which did not even strike me as attractive hardly had the attempted scuffle come to an end when several lackeys dressed in magnificent liveries brought forward a sedan chair gilt and painted in a most extraordinary manner it was one of those grotesque conveyances used by masks during carnival time six men dagger in hand requested his highness to get in saying the cold night air might hurt his voice the most respectful forms of address were used and the title prince was constantly repeated and almost shouted aloud the procession began to move on fabrizio counted more than fifty men carrying lighted torches down the street it was about one o'clock in the morning all the world was looking out of the windows there was a certain solemnity about the whole affair i was afraid count m might treat me to dagger thrusts said fabrizio to himself but he contents himself with making game of me i should not have accused him of so much taste but does he really believe he has to do with the prince if he knows i am only fabrizio i must beware of the stiletto the fifty torch-bearers and the twenty armed men having made a long halt under the fausta's windows paraded up and down in front of the finest palaces in the city from time to time the major-domos who walked by the side of the sedan chair inquired whether his highness had any orders to give them fabrizio did not lose his head he could see by the torchlight that ludovico and his men were following the procession as closely as they could fabrizio argued to himself ludovico has only eight or ten men he does not dare to attack from within his sedan chair fabrizio saw plainly enough that the people charged with the execution of this doubtful joke were armed to the teeth he affected to laugh with the major-domos in attendance on him after more than two hours of this triumphal march he perceived that they were about to cross the street in which the palazzo san severina stood just as they passed by the street leading to the palace he suddenly opened the door in the front of the chair jumped over one of the staves overthrew one of the footmen who thrust his torch into his face with a dagger thrust received one himself in the shoulder a second footman singed his beard with his lighted torch and finally fabrizio reached ludovico to whom he shouted kill kill every one who carries a torch ludovico hacked with his sword and saved him from two men who were trying to pursue him fabrizio rushed up to the entrance of the palazzo san severina the porter in his curiosity had opened the little door three feet high set in the large one and was staring in astonishment at the great train of torches fabrizio bounded through the tiny door slammed it behind him ran to the garden and escaped by another door opening on to a deserted street an hour later he was beyond the city walls when day broke he was over the frontier into the state of modena and in perfect safety by the evening he was back in bologna here's a pretty expedition said he to himself i have not even succeeded in getting speech with my flame he lost no time about writing letters of excuse to the count and to the duchess prudent missives which though they described his emotions furnished no clue that any enemy could lay hold of i was in love with love he wrote to the duchess i have done everything in the world to make its acquaintance but nature it appears has refused me a heart capable of love and melancholy i cannot rise above vulgar enjoyment and so on the stir this adventure made in parma cannot be described the mystery of it whetted the general curiosity numbers of people had seen the torches and the sedan chair but who was the man who had been carried off and treated with such formal ceremony no well-known personage was missing from the city on the following day the humble folk living in the street in which the prisoner made his escape declared they had seen a corpse but when broad daylight came and the inhabitants ventured to emerge from their houses the only trace of the struggle they could discover was the quantity of blood which stained the paving stones more than twenty thousand sightseers visited the street during the day the dwellers in italian towns are accustomed to see strange sights but the how and why is always clearly known to them what annoyed the parmese about this incident was that even a whole month after 
when the torchlight procession had ceased to be the only subject of general conversation no one thanks to count mosca's prudence had been able to discover the name of the rival who would fain have carried the faust off from count m this jealous and vindictive lover had taken to flight as soon as the procession had set forth on its way by the count's orders the fausto was shut up in the citadel the duchess was vastly entertained by a little piece of injustice in which the count was forced to indulge to check the curiosity of the prince who might otherwise have tried to discover fabrizio's name a learned man had just arrived at parma from the north with the intention of writing a history of the middle ages he was searching for manuscripts in various libraries and the count had given him all possible facilities but this learned man who was still very young was of an irascible temper he fancied for instance that every soul in parma desired to turn him into ridicule it is true that the street boys did occasionally run after him attracted by the waving locks of pale red hair which he proudly displayed this learned gentleman believed that his innkeeper charged him abnormal prices for everything and he would never pay for the most trifling article without looking up its price in mrs stark's travels a book which has reached its twentieth edition because it gives the prudent englishman the price of a turkey an apple a glass of milk and so forth on the very evening of the day on which fabrizio had taken his involuntary part in the torchlight procession the red-haired savant fell into a rage at his inn and pulled a pair of pocket pistols out of his pocket to take vengeance on a camerier who had asked him two sous for an inferior peach he was immediately arrested for it is a great crime in parma to carry pocket pistols as this irascible gentleman was tall and thin it occurred to the count next morning to pass him off on the prince as the foolhardy being who had endeavoured to carry off the fausta and on whom a trick had been played by her lover in parma the punishment for carrying pocket pistols is three years at the galleys but the penalty is never exacted after a fortnight in prison during which he saw nobody but a lawyer who filled him with the deepest terror of abominable laws directed by the cowardice of the people in power against the bearers of concealed weapons he was visited by a second lawyer who told him the story of the mock procession in which count m had forced a rival whose identity had not been discovered to bear a part the police do not want to confess to the prince that they cannot find out who this rival is say that you desired to find favour in the fausta's eyes that fifty rascals laid hands on you while you were singing beneath her windows and that you were carried about in a sedan chair for an hour by people who only spoke to you in a most respectful manner there is nothing humiliating about this avowal and one word is all that is asked of you the instant you say it and get the police out of this difficulty you will be put into a post-chaise taken to the frontier and allowed to depart in peace for a whole month the learned man held out two or three times over the prince was on the point of having him brought before the minister of the interior and himself presiding at the examination but he had forgotten all about it before the historian wearied out made up his mind to confess everything and was conducted to the frontier the prince remained convinced that count m s rival possessed a mass of red hair three days after the procession while fabrizio with his faithful ludovico in his hiding-place at bologna was plotting means of discovering count m he learned that the count was in hiding too in a mountain village on the road to florence and that only three of his bully were with him next day as he was returning from a ride the count was seized by eight masked men who informed him they were police agents from parma he was conducted after his eyes had been bandaged to an inn some two leagues farther up the mountain where he was received with every attention and found a liberal supper ready the best italian and spanish wines were served pray am i a state prisoner inquired the count not the least in the world was the polite response of ludovico who wore a mask you have insulted the private individual by venturing to have him carried about in a sedan chair to-morrow morning he means to fight a duel with you if you kill him you will be provided with money and good horses and there will be relays ready for you all the way to genoa what may this ruffian's name be quoth the count in a rage his name is bombace you will have the choice of weapons and good seconds thoroughly loyal men but one or the other of you must die it's a murder then cried count m in alarm 
god forbid it is simply a duel to the death with a young man whom you carried about the streets of parma in the middle of the night and who would be dishonoured if you lived on the earth is not large enough for both of you therefore do your best to kill him you will have swords pistols rapiers all the weapons it has been possible to collect within a few hours for time is precious the bolognese police are very diligent as you know and there must be no interference with this duel for the sake of the honour of this young man whom you have turned into ridicule but if the young man is a prince he is a private individual like yourself and indeed a much less rich man than you but he is resolved to fight to the death and he will force you to fight i warn you i am not afraid of anything on earth exclaimed count m that is what your adversary most earnestly desires replied ludovico make yourself ready to defend your life to-morrow very early in the morning to be attacked by a man who has good reason to be furious with you and who will not spare you i tell you again you will have the choice of weapons and now make your will about six o'clock the next morning count m's breakfast was served then one of the doors of the room in which he had been kept was opened and he was requested to enter the courtyard of a country inn this court was surrounded with tolerably high hedges and walls and all the entrances had been carefully closed on a table in one corner which the count was requested to approach stood several bottles of wine and brandy two pistols two rapiers two swords paper and ink about a score of peasants were at the windows of the tavern which looked on to the yard the count besought their pity these people want to murder me he cried save my life you are deceived or else you desire to deceive shouted fabrizio who was standing in the opposite corner of the courtyard beside a table covered with weapons he had taken off his coat and his face was hidden under one of those wire masks used in fencing rooms i advise you added fabrizio to put on the wire mask you will find beside you and then advance either with a rapier or with pistols as you were told yesterday morning you have the choice of weapons the count made endless difficulties and seemed very unwilling to fight fabrizio on his side was afraid the police would arrive although they were up in the mountains and five full leagues from bologna he ended by hurling such frightful insults at his rival that he had the satisfaction of goading count m into fury he snatched up a rapier and advanced upon fabrizio the beginning of the fight was somewhat slack after a few minutes it was interrupted by a great noise our hero had been quite conscious that he was undertaking an enterprise which might be made a subject of reproach or at all events of slanderous imputations upon him all through his life he had sent ludovico into the fields to beat up witnesses ludovico gave money to some strangers who were working in a neighbouring wood and they hurried up shouting under the impression that they were expected to kill an enemy of the man who had paid them when they reached the inn ludovico begged them to watch with all their eyes and see whether either of the young men did anything treacherous or took any unfair advantage of the other the fight which had been checked for a moment by the peasants shouts again hung fire once more fabrizio rained insults on the count's self-conceit signor conte he cried when you are insolent you must be brave as well i know that it is a hard matter for you you would far rather pay other people to be brave the count stung to fresh fury yelled out that he had been a constant frequenter of the fencing school at naples kept by the famous battistino and that he would soon chastise his opponent's impudence now that count m's fury had revived he fought with tolerable resolution but this did not prevent fabrizio from giving him a fine sword thrust in the chest which kept him several months in bed as ludovico bent over the count to put a temporary bandage on his wound he whispered in his ear if you dare to let the police know of this duel i will have you stabbed in your bed fabrizio fled to florence as he had remained in hiding at bologna it was not till he reached florence that he received all the duchess's reproachful letters she could not forgive him for coming to her concert and not attempting to obtain speech of her fabrizio was delighted with count mosca's letters they breathed frank friendship and the noblest feelings he guessed that the count had written to bologna to dispel the suspicions of him which the duel might have caused the police behaved with perfect justice it reported that two strangers only one of whom the wounded man was recognized count m had fought with rapiers in the presence of more than thirty peasants joined toward the end of the fight by the village priest who had unsuccessfully attempted to separate the combatants 
as the name of giuseppe bossi had never been mentioned fabrizio ventured before two months were out to return to bologna more convinced than ever that he was fated never to make acquaintance with the noble and intellectual side of love this he did himself the pleasure of explaining to the duchess in very lengthy terms he was very tired of his lonely life and passionately longed to go back to the delightful evenings he had spent with his aunt and the count he had not tasted the delights of good company since he had parted from them i have brought so much worry upon myself on account of the love i had hoped to enjoy and of the fausta wrote he to the duchess that now if her fancy still turned my way i would not ride twenty leagues to claim the fulfilment of her bond therefore have no fear as you say you have that i may go to paris where i see she is appearing with the most brilliant success i would ride any possible number of leagues to spend an evening with you and with the count who is always so good to his friends End of chapter thirteen Chapter fourteen of the Chartres of Parma by Stendhal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter fourteen. While Fabrizio was prosecuting his search for love in a village near Parma, Rossi, all unconscious of his vicinity, continued dealing with the young man's case as if it had been that of a liberal he pretended that it was impossible to find any witnesses for the defence or rather he browbeat those he did find finally after protracted and skilful labour lasting nearly a year the marchesa raversi one friday evening some two months after fabrizio's last visit to bologna publicly announced in her drawing-room that on the very next day young del dongo's sentence which had been pronounced just an hour before would be presented for the prince's signature and would receive his approval within a very few minutes the duchess was apprised of her enemy's announcement the count's agents must serve him very ill said she to herself even this morning he thought the sentence could not be pronounced for another week it would not break his heart perhaps to see my young grand vicar banished from parma but she added and she began to sing we shall see him come back and he will be our archbishop some day the duchess rang the bell call all the servants together into the ante-room said she to her footman even the cooks go to the commandant of the fortress and get a permit from him for four post-horses and see that those same horses are harnessed to my carriage before half an hour is out all the waiting women in the house were busy packing trunks the duchess hurriedly slipped on a travelling dress all this without sending any warning to the count the idea of making sport of him a little filled her with delight my friends she said to the servants who were now assembled i have just heard that my poor nephew is about to be sentenced by default for having had the impudence to defend his life against a madman it was giletti who would have killed him you have all of you had opportunities of seeing how gentle and inoffensive fabrizio is by nature infuriated as i have a right to be by this vile insult i start instantly for florence i leave each of you ten years wages if you fall into difficulties write to me and as long as i have a sequin there will be something for you the duchess thought exactly what she said and at her last words her servants burst into tears her own eyes were wet and she added in a voice that trembled with emotion pray to god for me and for monsignore del dongo chief grand vicar of the diocese who will be sentenced to-morrow morning to the galleys or which would be less ridiculous to the penalty of death the servants tears fell faster and their sobs changed by degrees into shouts that were almost seditious the duchess entered into her coach and had herself driven to the prince's palace in spite of the unwonted hour she requested general fontana the aide-de-camp in waiting to beg the prince to grant her an audience the aide-de-camp observed with great astonishment that she was not in full court dress as for the prince he was not the least surprised and even less displeased by the request for an audience now we shall see tears shed by lovely eyes said he to himself rubbing his hands she comes to sue for mercy this proud beauty is going to humble herself at last 
and indeed she was quite unbearable with her little airs of independence whenever the smallest thing displeased her those speaking eyes seemed always to tell me it would be far pleasanter to live at naples or at milan than in your little town of parma it is true i do not reign over naples nor over milan but at any rate this fine lady is coming to beg me for something which depends on me alone and which she pines to obtain i have always thought that the nephew's arrival would help me to get something out of her while the prince was smiling at his own thoughts and indulging in these pleasing forecasts he kept walking up and down his study at the door of which general fontana still stood upright and stiff like a soldier shouldering arms when he saw the prince's shining eyes and recollected the duchess's travelling garments he felt convinced the monarchy was about to drop to pieces and his astonishment exceeded all limits when he heard the prince address him thus you will ask the duchess to be good enough to wait for a quarter of an hour or so the aide-de-camp turned to the right about like a soldier on parade and the prince smiled again fontana is not accustomed said he to himself to see the haughty duchess kept waiting his face of astonishment when he tells her to wait for a quarter of an hour will pave the way for the affecting tears that will shortly be shed in this study that quarter of an hour was an exquisite one to the prince he walked up and down with steady and even step he reigned in very deed it is important that nothing should be said which is not perfectly correct whatever may be my feelings toward the duchess i must not forget that she is one of the greatest ladies of my court how did louis the fourteenth address the princesses his daughters when he had reason to be displeased with them and his glance lingered on the great king's portrait the comical thing was that the prince never thought of asking himself whether he should show mercy to fabrizio and what kind of mercy he should extend at last after the lapse of twenty minutes the faithful fontana appeared once more at the door this time without saying a word the duchess sanseverina is permitted to enter exclaimed the prince with a theatrical air now the tears will begin said he and as though to prepare himself for the sight he pulled out his own handkerchief never had the duchess looked so active or so pretty she did not seem more than five-and-twenty when the poor aide-de-camp saw her float across the carpet which her light foot hardly appeared to touch he very nearly lost his head altogether i have all sorts of apologies to make to your most serene highness said the duchess in her clear blithe voice i have taken the liberty of presenting myself in a dress which is not exactly correct but your highness has so accustomed me to your kindnesses that i have dared to hope you would grant me this favour the duchess spoke rather slowly so as to give herself time to enjoy the expression of the prince's countenance which was exquisite by reason of his overwhelming astonishment and the remains of pomposity still indicated by the pose of his head and the position of his arms the prince was thunderstruck every now and then he exclaimed almost inarticulately in his little shrill unsteady voice what what when the duchess had come to the end of her speech she paused respectfully as though to give him an opportunity of replying then she continued i venture to hope your most serene highness will pardon the incongruity of my costume but even as she spoke the words her mocking eyes shot out such brilliant shafts that the prince could not endure their glance he stared at the ceiling which in his case was always a sign of the most extreme embarrassment what what said he again then he was lucky enough to think of a remark duchess pray be seated and he himself offered her a chair and with considerable grace the duchess was not unmoved by this politeness and her indignant glance softened what what repeated the prince once more fidgeting in his chair as though he could not settle himself firmly into it i am going to take advantage of the coolness of the night hours to travel by post continued the duchess and as my absence may be of considerable duration i would not leave your most serene highness's dominions without thanking you for all the kindness you have condescended to show me during the last five years at these words the prince understood at last and turned pale no man in the world suffered more than he at the idea of having been mistaken in his forecast but he took on an air of majesty quite worthy of the picture of louis the fourteenth which hung in front of him ah very good thought the duchess this is a man and what may be the reason of this sudden departure said the prince in a fairly steady voice the plan is an old one replied the duchess 
and a petty insult which is being put on monsignore del dongo who is to be sentenced either to death or to the galleys to-morrow has hastened my departure and to what town do you proceed to naples i think then rising she added all that now remains for me to do is to take leave of your most serene highness and to thank you most humbly for your former kindnesses her tone was now so resolute that the prince clearly perceived that in two seconds everything would be over once the rupture of her departure had taken place he knew any arrangement would be hopeless she was not a woman to undo what she had once done he hurried after her but you know very well duchess he said taking her hand that i have always liked you and that if you had chosen that affection would have borne another name a murder has been committed that cannot be denied i employed my best judges to carry on the trial at these words the duchess drew herself up to her full height like a flash every semblance of respect and even of urbanity disappeared the offended woman stood unveiled before him and an offended woman speaking to a being whom she knew to be false with an expression of the liveliest anger and even scorn she addressed the prince laying stress on every word i am leaving your most serene highness's dominions for ever so that i may never again hear the names of rassi and of the other vile assassins who have passed sentence of death on my nephew and on so many others if your most serene highness does not desire to mingle a feeling of bitterness with the memory of the last moments i have to spend in the presence of a prince who is both courteous and witty when he is not deceived i very humbly beseech your highness not to remind me of those shameless judges who sell themselves for a decoration or for a thousand crowns the ring of nobility and above all of truth in her words made the prince shiver for a moment he feared his dignity might be compromised by a yet more direct assertion but on the whole his sensation soon became one of pleasure he admired the duchess her whole person at that moment breathed a beauty that was sublime good god how beautiful she is said the prince to himself something must be forgiven to such a woman there is probably not another like her in italy well with a little careful policy i may not find it impossible to make her my mistress some day such a creature would be very different from that doll-faced balbi who steals at least three hundred thousand francs a year from my poor subject into the bargain but did i hear aright thought he suddenly she said sentenced my nephew and so many others then rage got the upper hand and it was with a haughtiness worthy of his supreme position that the prince said after a silence and what must be done to prevent the duchess from departing something of which you are not capable replied the duchess and the most bitter irony and the most open scorn rang in her voice the prince was beside himself but the habit of reigning with absolute authority had brought him strength to resist his first impulses i must possess this woman thought he i owe it to myself and then i must kill her with my scorn if she leaves this study i shall never see her again but wild as he was at that moment with rage and hatred how was he to pitch on a phrase which would at once fulfil what was due to himself and induce the duchess not to forsake his court that instant a gesture thought he can neither be repeated nor turned into ridicule and he put himself between the duchess and the door of the room soon after he heard somebody tapping at the door who is the damned fellow he explained swearing with all the strength of his lungs who is the damned fellow who wants to intrude his idiotic person here poor general fontana put in a pale and completely puzzled countenance with a face like the face of a dying man he murmured inarticulately his excellency count mosca craves the honour of an audience let him come in shouted the prince and as mosca bowed before him well said he here is the duchess sanseverina who says she is instantly leaving parma to go and settle in naples and who has been making impertinent remarks to me into the bargain what said mosca what you knew nothing about the plan of departure not a single word when i left the duchess at six o'clock she was cheerful and gay the words produced an incredible effect upon the prince first of all he looked at mosca whose increasing pallor proved that he had spoken the truth and had nothing to do with the duchess's sudden freak in that case said he to himself she is lost to me for ever my pleasure and my vengeance both fly away together at naples she and her nephew fabrizio will write epigrams on the mighty rages of the little prince of parma 
then he looked at the duchess the most violent scorn and anger were struggling in her breast her eyes were riveted on count mosca and the delicate lines of her beautiful mouth expressed the bitterest disdain her whole expression seemed to say cringing courtier thus thought the prince after having scrutinized her i have lost the means of recalling her to my country once more if she leaves the study at this moment she is lost to me god only knows what she will say about my judges at naples and with the wit and divine powers of persuasion heaven has given her she will make everybody believe her thanks to her i shall bear the reputation of an undignified tyrant who gets up in the night to look under his bed then by a skilful manoeuvre as if he were walking about to calm his agitation the prince once more placed himself in front of the study door the count was at his right some three paces off pale discomposed and trembling to such an extent that he was obliged to support himself by leaning on the back of the armchair which the duchess had occupied during the beginning of the audience and which the prince had pushed away with an angry gesture the count was in love if the duchess goes he was saying to himself i shall follow her but will she allow me to follow her that is the question on the prince's left the duchess stood erect her arms folded tightly across her bosom superbly angry watching him the brilliant colour which had lately flushed her beautiful face had faded into the deepest pallor the prince's face unlike those of the other two actors in the scene was red and he looked worried his left hand convulsively jerked the cross fastened to the ribbon of his order which he wore under his coat his right hand caressed his chin what is to be done said he to the count hardly knowing what he said and carried away by his habit of consulting mosca about everything truly i know not your most serene highness said the count like a man who was breathing out his last sigh he could hardly speak the words the tone of his voice was the first consolation to his wounded pride which the prince had enjoyed during the audience and this small piece of good fortune inspired him with a remark that was very grateful to his vanity well said he i am the most sensible of us three i am willing to completely overlook my own position in the world i shall speak as a friend and he added with a noble smile of condescension a fine imitation of the good old times of louis the fourteenth as a friend speaking to his friends duchess he added what must i do to induce you to forget this untimely decision truly i know not said the duchess with a great sigh truly i know not so hateful as parma to me there was not the smallest epigrammatic intention in her words her sincerity was quite evident the count turned sharply toward her his courtier's soul was horrified then he cast a beseeching glance toward the prince the prince paused for a moment then turning with great dignity and calmness to the count i see said he that your charming friend is quite beside herself that is quite natural she adores her nephew then to the duchess speaking in the most gallant manner and at the same time with the sort of air with which a man quotes the key word of a comedy he added what must i do to find favour in those fair eyes the duchess had had time to reflect in a slow and steady voice as if she had been dictating her ultimatum she replied your highness would write me a gracious letter such as you so well know how to write in which you would say that not being convinced of the guilt of fabrizio del dongo chief grand vicar to the archbishop you will not sign the sentence when it is presented to you and that these unjust proceedings shall have no further effect what unjust said the prince reddening up to the whites of his eyes and falling into a rage again that is not all replied the duchess with all the dignity of a roman matron this very evening and she added looking at the clock it is already a quarter past eleven this very evening your most serene highness would send word to the marchesa raversi that you advise her to go to the country to recover from the fatigue which a certain trial of which she was talking in her drawing-room early this evening must doubtless have caused her the prince was raging up and down his study like a fury did any one ever see such a woman he cried she actually fails in respect to my person the duchess replied with the most perfect grace never in my life did it enter my head to fail in respect to your most serene highness your highness was so extremely condescending as to say that you would speak as a friend to his friends and indeed i have no desire to remain in parma 
she added shooting a glance of the most ineffable scorn at the count that glance decided the prince who had been hitherto very uncertain in his mind although his words might have been taken to indicate an undertaking but words meant little to him a few more remarks were exchanged but at last count mosca received orders to write the gracious note for which the duchess had asked he omitted the sentence these unjust proceedings shall have no further effect it will be quite enough said the count to himself if the prince promises not to sign the sentence when it is presented to him as the prince signed the paper he thanked him with a glance the count made a great blunder the prince was tired out and he would have signed everything he flattered himself he had got through the scene very well and the whole matter was overshadowed in his mind by the thought if the duchess goes away the court will grow tiresome to me in less than a week the count noticed that his master had corrected the date and inserted that of the next day he glanced at the clock it was almost midnight the correction only struck the minister as a proof of the prince's pedantic desire to show his exactness and careful government as to the exile of the marchesa raversi he made no difficulty at all the prince took a particular delight in banishing people general fontana he called out half opening the door the general appeared wearing a face of such astonishment and curiosity that a swift glance of amusement passed between the count and the duchess and in that glance peace was made between them general fontana said the prince you will get into my carriage which is waiting under the colonnade you will go to the marchesa raversi's house you will send up your name if she is in bed you will add that you come from me and when you reach her room you will say these exact words and no others signora marchesa raversi his most serene highness invites you to depart to-morrow before eight o'clock in the morning to your castle at Velleia. his highness will inform you when you may return to parma the prince's eyes sought those of the duchess who without thanking him as he had expected made him an exceedingly respectful curtsy and went swiftly out of the room what a woman said the prince turning toward count mosca the count who was delighted at the marchesa raversi's exile which immensely facilitated all his ministerial actions talked for a full half hour like the consummate courtier he was his great object was to heal the sovereign's vanity and he did not take leave until he had thoroughly convinced him that there was no finer page in the anecdotic history of louis the fourteenth than that which he had just furnished for his own future historians when the duchess got home she closed her doors and gave orders that nobody was to be admitted not even the count she wanted to be alone and to make up her mind as to what she ought to think of the scene that had just taken place she had acted at random just as her fancy led her at the moment but whatever step she might have been carried away into undertaking she would have adhered to it steadily she never would have blamed herself and much less repented when her coolness had returned it was to these characteristics that she owed the fact that she was still at six-and-thirty years of age the prettiest woman at the court at that moment she was dreaming over all the charms parma might possess as she might have done on her way back there after a long absence so sure had she been from nine to eleven o'clock that she was about to leave the city for ever that poor dear count did cut a comical figure when he heard of my departure in the prince's presence he really is a charming fellow and one does not come across such a heart as his every day he would have resigned all his portfolios to follow me but then for five whole years he has never once had to complain of any want of attention on my part how many regularly married women could say the same to their lord and master i must admit there is no self-importance nor pedantry about him he never makes me feel i should like to deceive him he always seems ashamed of his power when he is with me how droll he looked before his lord and master if he were here i would kiss him but nothing on earth would induce me to undertake the task of amusing a minister who has lost his portfolio that is an illness which nothing but death can cure and which kills other folks what a misfortune it must be to be a minister when you are young i must write to him he must know this thing officially before he quarrels with his prince but i was forgetting my poor servants the duchess rang the bell her women were still busy filling trunks the carriage was standing underneath the portico and the men were packing it all the servants who had no work to do were standing around the carriage with tearful eyes cecchina the only person allowed to enter the duchess's room on solemn occasions informed her mistress of all these details 
send them upstairs said the duchess a moment later she herself went into the ante-room i have received a promise said she addressing them that the sentence against my nephew will not be signed by the sovereign the italian mode of expression i have put off my departure we shall see whether my enemies have enough credit to get this decision altered there was silence for a moment then the servants began to shout long live our lady the duchess and clapped their hands furiously the duchess who had retired into the next room reappeared like a popular actress dropped a little graceful curtsy to her people and said my friends i thank you at that moment on the slightest hint from her they would all have marched in a body to attack the palace she beckoned to one of her postilions a former smuggler and most trusty servant who followed her out you must dress yourself as a well-to-do peasant you must get out of parma as best you can then hire a sediola and get to bologna as quickly as possible you will enter bologna as if you were taking an ordinary walk by the florence gate and you will deliver a packet which cecchino will give you to fabrizio who is living at the pellegrino fabrizio is in hiding there and calls himself signor giuseppe bossi do not betray him by any imprudence do not appear to know him my enemies may set spies upon your heels fabrizio will send you back here in a few hours or a few days it is on your way back especially that you must be careful not to betray him ah the marchesa raversi's servants you mean exclaimed the postilion we're ready for them and if it were the signora's will they should soon be exterminated some day perhaps but for your life beware of doing anything without my orders it was the copy of the prince's note that the duchess wanted to send to fabrizio she could not deny herself the pleasure of amusing him and she added a few words concerning the scene of which the note had been the outcome these few words swelled into a letter of ten pages she sent for the postilion again you cannot start she said until four o'clock when the gates open i thought i would get out by the main sewer the water would be up to my chin but i could get through no said the duchess i will not let one of my most faithful servants run the risk of a fever do you know any one in the archbishop's household the second coachman is a friend of mine here is a letter for the holy prelate slip quietly into his palace and have yourself taken to his valet i would not have his grace disturbed if he is already shut up in his own room spend the night at the palace and as he always gets up at daybreak send in to-morrow at four o'clock say you have been sent by me ask the holy archbishop's blessing give him this packet and take the letters he may possibly give you to bologna the duchess was sending the archbishop the original of the prince's letter requesting him as the note concerned his chief grand vicar to place it among the archiepiscopal archives where she hoped her nephew's colleagues the other grand vicars and canons would take note of its existence all this under seal of the most profound secrecy the duchess wrote to monsignore landriani in a style of familiarity which was certain to delight that worthy man her signature took up three lines the letter couched in the most friendly terms ended with the words angelina cornelia isola valserra del dongo duchess san severina i don't believe i have written my name in full said the duchess laughing since i signed my marriage contract with the poor duke but it's trifles such as these that impress people and common folk take caricature for beauty she could not resist winding up her evening by yielding to the temptation of writing a tormenting letter to the poor count she announced to him officially and for his guidance so she expressed it in his intercourse with crowned heads that she did not feel herself equal to the task of entertaining a disgraced minister you are afraid of the prince she wrote when you can no longer see him shall you expect me to frighten you she dispatched the letter instantly the prince on his side sent at seven o'clock the next morning for count zurla the minister of the interior and said give fresh and most stringent orders to every podesta to arrest fabrizio del dongo i hear there is some chance that he may venture to reappear in my dominions the fugitive is at bologna where he seems to brave the action of our law courts you will therefore place police officers who are personally acquainted with his appearance first in the villages on the road from bologna to parma second in the neighbourhood of the duchess sanseverina's house at sacca and her villa at castelnuovo 
third all round count mosca's country house i venture count to rely on your great wisdom to conceal all knowledge of your sovereign's orders from discovery by count mosca understand clearly that i will have fabrizio del dongo arrested as soon as this minister had departed rassi the chief justice entered the prince's study by a secret door and came forward bent well nigh double and bowing at every step the rascal's face was a study for a painter worthy of all the vileness of the part he played and while the swift and disturbed glance of his eye betrayed his consciousness of his own value the grinning expression of arrogant self-confidence upon his lips showed that he knew how to struggle against scorn as this individual is destined to exert great influence over fabrizio's fate i may say a word of him here he was tall with fine and very intelligent eyes but his face was seamed by smallpox as for intelligence he had plenty of it and of the sharpest his thorough knowledge of legal matters was uncontested but his strongest point was his resourcefulness whatever might be the aspect of a matter he always with the greatest ease and in the shortest space of time discovered the most logical and well-founded means of obtaining a sentence or an acquittal he was above all things a past master in attorney's tricks this man whose services mighty monarchs would have envied the prince of parma had only one great passion to talk familiarly with exalted personages and entertain them with buffooneries little did he care whether the great man laughed at what he said or at his own person or even made disgusting jokes about his wife so long as he saw him laugh and was himself treated with familiarity he was content sometimes when the prince had exhausted all possible means of belittling his chief justice's dignity he would kick him heartily if the kicks hurt him the chief justice would cry but the instinct of buffoonery was so strong in him that he continued to prefer the drawing-room of a minister who scoffed at him to his own where he held despotic sway over the whole legal profession rassi had made himself quite a peculiar position owing to the fact that not the most insolent noble in the country could humiliate him his vengeance for the insults showered on him all the day long consisted in retailing them to the prince to whom he had acquired the privilege of saying everything it is true that the prince's answer frequently consisted in a hearty box on the ear which hurt him horribly but to that he never took exception the presence of the chief justice distracted the prince's thoughts in his hours of bad temper and he would then amuse himself by ill-treating him my readers will perceive that rassi was almost the perfect man for a court he had no honour and no humour secrecy above all things exclaimed the prince without any recognition of his salutation the most courteous of men as a rule he treated rassi like the merest varlet what is the date of your sentence yesterday morning your most serene highness how many of the judges signed it all five and the penalty twenty years in the fortress as your most serene highness told me a death sentence would have horrified people said the prince as though talking to himself a pity what a shock it would have been to that woman but he is a del dongo and the name is honoured in parma because of the three archbishops who came almost one after the other twenty years in the fortress you say yes your most serene highness replied rassi who was still standing doubled up in an attitude of obeisance to be preceded by a public apology before a portrait of your most serene highness and besides a fast of bread and water every friday and on the eves of all the chief feast days because of the prisoner's notorious impiety this with a view to the future and to break the neck of his career right said the prince his most serene highness having deigned to grant a favourable hearing to the very humble petitions of the marchesa del dongo mother of the culprit and the duchess san severina his aunt who have represented that at the period of the crime their son and nephew was very young and carried away by his mad passion for the wife of the unfortunate giletti has condescended notwithstanding his horror of the murder to commute the penalty to which fabrizio del dongo has been condemned to that of twelve years detention in the fortress give the paper to me to sign the prince added his signature and the date of the preceding day then handing the sheet back to rassi he said write just below my signature the duchess sanseverina having once more cast herself at his highness's feet 
the prince has granted the culprit permission to walk for an hour every thursday on the platform of the square tower vulgarly called the farnese tower sign that said the prince and keep your lips sealed whatever you may hear in town you will tell councillor de capitani who voted for two years imprisonment and even held forth in support of his ridiculous opinion that i advise him to read over the laws and regulations now silence again and good night to you chief justice rassi made three deep bows very slowly indeed and the prince never even looked at them all this happened at seven o'clock in the morning a few hours later the news of the marchesa raversi's exile had spread all over the town and the cafes everybody was talking at once about the great event for some time thanks to the marchesa's banishment that implacable enemy of small cities and small courts known as boredom fled from the town of parma general fabio conti who had believed himself sure of the ministry pretended he had the gout and never showed his nose outside his fortress for several days the middle class and consequently the populace concluded from current events that the prince had resolved to confer the archbishopric of parma on monsignore del dongo the more cunning cafe politicians went so far as to declare that archbishop landriani had been invited to feign serious illness and send in his resignation he was to be compensated with a large pension charged on the tobacco duties they were quite certain of this the rumour reached the archbishop who was very much disturbed and for some days his zeal in our hero's cause was largely paralysed in consequence some two months later this fine piece of news appeared in the paris press with the trifling alteration that it was count mosca the duchess sanseverina's nephew who was supposed to be likely to be appointed archbishop meanwhile the marchesa raversi was raging at her country house at velleia there was nothing womanly about her she was not one of those weak creatures who fancy they slake their vengeance when they pour out violent diatribes against their enemies the very day after her disgrace cavaliere riscara and three other friends of hers waited on the prince and sued permission to go and see her in her country place his highness received these gentlemen with the utmost graciousness and their arrival at velleia was a great consolation to the marchesa before the second week was out she had gathered quite thirty persons about her all those who would have attained office in the liberal government every evening the marchesa sat in council with the best informed of her adherents one day when she had received numerous letters from parma and bologna she retired at a very early hour her favourite waiting woman introduced to her presence first of all her acknowledged lover count baldi a young man of great beauty and utter futility and later on cavaliere riscara who had been baldi's predecessor this last was a short man dusky both physically and morally speaking who had begun life by teaching geometry in the nobles college at parma and was now a councillor of state and knight of several orders i have the good habit said the marchesa to the two men of never destroying any paper and it serves me well now here are nine letters which the son severina has written to me on various occasions you will both of you start for genoa there among the convicts at the galleys you will seek out an ex-notary whose name is burati like the great venetian poet or it may be durati you count baldi will be pleased to sit down at my table and write at my dictation an idea has just struck me and i send you a word i am going to my hut near castel nuovo if you like to come and spend twelve hours there with me it will make me very happy i do not think there is any great danger in this after what has happened the clouds are growing lighter nevertheless stop before you go into castel nuovo you will meet one of my servants on the road they are all passionately devoted to you of course you will keep the name of giuseppe bossi for this little expedition i am told you have a beard worthy of the most splendid capuchin and at parma you have been only seen with the decent countenance of a grand vicar do you understand riscara perfectly but the journey to genoa is a quite unnecessary luxury i know a man in parma who has not been to the galleys yet indeed but who cannot fail to get there he will forge the san severina's handwriting in the most successful manner at these words count baldi opened his fine eyes desperately wide he was only beginning to understand if you know this worthy gentleman at parma whose interests you hope to advance said the marchesa to riscara he probably knows you too 
his mistress his confessor his best friend may be bought by the sanseverina i prefer to delay my little joke for a few days and run no risk whatever start within two hours like two good little lambs don't see a soul at genoa and come back as quickly as you can cavaliere riscara sped away laughing and talking through his nose like pulcinello i must pack up he cried cantering off with the most ludicrous gestures he wanted to leave baldi alone with the fair lady five days later riscara brought the marchesa back her lover very stiff and sore to save six leagues he had made him cross a mountain on muleback he swore nobody should ever catch him making a long journey again baldi brought the marchesa three copies of the letter she had dictated and six others in the same hand of riscara's composition and which might come in usefully later one of these letters contained some very pleasing jokes about the prince's terrors at night and the deplorable thinness of his mistress the marchesa balbi who so it declared left a mark like that of a pair of tongs on the cushion of every armchair in which she sat anybody would have sworn these missives were all in the duchess sanseverina's handwriting now said the marchesa i know without any possibility of doubt that the duchess best beloved her fabrizio is at bologna or in the neighbourhood i am too ill interrupted count baldi i beseech you to excuse me from making another journey or at all events let me rest for a few days and recover my health i will plead your cause said riscara he rose and said something to the marchesa in an undertone very good i consent to that she answered with a smile make your mind easy you will not have to go away said the marchesa to baldi with a somewhat scornful look thanks he cried and his tone was heartfelt riscara did in fact start off alone in a post-chaise he had hardly been two days at bologna before he caught sight of fabrizio and marietta in a carriage the devil he cried our future archbishop does not appear to deny himself any pleasure this must be revealed to the duchess who will be delighted all riscara had to do to discover fabrizio's residence was to follow him there the very next morning the post brought the young man the letter of genoese manufacture he thought it a little short but no idea of suspicion occurred to him the idea of seeing the duchess and the count again sent him frantic with delight and in spite of all ludovico's remonstrances he hired a post horse and started off at a hand gallop all unknown to himself he was followed by riscara who when he reached the posting station before castelnuovo about six leagues from parma had the pleasure of seeing a crowd collected on the square in front of the local prison its doors had just closed upon our hero who had been recognized as he was changing horses by two myrmidons of the law chosen and sent out by count zurla riscara's small eyes twinkled with delight with the most exemplary patience he verified every incident connected with the affair that had just taken place in the little village and then sent off a messenger to the marchesa raversi after which by dint of walking about the streets as though to visit the church a very interesting building and to hunt up a picture by parmigiano which he had heard existed in the neighbourhood he contrived to come across the podesta who hastened to pay his respects to a councillor of state riscara appeared surprised that the podesta had not dispatched the conspirator on whom he had so luckily laid his hand straight to the citadel there is some risk riscara added unconcernedly that his many friends who were out looking for him yesterday to help him get across the dominions of his most serene highness might meet the gendarmes there were quite twelve or fifteen of the rebels all mounted intelligenti pauca exclaimed the podesta with a knowing look End of chapter 14